Testing, testing, testing.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Those of you who are, we saw not too long ago, um, for those that are just joining us, welcome to the Board of Fisheries meeting, statewide and supplemental issues. My name is Marit Carlson Van Dort. I'm the chair of the Alaska Board of Fisheries. The day is March 10th. It's a Friday, and the time is 8.53 a.m. There are six of seven board members present. Member Heimbuck will not be with us for this meeting. So before proceeding any further, I just want to take a moment and let my fellow board members introduce themselves. Start here with Mr. Carpenter, and we'll go around the table. Good morning, everyone. Tom Carpenter from Cordova. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Mackenzie Mitchell, Fairbanks. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. John Jensen from Petersburg. John Wood, Willow. St Stands right, Tanana. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. And again, Mark Carlson Van Dort, currently residing in Anchorage. Um, let's go ahead and introduce department staff that's here. Mr. Commissioner, welcome. Good morning. Doug Vincent Lang, Commissioner, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Sam Raybung, uh, Division of Commercial Fisheries, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Do you want me to yeah. read my staff? Okay. With me today is uh, Deputy Director Forrest Bowers, uh, Regulations Program Coordinator Shalene Hutter, uh, Christy Gleason, who's our Yukon Fall Season Manager, and Chuck Brazil, who's our AYK Regional Management Coordinator. Bert Lewis is our Central Region Regional Supervisor. Jack Erickson is our Central Region Research Coordinator. Matt Namus is our Bristol Bay and Prince William Sound Management Coordinator. Aaron Potter is our Cook Inlet Management Coordinator. Tim Sands is our Westside Bristol Bay Area Management Biologist. Stacy Vega is our Bristol Bay Research Biologist, and Phil Stacy is another Bristol Bay Research Biologist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Maraybung. Welcome, Mr. Tobey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Tom Tobey, Department of Fish and Division of Sportfish, and with us today from Division of Sportfish is Jason Dye, South Central Regional Supervisor, Matt Miller, the Management Coordinator for the Cook Inlet Air Region, uh, Jay Baumer, the management coordinator for Prince William Sound, Anchorage Bowl, Bristol Bay, and Kodiak. Patrick Fowler, the Southeast management coordinator. Tim McKinley, the South Central research coordinator. And Lee Borden, the Bristol Bay area management biologist. Thank you. Thank you very much. We got a little bit of everybody here today, don't we? Ms. Olson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Lisa Olson, I'm the Deputy Director for Subsistence. I'm from Anchorage. And with us today is Robin Dublin. She's the South Central Region Program Manager for Subsistence. And also Bronwyn Jones. She's the Southwest Region Subsistence Resource Specialist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And is uh, I know Mr. Pappas is not physically present here today. I believe he's zooming in. I don't know if he's got a mic capability if he wants to introduce himself. Good morning, Madam Chair. George Pappas, Office of Assistance Management, State Subsistence Liaison. Thank you for allowing me to access this direction. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today, George. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Aaron Peterson uh, with the Department of Law and also joining me shortly will be Cheryl Brooking, another attorney, assistant attorney general with the Department of Law. Thank you, wildlife troopers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Aaron Frenzel, Alaska Wildlife Troopers. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for being present. And then uh, Director Nelson, will you please introduce board support staff, please? Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, my name's Art Nelson. I'm the Executive Director for the Board of Fisheries. And uh, with our staff here from board support today, we have Henry Lesia, our Publications Specialist. Uh, next to Henry is Kyle Campbell from Fairbanks. He's our Interior Region Coordinator and Next to Kyle is Faree Fernandez, our, uh, uh, based here in Anchorage, our uh, uh, South Central um, Area Coordinator for uh, the Advisory Committee Program. Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Appreciate your being here. Um, just a little bit for those in the room, if you have a hearing disability or you just need a little bit of extra help hearing, um, the mics are a little echoey this morning, but anyways, we have um, a wireless headset that tie into the sound system that can help you hear. If you would like to access that, um, just let any one of the board support members over here know, and they'll be happy to hook you up with um, with some headsets. 
Also, please, uh, for folks here in the room and around the table, please turn off or silence your cell phones. And um, let's go ahead and get into our ethics disclosures at this time, and we'll begin um, once again with Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> As I stated, my name is Tom Carpenter. I reside in Cordova. I'm currently retired, divested myself completely of all businesses, including limited entry permits and IFQs. My primary income comes from investment income and personal savings managed by Merrill Lynch. My wife is an educator employed by the Cordova School District. I receive the Alaska Permanent Fund, as do my wife and daughter, and receive a stipend for serving on this board. Neither I nor anyone in my immediate or extended family have any financial interests in any business which relate to fish and wildlife resources or belong to any organizations which any financial gain can be attributed. Upon confirmation, I resign my positions on all boards, including the Copper River Prince William Sound Advisory Committee and the Prince William Sound Aquaculture Board. There are no proposals before the board that will benefit myself nor anyone in my immediate or extended family. No member of my family or extended family is involved with any lawsuits against the state or the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And Madam Chair, I believe this statement to be true, correct, and complete. Thank you, Member Carpenter. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, I rule that you can fully participate in the matters before us at this meeting. Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Mackenzie Mitchell, and I've resided in Alaska since 2010. My immediate family consists of my mother and two brothers, all of whom reside outside of Alaska. In addition, I do not have any relatives that are from Alaska, reside in Alaska, or are involved in Alaska's fisheries. I will receive a stipend for service on the board, and I do receive the permanent fund dividend as a resident of Alaska. I annually purchase a resident sport fish hunt and trap license for personal hunting and fishing recreation in the state. I teach economics and recreation management courses at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I am currently taking an aviation maintenance technician course. In addition to my work with the university, I work seasonally for hunting and fishing outfitters across the state, serving roles as sport fishing guide, hunting guide, and um, under my registered guide outfitter license, sport fishing guide license, and merchant mariner credential. In 2020 and 2021, I guided fishing charters in Prince William Sound in the Gulf of Alaska while basing out of the Port of Valdez. In years prior to 2020, I guided fishing charters in the Gulf of Alaska basing out of the Kodiak Islands. I did not guide any sport fishing charters in 2022. I occasionally work providing flight instruction in, in the restaurant industry. I hold two business licenses in the state of Alaska, one for an air taxi service and one for a hunting and fishing outfitting company. Only the hunting side of the outfitting company is operational at this time, but it is my intent to at some point operate a sport fishing company in the South Central sport fish area. Neither I nor any member of my immediate family are members of any organization or corporation that is involved in a lawsuit against the state, the board, or the Department of Fish and Game, or where the state, the board, or the department is a party to the lawsuit. I do not believe that I have any conflicts with the matters before us, and I certify that to the best of my knowledge, this statement is true, correct, and complete. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, Member Mitchell, I rule that you can fully participate in the matters before us at this meeting. Mr. Jensen. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is John Jensen. I'm a small business owner and commercial fisherman re residing in Petersburg, Alaska. I own and operate a recreational skiff rental business and marine storage facility. As a commercial fisherman, I hold permits in the Red King Cab and Tanner Crab Fisheries in southeast Alaska. Other business interests include a partnership in a real estate investment company, JHD Real Estate Investments, LLC. It's an LLC. My wife, Pam, works part-time as an administrative clerk for Petersburg Municipal Power and Light, uh, Department of Petersburg Borough. I receive a Social Security stipend, a stipend from the state of Alaska as a member of the Board of Fish and also a member of the North Pacific Management Council and receive compensation for that. We receive the annual permanent dividend funds from Alaska. I'm a lifelong resident of Alaska and traditionally my family and I have always enjoyed hunting and sport fishing. I participate in personal use fisheries. And now being over 60, I have a lifetime hunting and fishing license. There are three members of my immediate family that are directly involved in commercial fishing in Alaska. Um, my oldest son, Jeremy, is a commercial fisherman. He owns and operates his own fishing vessel and holds permits in the following areas. The Northern Southeast Alaska Rowan Kelp Permit, Southeast Alaska Golden King Crab, and a Bristol Bay Salmon Drift Gillnet Permit. He also participates in the Southeast Tanner and Red King Crab Fisheries 
he is not the permit owner. My younger son, Sam, is a commercial fisherman. He participates as a crewman for Bristol Bay salmon in southeast Alaska. He owns and permits for the southeast uh, Alaska herring roll on kelp southern uh, part and, the, and dives for sea cucumbers. My brother, Mark, is a commercial fisherman. He holds permits in southeast Alaska for drift gillnet, a uh, hand troll, and 150 pot dungeness crab permit, and also a southern southeast herring roll on kelp permit. I do have conflicts in the matters before us, and the ones I'll mention now that I that I know for sure are conflicts are 11, 12, and 13, the Nusigap River Action Plan. And I did talk with our attorney and, and, and the Madam Chair about um, 157 and 158 there allow a person holding a CFEC permit for multiple salmon net areas to commercial fish for salmon in more than one er net area per year. And I think I should be able to participate in that because it's such a, it's, it involves anybody that has a CFEC permit for salmon. And it, it, that makes it a large class of people and it won't affect either permit holder or my family that um, one way or the other financially. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I believe the, uh, I certify to the best of my knowledge that my disclosure statement is true, correct, and complete. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Are there any questions from Member Jensen? Member Jensen, I concur with um, with uh, your recusals for 11, 12, and 13, and um, and with respect to not having a conflict of interest for proposal number 157, 158 too? Yeah, yeah 157, yes. 158. Um, so you'll um, be recused from participation in 11, 12, and 13. Any Board discussion. Okay, moving on, Mr. Wood. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Compliance with AS 3952. I'm John Wood, residing in Willow, Alaska. I receive a pension from the state of Alaska after serving in the Alaska court system, the Anchorage Municipal Assembly, and as staff to the Alaska State Legislature. I also receive Social Security benefits and the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, as does my wife. I am on contract with the state of Alaska on an hourly as needed basis, totally unrelated to any fishing issues. I fish recreationally and I will receive a stipend for service on this board of fisheries. My wife Mary is now retired and is administrator of a trust composed of assets, none of which are related to any fish business. There are no interests of a personal or financial nature that I nor any members of my immediate family has that may be affected by any of the ACRs or proposals to be considered by this board or which may constitute a conflict of interest under the Alaska Executive Branch Ethics Act. Neither I nor any of my immediate family or members of any organization or corporation is involved in the lawsuit against the state, the board, or the Department of Fish and Game, or whether the state, the board, or the department is a party to the lawsuit. Certify to the best of the knowledge, the statement is true, correct, and complete. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Any board questions? Hearing none, Mr. Wood, I rule that you can fully participate in the matters before us at this meeting. Mr. Zeray. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Stan Zeray, and I live in the village of Tanana on the Yukon River, 730 miles from the mouth. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and moved to Alaska in 1973. I am married with four children, three of whom reside in Alaska. I have made most of my living over the years as a contract fisherman, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service research projects and managing my own research grants for, from the Yukon River Panel and Office of Subsistence Management. Lesser but significant income came from my trapping, commercial fishing, Alaska reality TV contracts, and mechanic and equipment work in the, my village of Tanda. Presently, my income is derived from mechanic equipment work with the Tanda City uh, T T uh, City of Tanna and the Tanna Tribal Council, and as a contractor for six weeks in the summer for an ichthyophonus disease research project for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. My, run my wife runs the environmental office at the Tanna Tribal Council. I and no member of my family are involved in a lawsuit with the state of Alaska. I am, not I am currently not on any boards or organizations associated with fisheries issues. I receive a stipend from for service from this board and also my Alaska Permanent Fund dividend. I have a permanent Alaska hunting, fishing, and trapping license. I currently hold a CFEC Yukon River fish well permit, and my son has a commercial set gillnet permit. 
The average gross revenue per year of my son's GillNet license has been $190 over a 12-year period. The average gross revenue from my fish wheel license over the last 32 years has been $1,979, $1979 per year. Neither license has been fished in the last three years. Except for proposal 82, I see no personal or economic potential conflicts with any of the proposals currently before the Board of Fisheries. Uh, I hereby state that the above is true, correct, and complete to the best of my knowledge. Thank you, Mr. Zray. And just for clarification, the reason that you believe you have a conflict with proposal number 82 is because of the gillnet permits? Yes, the, that your family has. my son's commercial uh, uh, net permit. Thank you. Are there any questions? Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't think that would conflict Mr. Zray out on that proposal because it's just a mod, you know, it's just a, a gear configuration. So I, I don't see where it would be beneficial one way or the other to his, to his son, Madam Chair. Mr. Wood. I'd like to con uh, associate with comments made by Member Jensen. Uh, the, the periodic floats, even if you go to where a wildlife and fishery wants them, is a, a rather minuscule change. I don't see where there's a conflict here. So, Member Zaray, you had previously conflicted yourself out in the AYK meeting on 82. Do you remember the basis for that? Yes, and I, this is, uh, and I'm, I'm not really sure now, you know, that was my first meeting, and I'm not really sure now if, if it's, uh, I kind of think it's insignificant. Um, it's mostly a subsistence fishing issue right now with my son and, and and myself, it's really not even a, well, it could be a commercial issue too. I mean, it's, it, but it, we're, we're both in favor of, of the proposal. So it's, it's not even something we'd uh, be against. It doesn't hurt us in any way. Um, uh, I agree with uh, having to mark the nets better to make them safer and, uh, and make them more visible to enforcement. So I don't think it's an issue either, really, now. Do you believe that the, the, the sinking of the nets um, provides better, greater opportunity to catch fish? It's, when there's drift in the river, you can go a whole two-week period and not be able to fish. Um, every year, there's uh, people that sink their nets, just the surface, you know, put it a, make it, you know, so the drift goes over it. I mean, I, that, that's the issue. Uh, there are There is another issue with the real short nets that were given to subsistence people when the uh, net mesh was uh, reduced. And um, those nets were so short that the only way, you, you can't fish them on the surface, but there's an issue with that too. But it's mostly a drift issue by far, and it just allows people to fish when subsistence fishery is open. Subsistence and commercial fishery. And and commercial. It's just that we haven't had any commercial for, it's, right. it's been a lot of years. Any additional board questions? Since it's related to particularly just the, um, thinking here for a second. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here considering the additional information and, um, you know, it does require marking. The question becomes is whether or not there is additional opportunity to the resource afforded by being able to sink the nets since the, the proposal does both. Marking and allows for sinking. And I yes, and it does allow for, I mean, if, if we weren't able to sink the nets, uh, it would limit the fishing, and so less fish would be caught. There's no doubt about it. It would be, like I say, it could shut down subsistence and commercial for a whole two-week period. Okay. Any other board discussion? Do uh, Jensen and Wood maintain your, your positions, given the additional information? 
No, I, I don't, Madam Chair. I, I, th I think it's it's just gear mod and modifications and and uh, making it uh, uh, better for the people that are fishing. Uh, it doesn't matter what they're fishing for, subsistence or commercial. I think it, and also the department says it, uh, it beneficial for boater safety, stock salmon stock management and enforcement. So I, I don't think Mr. Saray should be out on this one, Madam Chair. So do you maintain your comments? No, I, I think this thing is transformed into a safety question more so than a sinking question. And uh, I have uh, no belief that there's any conflict here. If there were, it's a minus, like I say, very minor point, and the public has been fully informed on it, so I would allow them to vote if I were the one making the decision, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just want to make sure that we get all the issues on the record. Are there any other comments? Thank you um, for the additional information, Mr. Zray, and um, and given that I do think that this is primarily related to um, to a safety issue, to marking, and so I will uh, rule that you don't have a conflict on proposal number 82 at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any additional questions? All right, Mr. Jensen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Carlson, the Dort, may we hear your ethics statement, please? Thank you. My name is Mara Carlson Van Dort. I was born and raised in Alaska. Currently reside in Anchorage. I am employed as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Far West Incorporated, the Village Corporation for Chignik Bay, formed under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. I'm also a shareholder in Bristol Bay Native Corporation and in Koniag. My significant other is a heavy equipment operator, a member of the Inter International Brotherhood of Operating Engineers Number 302. We both purchased resident sport fishing licenses. Both he and I received State of Alaska Permanent Fund dividends, and I will receive a stipend for my service on this board. Neither I, my significant other, nor my employer have a financial interest in fisheries. Similarly, neither I, my significant other, nor my employer um, or any member of my immediate family, for that matter, are involved with any lawsuits with the State of Alaska, the Department of Fish and Game, or the Board of Fisheries. Uh, Mr. Chair, this information is true, correct, and complete to the best of my knowledge. Board members, questions or comments? Hearing none, I really can uh, participate fully in the matters before us and return the gavel to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Jensen. Let's talk a little bit about this meeting and access to board members. So as board members, um, you know that we're available to the public for the purpose of receiving added information. Um, this process doesn't work without you. And um, many of us will meet with stakeholders informally during breaks before and after daily meetings. And we're here to talk with you, to serve you, and to benefit from your input. There is a line we call the sanctuary line in front of the tables across which the public may not cross during um, our meetings and breaks. However, if you wish to talk with one of us, please just simply notify whomever you'd wish to speak with. You can wave us down or you can let one of board support know or any of the staff members around the room uh, to please come grab us and we'll come out to meet you. Um, please keep in mind that it's during the breaks and both before and after daily meetings that we find time to read all the materials that's been submitted during the meeting time. So just be mindful of that, please. If you have any process questions, I want to make sure that the public is fully informed on, on the process and procedures of the board. Please feel free to ask those questions to either myself, to Vice Chairman Jensen, or to Executive Director Nelson, and we will do our very best to answer your questions. Um, it's hoped that the practices of the board that are outlined at this meeting will help maximize public participation in the board process, um, since that's the best way we can make decisions here. The Alaska Board of Fisheries and the Department of Fish and Game are united in support of fostering a respectful workplace. We are committed to ensuring our workplace is free from negative, aggressive, and inappropriate behaviors. Harassment, disrespectful behavior of, un of any type is unacceptable and won't be tolerated. Um, we'll appreciate, of course, everyone's assistance in joining us in this effort. So please be mindful as folks are testifying not to interrupt them um, or be disruptive in any way or disrespectful to board supports uh, staff members, department staff, board members, and any member of the public who's um, chosen to join us at this meeting. In accordance with the Open Meetings Act, the board staff has published notice in the Alaska Online Public Notice System, posted the notice on its main website and this meeting website as its designated posting place and also distributed it to a list of participants, email recipients, I'm sorry. I won't take the time to read it, but copies of the notice are available from the executive director uh, for those who are interested in the complete text. The public notice and proposals were distributed to the local Fish and Game Advisories Committees. They're posted online, 
and they were sent via email to interested organizations and individuals. Public comments were solicited, and board members have received copies of all the on-time written public comments. The timely public comments and timely advisory committee comments are available for the board's use and are available to the public in the workbooks on the table at the back of the room. They can also be found again on our meeting website. Copies of all the meeting materials updated frequently throughout this meeting. Um, they can be found on the board's website and the webpage specific to this meeting, and I encourage folks to check that frequently. Um, it's a really good way to get an update um, of the RCs, the record copies. Similarly, copies of the tentative agenda for this meeting can be found on the table at the back of the room. I will just give you fair warning that the agenda is subject to change throughout the meeting, but I'm going to make a really concerted attempt to generally stay on track with it. But, um, you know, it just kind of depends on how much public testimony we have, et cetera, et cetera. So please be mindful. I'll do my best to keep people updated. With respect to record copies, the board encourages the public to submit written comments on specific proposals or issues. Written public comments submitted before deliberations begin are limited to 10 single-sided or five double-sided pages in length. Please make sure when you submit an RC that um, you clearly state your name on that document, the organization that you represent, if any, and what proposals your RC is addressing at the top of the document. That's really important and incredibly helpful to us because we get literally hundreds of pieces of paper. Once the deliberations on proposals begin at this meeting, the board will only accept written public comments that are not more than five single-sided pages or the equivalent double-sided unless specific information is requested by the board that requires more pages than allowed under the standard. And again, I would refer you back to the agenda because we've broken up deliberations on groups. So um, just be familiar with the agenda because that will affect how much information you can submit when we get into deliberations. This year, the board is accepting RCs submitted electronically as a Word document or a PDF through the board's website. A link to the submission portal is prominently featured on the meeting page of our web, website where all of the materials for this meeting are posted. Um, you can also turn in written materials to the board support staff here at the end of the table. However, please note that you only need to turn in one copy now. Um, if you're going to be turning it in in person. However, I will say that board support staff will not be pr printing materials submitted in color. So if you have something that you would like to have before the board in the form of an RC that requires color, you need to please turn in 20 copies of the board supports um, to the board support staff at the end of the table. So if you don't have any color, you only need to turn in one copy. If there's something that you want communicated to us in color, you need to bring in 20 copies because we don't have color copying capabilities um, for RCs, just to make that hopefully very clear. Folks that aren't attending the meeting can also submit written comments by fax to 907-465-6094. With no exception, all of the materials which are to be submitted to the board for its consideration must be presented to the record keeper for distribution or uploaded through the website. Please do not give documents to board members directly as those documents will be handed right back to you and you'll be requested to submit it um, into the record. All documents received at the board meeting will be assigned a log number, known as an RC. All written materials submitted will be retained for permanent record of the board. The record keeper will distribute RCs in the morning, uh, before the meeting begins, after the, after the noon break, and if there's an evening session after the dinner break. This practice will ensure regular distribution of all written materials to all board members, as well as proper retention of board records. Just to say, you have the absolute right to go ahead and submit up to the maximum number of pages that I just outlined here, but please keep in mind that uh, brevity is appreciated, um, and the more concise you can be, uh, the better in terms of um, communicating your points, because we've got a lot of, a lot of paperwork that comes before us, um, so just keep that in mind. I think that covers our C's. Quick word on testimony, committee, and sort of deliberations process. So we're about to begin our staff reports here, and public testimony will follow the staff reports. For those who wish to publicly testify, you must fill out one of the blue, car blue cards, excuse me, located on the table at the back of the room and turn it into the board staff at the end of the front table here. The tentative cutoff time to sign up for oral public testimony is 11 a.m. today. So just be mindful of that. If you wanna, if you wanna testify, you've got about an hour and a half to sign up uh, to do so. At this meeting, the public will be given three meetings, three minutes, three meetings, three minutes to testify. 
Um, advisory Committee and Regional Advisory Council representatives will each be given 10 minutes. Following public testimony, there will be four sessions of the Board's Committee of the Whole. The Committee Roadmap shows which proposals will be considered in each committee session. Everyone present is, of course, allowed to participate. There's no need to sign up for that. Again, the agenda, which is available online or in the materials at the back of the room, shows where we tentatively plan to deliberate in between committee group sessions. Um, and while the agenda is subject to change, we'll provide updates along the way. Um, but if you have any questions about the process, again, please ask myself, um, Vice Chair Jensen, or any member of the board support staff. Um, I think that covers a bunch of the sort of upfront information at this time. And so we'll go ahead and move into Staff reports um, section of our agenda. This is, I think, the least amount of staff reports I've ever seen for a Board of Fish meeting. I'm not going to say I'm too sorry. Um, but we're going to go ahead, actually, this and, and, and have a presentation first off on an electronic monitoring given, by, given remotely by, um, I think, uh, Anna Henry and Josh Keaton um, with the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service, respectively. Um, so we'll pause just to get that going, and then um, we'll invite them to present a little bit of information about that. I know that was something Member Wood had a great deal of interest in, and then we'll move into um, the presentation on the New Shigak King Salmon Stock of Concern Draft Action Plan. All right. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Anna Henry. I'm a fishery analyst for the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, and I've got Josh Keaton here with National Marine Fisheries Service as well in Juneau. He's presenting remotely. We'll be tag teaming this, um, and I'll let him introduce himself here in a minute. So we'll be presenting an overview of electronic monitoring in North Pacific Federal Fisheries. Uh, I'll cover a little more process-oriented information, and Josh will start with some of the more technical aspects of the program. So, Josh, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me fine? Yes, you sound good. All right. Uh, morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name, for the record, my name is Josh Keaton. I am the monitoring branch chief for um, NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service, Alaska Regional Office. So underneath my branch, we uh, handle everything from electronic reporting. So our e-landing system and the support that we work with the state on e-landings to um, some of the observer issues to electronic monitoring. So um, we've been asked to give a, a very broad overview. Uh, you know, so our intent is this is going to be very broad. EM has a um, has very uh, has several different um, things, but when people think about electronic monitoring, they generally think of the camera systems that have been um, put on boats recently. And really there's no um, significant technology. This is no real different. It's just a heavily modified version of a home security system. You have a control center that uh, is like your computer that stores your data. It's connected to cameras and various sensors like a GPS receiver and um, various sensors on the hydraulics or the drum rotations that indicate when fishing is going. Um, next slide. So uh, how is EM being used in Alaska? Well, as I mentioned, EM can be considered to be multiple things. Uh, generally, underneath the broad overscape of monitoring, monitoring is for us to collect the information needed for us to manage the fisheries or to enforce compliance to meet management goals. Um, and so monitoring systems can be thought of as those independent systems that are collecting data. So your GPS data loggers or our VMS systems. Um, we maintain cameras or systems that can help uh, observers track to make ensure quality of data or that there's no um, manipulation or bias being introduced into the data. Um, we use EM for catch estimation and we also do EM for compliance monitoring. And I will go into each one of these into a little bit more detail. Um, next slide. The first broad category of electronic monitoring has actually been in Alaska for, you know, over a decade here. Um, it's not what you typically hear about is the video systems on our fixed gear or trawl EM boats, but these are video systems that we've impl implemented on um, catcher processors. And so they do various things. We have EM systems that monitor the scales. So most of our catcher processors um, 
have at sea scale systems, they're digital scales, motion compensated. And so there's cameras and various uh, sensors there to ensure that there's no manipulation or scale tampering going on. Um, we have camera systems inside the bins where these large catcher processors, when they bring a net up or they're, where they're storing their fish to ensure that no crew members are in there pre-sorting catch and, or anything else like that. We have what's called salmon bin monitoring cameras. These are cameras that look at where the uh, crew, as they're sorting out the salmon, um, bycatch and stuff to ensure that there's no, you know, salmon disappearing from those bins when the observer turns their back. Um, and then finally, one of the more recent ones in this category is our halibut deck sorting. Um, this was a program implemented by the North Pacific Fishery Management Council to uh, help get those halibut uh, off the deck faster. And so we put several cameras to ensure that um, vessels are following the proper protocols, handling the halibut correctly, um, doing what they're supposed to do. It, they're there to assist the observers as, as well. So those EM systems are on about 65 catcher processors and multiple um, programs. And all of these vessels have full coverage on top of the camera systems. Um, next slide. So now we're moving into what uh, people think about more typically about electronic monitoring. So these are the camera systems that we've implemented on uh, fixed gear boats. Um, this was, uh, we have about 168, 170 catcher vessels participating in the program. Not all those vessels fish every year, um, but the primary goal of the electronic monitoring system was catch estimation. Um, the goal is that the cameras are all over the rail um, on viewing the deck and there to count all the fish that are um, coming on board. And then we use average weights that are collected by observers on other vessels to uh, assume the weight. Granted, most of the retained catch ends up back at shore and an e-landings fish ticket is filled out. So, um, but this is one category of EM where um, there's multiple cameras in a quite intensive review process in order to see catch estimation and give us data similar to what would be collected by an observer standing at the rail counting those fish. Um, in this program, um, the EM catch is both capturing both the, cat, the retained catch and the discarded catch. So there's a camera that hangs out over the rail looking for any um, fish that might be dropping off. Um, the vessels choose um, both the, in this program and our, the trawl EM program that I'll talk about. It's a voluntary program. And the, you know, I know we'll elaborate on that a little bit more, or Anna will, um, on the reasons, but, uh, you know, EM systems take a lot of partnership with the vessels in order for them to, to work. Um, uh, the EM trips on fixed gear are randomly selected for monitoring. The EM systems are turned on. All data it, or all video is on the entire time for the trip. And then that EM is reviewed by an independent data reviewer. And we use Pacific States Fishery Management Commission for um, the review of our data. Most of these people are trained observers. Um, and so they, they, they have that observer mindset when they're doing the EM system. Uh, next slide. Now we're going into um, a much broader uh, EM program that has been under development with the North Pacific Fishery Management Council since 2018. Um, just this past summer, the council took final action and the re agency is currently um, engaged in the regulations um, for this with likely regulations to be in this program to be implemented in 2025. This program was to put EM on pelagic trawl vessels with the goals of um, both finding a more cost effective solution for monitoring. Um, and this program is different than the fixed gear program in that we are monitoring for compliance. We are not trying to estimate catch. And in this program, we require that the vessels retain all catch and our cameras are placed on there to ensure that no catch are discarded. Now we use the term maximized retention because there's certain things that are outside of vessels control that results in discards. There are certain species like a large sleeper shark or something like that, that the vessels cannot store. So there's very few exemptions that are clearly outlined in their vessel monitoring plans on what they can discard, but pretty much all, 
all fish are to be retained, especially salmon. There's a, a significant focus on salmon retention with this because it is the agency's goal and the North Pacific Fishery Management Council's goal to count every salmon and have those salmon available for um, biological data collection, such as genetics and stuff like that, which feed into the science that we use um, for management. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, this is a, mo uh, a compliance monitoring program. Um, you know, the same setup as a fixed gear boat, largely, it, um, except for the re reviewers are not trying to estimate the catch. They're just looking for, is a crew member going in the catch? And if you are familiar with pelagic trawl vessels, and we'll have a couple pictures later on in the slide, which you'll see, but that show the what the um, deck looks like in these camera views. But um, generally speaking, on a Pollock trawl vessel, these guys do not want to handle fish. They like to bring that net up on the board, have the um, vessel hold open, and just dump straight into the hole. You know, a lot of EM review that I see or video that I've seen with this program, these vessel, these operators um, or the crew members on board the boat generally don't even touch the fish uh, except for a shovel. And that's not shoveling them off the back of the boat either. That's shoveling them into the hole. So uh, that gives you a, a really broad overview of um, our EM systems that are currently out there. And uh, next slide, and I'll turn it over to Anna, which will talk about more of the concepts of the design and the North Pacific Fishery Management Council process. Thanks, Josh. Um, so this is a list, uh, not, not meant to be an exhaustive list, but really just some of the highlights of some of the benefits from electronic monitoring programs. Um, the first being it can, can involve improved coverage. When you have cameras on boats, they can see more angles than an observer. They have different views. Uh, they can be on on every trip, so it can lead to increased coverage and potentially a reduced observer effect. Even if you're only reviewing a proportion of the video, if the camera's on all the time, uh, the operations don't know what will be reviewed, so there's less uh, potential for bias in the data. Um, and additionally, cameras don't take breaks, they don't need to sleep, they don't need to eat, uh, they don't get seasick, so they're on all the time. Um, so this can lead to increased accountability and verification of the catch. Um, some EM programs can provide cost efficiency. This really depends on the program design uh, and, and how intense the video review can be, but uh, with EM programs, you're reducing some travel costs and room and board and labor costs associated with observer programs. Um, additionally, EM programs can provide an opportunity for some additional data collection in the trawl EM program. We were able, able to leverage the cameras to collect some data on sharks that were not available previously. Uh, and then there can be benefits to safety and comfort when you have fewer people on board especially on small vessels that don't have a lot of space for an observer. Uh, this can be an improvement to have cameras on and, you know, fewer people uh, exposed to the elements as well. And then uh, during the early, early area, early parts of the pandemic, we were able to maintain some data streams that maybe would not have otherwise been able to uh, maintain with some restrictions related to COVID. So cameras aren't affected by any uh, viruses. So that was a benefit. There's also some challenges associated with electronic monitoring programs. Some of these can be on board the vessel. So any monitoring program ha may have impacts on catch handling, although we've tried to design them to minimize those impacts on the crew. Uh, but depending on what, what information you're trying to get from the cameras, it can require a little bit different uh, catch handling provisions. And then, of course, uh, on board, you need to maintain and care for the system. So making sure that there's no water drops on the camera, that the camera angles are still clear and the system is functioning appropriately. Uh, in terms of costs and logistics, uh, those can be a challenge for EM systems, especially in remote areas. You have to transmit the data and um, create systems for data review and storage. And then the regulatory system can be a challenge to write regulations that are both specific enough and prescriptive enough to make sure that you're uh, maintaining your goals and meeting your goals and objectives of the program, but also maintaining some flexibility for each of the nuances of individual operations. 
And then uh, EM programs can lose some biological data collection. Observers can take tissue samples and, and different data collections that cameras obviously can't. For some programs, shore side sampling can maintain these data streams. Uh, it just depends on the design of the program. And then uh, any EM program really requires a lot of outreach communication um, with everyone involved in the program to make sure uh, everyone is on board with the goals and understands their roles in the process. Um, and that can require quite a bit of time and, and a, a bit of a learning curve. So some considerations for designing an EM program. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's really critical to define your fishery monitoring objectives. What is the goal? What's the information or data stream that you're trying to collect with the camera system? And does this uh, match with the catch handling on the vessels? So the specific type of information and program that you design has to line up with the, the type of operations on the vessel. Another question is, how timely will you need the data and how will it be transmitted? Um, if the data are feeding directly into catch accounting schemes and you need that very timely, um, then that's a consideration. Uh, other systems, the data is used to corroborate other sources of data, so the timeliness of that data transmission and review can be a little more flexible. Will the program be voluntary and will the fleet adopt it? Uh, you know, the fixed gear program and the trolley M program are both voluntary, so all operators opt in to this EM program, and that's really critical uh, to maintain that buy-in uh, with the stakeholders. They have to see the benefit and, and be engaged in the catch handling and the maintenance of the equipment. Uh, and then costs and funding. There are many aspects of EM programs that all have costs associated with them from the equipment purchase to transmitting the data, the video review, the data storage. Um, so thinking about kind of what those costs will be and what the different funding sources may be for that. Additionally, the administration of the program is, is pretty intense and that has costs associated with it as well. So determining who will administer the program and who has access to the data is critical. Uh, in the programs in, that, in the North Pacific, the data is treated similarly to observer data, so it maintains all the same confidentiality uh, rules as observer data would. And this is just a brief outline of the council process for the Troll EM program, um, but this would probably be similar for any new electronic monitoring program. Um, so this began in 2018 when the council identified the priority to develop EM for use in pelagic trawl catcher vessel fisheries. Uh, and with that, the council formed the Trawl EM Committee, and this was involved uh, industry participants, EM providers, agency representatives, and stakeholders. This really provided a process to have public participation, uh, as well as informing, keeping the council informed on the progress of the project. There was a pilot project phase that ran in 2018 and 2019, testing the EM systems, and for during this phase, the vessels fished with both the observers on board and running the cameras to kind of, as a proof of concept, to make sure that everything was, would work and the data streams could be collected by having the observers on board as well so that no data would be lost. Then we moved into an exempted fishing permit um, process. So in this, the vessels ran cameras on their system and they were exempted from the regulations that required them to have observers. Um, and this allowed us to evaluate the efficacy of the EM systems and using shoreside observers to collect and maintain those data streams. And the EFP process is really critical to, to be able to, during that, during that part of the program, you can really fish and act as though it is a regulated program, but also have some flexibility to kind of identify any issues and work out any wrinkles or kinks in the system before it's uh, designated in, in regulations and really specified. Um, and then, of course, there was the council analytical process. So the council initiated an analysis and approved the purpose and need and alternative set in 2021. Um, and then they had an initial review of the analysis and took final action uh, here in October of 2023. 
and we are expecting that NIMPS will implement this regulated program in 2025. Um, so this didn't happen overnight. It's a kind of a long process that involved a lot of collaboration with a lot of stakeholders, a lot of hard work um, from different project participants. And then finally, some lessons learned from uh, the EM projects that we've had. Clear and timely communication between all parties is critical. This includes participants, stakeholders, EM service providers, agency representatives. Um, you know, everyone needs to, to understand their role and, and communicate uh, about kind of what's going on with the program and, and any challenges that have come up and strategies to, to kind of uh, fix any of those challenges. It also requires strong education and outreach um, to be in place and deliver to all participants. Uh, the EFP process was really invaluable for this uh, to not only identify issues but also resolve issues. We were really lucky we had uh, principal investigators on the EFP that were highly engaged and communicated with the fleet consistently and also with the agency and uh, really helped to, to provide that communication and that collaboration um, in this process. And then the council committee process was also helpful to facilitate communication, uh, increase public participation in the process, and, and keep the council informed of uh, how everything was, was going and the program was progressing. Um, and really, I can't understate the importance of stakeholder in involvement and buy-in. Um, any EM program is really only successful if the users are engaged and on board and and really want to use and maintain these systems and, and see some benefits from that. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview, and uh, we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Quick, quick question, uh, then we'll go to Mr. Wood. Um, EFP process, you said that was critical. Can you remind me what EFP is? You may have stated it, and I sorry. missed it. Yes, that, thank you. Uh, it's the exempted fishing permit, so that was what allowed uh, the fishery to operate um, it exempted them from some of the regulations that would have required observers or some requiring some discards, so they were exempted from those regulations to, to run the system and operate as though it were a regulated program. Thank you. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the board for putting up with my request here. But it's come, the subject matter has come in front of us many times, and I just had the gut feeling it's probably not as simple as I thought it would be, and you have confirmed that. Uh, but I was thinking of it in terms of smaller vessels and what you're presenting here today. And in lieu of any uh, human observer being able to be on board just because of the smaller size of the vessels, how far down have you implemented these EM programs uh, as far as size of vessel? Um, Madam Chair, um, through the chair, uh, you know, I don't actually have the minimum size boat, but these systems, you know, as long as you have power, they can be implemented on smaller boats. I think one of our smaller boats are probably in the 40 foot size class in fixed gear. Um, that was one of the, when we implemented fixed gear EM, that was one of the goals was to design an EM system because of smaller size vessels that had challenges with observers. I do want to um, uh, clarify one thing really quick. Um, we, we stress the importance of being voluntary um, throughout this process in all of these programs. Um, I want to make sure that the Board of Fish understands that if they choose not to opt into an EM program, they still have monitoring. They still get an observer. So in the sake of the trawl EM program, all the Bering Sea trawl vessels are 100% observed, which means that if they either have an EM system on 24-7 or an observer on during all fishing. So, um, and that's because we really stress the importance of uh, high quality data collection on that salmon and ensuring compliance so the EM systems do a good job there. But we wanna make sure that all our vessels are monitored. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Uh, in fact, you're now addressing the second part. Why would a stakeholder want to participate in such a program? Well, what you just described is if he doesn't or she doesn't, uh, they're going to have a human observer on with all that entails, whereas a lot of the things we're dealing with here, we don't have that um, trigger, don't have that tool. It's not required to have an observer. The question being, one, they don't have room, two, the cost involved. So I was looking at this EM as a possible alternative, uh, but I don't have a 
uh, stick to force them to do it. What about the program would entice a, a stakeholder under those circumstances to actively participate? That seems to be the key. Um, through the chair, um, that's a really great question. Um, and there's multiple incentives that a vessel have indicated to me throughout the development of these programs. Um, you know, so you've, you've hit on one, right? Uh, I don't have space for an observer or it's harder for me when I have an observer. So that was one incentive. Uh, a large incentive for like uh, Pollock trawl vessels is um, just, you know, impacts to operations. An EM system allows them to smoothly bring that net on, let it dump all into the hold, not have to wait for an observer to take measurements or, you know, those minor impacts. And I want to stress minor impacts that an observer on a boat might, you know, have on impacts to fishing operations, right? That was a large incentive. I heard a lot of that from trawl vessels, but a, a huge incentive for trawl EM is the fact that we require that vessel to pay the Bering Sea vessels pay for their observer coverage. It's not like the partial coverage in the Gulf of Alaska where it's paid through a fee. Um, so they are, there is a significant cost savings to a vessel operating an EM system. And in the agency's opinion through these last several years, we get better data overall um, from the EM systems because an observer only looks one way as Anna had mentioned, right? These EM systems have full coverage on the boat and never yeah. sleep. So a higher level of confidence in the data coming from those vessels. Going to your presentation, whenever a scientist tells me it's challenging to estimate costs or challenging to know what the regulatory process would be, that means hold your wallet and uh, it's going to be nearby impossible. Uh, what would the smallest system involve as far as costs, say, on a typical SANAR? So through the chair, um, I, and I, I'll have to apologize that I'm not going to be able to give you a lot of specificity um, on this question. Um, there's been a lot of recent development in recent years to develop what is called like mobile EM systems, which are 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 really are a cheaper option. Um, a lot of that is proprietary right now, and I don't actually have the cost. But a typical EM system. Uh, runs you know in excess of the ten thousand dollar mark and then you have to factor in there's annual maintenance costs technicians have to go and make sure that the systems are are working and everything else so you know when it comes to the cost of an em program it's actually a little bit more particularly at the startup part when you're first bringing an em system on board it can be quite costly and then you know you you gain you gain your cost efficiencies in the program both by scale, the amount of vessels, right? So that the cost of a technician being in Sandpoint per se, per se right? Servicing a hundred boats is less than 10 boats. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you gain that through the scale of the system and you gain that not just in the length and the, the longevity of these EM systems. We expected a five year lifespan for these EM systems. We have EM systems that are, are, are exceeding the eight year lifespan now and still working. So we, we don't have a really good handle on what the cost is um, okay. at this point because it's a fast changing environment. Would you outside of this meeting send me a list of the private sector folks that do this uh, type of service so that I can make contact with them outside of this meeting? I can sure do that. And lastly, the chair is being very indulgent. And I appreciate that. But the primary motivator for me in looking forward and trying to see if this were available was a practice that has been described as chum chucking where uh, out in the water uh, chums seem to grow wings and, and disappear before they get to either the tender or to the processor. Would your system or would an EM system be able to somehow monitor that? And the second part of that what I was aiming at was species identification or stock identification I guess is a better description. Could they differentiate at King from Sakai, uh, for instance? Those are two different questions. Uh, through the chair, uh, I'll answer the first question about whether this system could monitor chum chucking. I learn a new term every day, so this is a new one for today. Um, but I understand the concept that you're um, explaining. And it's very similar to the EM systems that were placed on trawl EM boats. The main goal, ma ensuring compliance of no um, discard of salmon or really all ground fish, um, but pro with a focus on salmon. So if you were to impose an EM system similar to what's on our trawl boats, a compliance monitoring EM system, 
that with a full retention requirement, these EM systems do a really good job of capturing discards off the vessel. Now, not being that familiar with the same vessel, I'm going to caveat that, right? There's a lot of vessel activities that, you know, and it's been maybe 20 years since I've been on a SANE boat. So um, I, you know, there may be nuances there that would have to be worked through. And that's where the pilot phase and stuff uh, really helps. When it comes to species identification, when you have a camera up on like your boom, like is pictured in the picture here on the screen, right? And looking down, it's a little harder. There's been a lot of um, work done recently in using machine learning, artificial intelligence, stuff like that to help identify fish. That technology isn't quite up to speed for deployment at this point, but you know, as we all know from the news, artificial intelligence is, is wildly developing. Um, so in the future, maybe, but uh, we have similar circumstances that occur in like our fixed gear program where um, like it's hard for the EM systems way up above to determine what the crab species is when we're trying to actually do catch estimation on crab. So you can develop, you know, these are the flexibilities of EM systems in that you can develop like what we call a crab cam or something with a catch handling requirement that the vessels are supposed to take a certain number of fish and put them underneath the camera with, with a much closer view. And then you can use that uh, morphometric characteristics of salmon species to pretty much identify the salmon. You know, any salmon fisherman like you probably can look at a salmon and go, yeah, that's a chum or a king. We can teach cameras to do the same thing. Thank you very much for coming to both of you. Uh, this is exactly what I was looking for. And thank staff for putting this together. Appreciate it. Commissioner. Yeah, just could you just give us a quick rundown on the cost of these programs and who pays for them and, and how they're paid for and, and what the costs associated with some of the design features of these programs are? You know, who pays for the program, uh, I guess? <laughs> yeah, through the chair, um, sure. Um, so uh, there's multiple ways in which we're uh, um, paying for these systems, right? During the development phase, a lot of the money is coming through grant processes. There are NIFWIF, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Federation. Um, grant process funds a lot of the development um, for the pilot phases of this project. So, uh, you know, purchases of initial systems and stuff during that pilot phase is covered by that. But when you move into a regulated program and who pays for what, um, you have two options. And the Trolley M program, we're operating under both option or two different funding mechanisms. Um, the full coverage or what we consider our Bering Sea pilot guys that are required to pay for their own observer coverage will be the ones paying for their um, EM systems and the maintenance and stuff under the regulated program. Um, the EM review um, has a cost itself. You need to pay for an EM reviewer. And so that cost is going to be captured through a fee program similar to our observer fee for the partial coverage program. So the cost of what it takes to monitor all the catch uh, to be agency and um, council goals um, will be collected for, as a you know proportion of the you know a percentage of the catch and billed annually. Um, on other programs like the fixed gear EM program and our partial coverage side of the trawl EM is going to be paid for through the fee, the observer fee. So um, because we treat EM data as synonymous with observer data because we're trying to capture um, very similar data and get the data that we need to manage the fishery, right? Um, if a vessel selects, we, we have a big pot of money we collect through partial coverage fees. Um, and then we divvy that out to meet management goals through our annual deployment plan process, um, which will allocate certain amount of money to EM vessels, and then the rest goes to observers or other monitoring needs. Um, I hope that addressed your question. Yeah, if Judge I, Josh, what I'm trying to get at is just real quick, what's the approximate cost for one of these fixed vessel um, um, partial observer coverage? What can a, a 40 foot fixed vessel expect to pay annually in terms of electronic monitoring? Um, I don't have the, ex through the chair, I don't have the exact figure off um, the top of my head, but uh, I, I could get that for you at, at a later time. I just don't have it right now. It's in excess of $1,000. Okay, through, thank you. Through the chair, if I may add to that as well. Um, the specific costs of an EM program are really specific to the how the program is designed and 
so that it's really difficult to take any costs from one program and extrapolate them to some other program that has different goals, different objectives, might require di a different camera system, the vessels are in different locations. I mean, there's, there's just so many variables that really impact the overall costs of an EM system. It's really difficult to make that kind of extrapolation. We can certainly provide the cost information that we have on the, on the EM programs that we have um, ongoing. Uh, so you can see a little bit about what the existing programs cost, but that doesn't necessarily translate very well to any kind of new program. Additionally, I would add that these programs, the, both the fixed gear and the trolley and program, um, both of those fisheries already have observer programs, and there's a lot of administrative costs associated with an EM program that that we all we don't even include in our cost estimates because those all are already incurred in the observer program as it exists. So a lot of those would be new costs if you were standing up a new program from scratch that didn't already have all of those systems and administration um, and all of that program already in existence. That answers my questions. Thank you very much. Director Avon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had one peripheral question, I guess. I, I, we've talked about the cost of putting a camera on and, and the cost of, of uh, operating it, but I mean, it seems like it, there's an awful lot of time and effort put into designing the program itself. I mean, how many staffers do you have working on setting up a new one, a, a new system, a, designing a new EM program? Through the chair, um, that's a really great question. It does take a, a, a lot of different people. There's a lot of different interests in the data that we have. So um, for day-to-day -day management of the program, um, my monitoring branch, it's me and four staff. Um, Dr. Maggie Chan is kind of like my EM uh, expert in in-house and between the two of us, um, we've help manage that but i want to be very clear this is not an agency top-down type approach we are we really want to stress the collaborative nature of the development of this so i run bi-weekly meetings in which you know can have upwards of 50 people included in various aspects of this program whether it's observer program staff enforcement staff em providers observer providers right it's a it's a it's a huge team of people that all have a common goal interest come to the table strip out all the politics and just roll up their sleeves and figure out how to get this done and it was a great process and i can't thank the team enough we would not have gotten to the place that we have if we didn't have that collaboration from everybody thank you okay. miss mitchell Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question on um, kind of the, the level of voluntary participation that you've you've seen or expect to see um, through these different programs. Um, sure, through the chair, uh, you know, the fixed gear program um, started out and as I mentioned, we had 170 vessels. Um, we had to cap that. There's only a certain amount of budget available to support that. Um, and, but generally that level has stabilized. So uh, it was, you know, 170 out of, uh, off the top of my head, 800-ish uh, vessels in that category um, was who volunteered. When we get to Trolley M, it's a, it's a great story. We started out the gate with um, almost half of our fleet. Uh, we started with like 49 vessels. We, you know, with COVID and everything going on, we had a lot of interest in year one to join um, a lot of word of mouth uh, as well about how great this program was. We went to 80 and we had to cap it. We were like, hey, we're, we, we can't, like we're at a pilot phase. Like, you know, yes, it's working great and it's getting us the data that we need, but we need to slow down. So uh, we're gonna lo lo loosen those reins a little bit more this next year. We expect to get a few more. And then when it goes regulated, I would hazard to say that we're gonna get close to 100% um, participation in the Bering Sea because of the cost savings that they have and how it, you know, um, helps them in their fishing practices. Um, in the Gulf of Alaska, we probably will never get to 100%, but I will note that the Western Gulf, uh, 
um, vessels. We're near 100% for the vessels that participate out of Sandpoint and King Cove um, that participate in those trawl fisheries. Um, in the Central Gulf, uh, a little less percentage, and there's various reasons why vessels choose not to, to opt in, but we're going to have a very high percentage of uh, these vessels on these EM systems. Thank you for that. I, I had another question too, just based on, you know, have you had any scenarios of video tampering or, and then there was a comment about getting water on the lens and, and I mean, how much of the footage is kind of lost to environmental conditions? Um, Cause we know the weather's pretty rough out there sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So um, as I mentioned through the chair, as I mentioned, you know, these systems are, you're modified. So those lens caps and stuff are heavily engineered to try to reduce the amount of water spots or keep clear views. Um, there's catch handling or there's a uh, system maintenance uh, requirements for the vessels that are participating where they're supposed to clean these lenses that is built into the plan. Um, they're supposed to run a system check beforehand. To answer your first question on tamper, these, um, pr these systems are designed to be tamper proof. I have not um, seen anybody try to tamper with the video systems um, in a malicious or import, you know, way. You know, things happen on deck, right? A, wire gets cut when they're moving something or a door or whatever so you know we do have maintenance things where a camera goes out but these systems are designed to have overlapping views with the cameras that way there's some redundancy built in so what you know and we focus on our review heavily on data quality and we actually grade those video and there's a strong vessel feedback mechanism built into this program that all issues with the camera are then um written back to the vessel captain and the operator and you know sometimes enforcement agents or em technicians will visit to help assist with issues so every issue is tracked every issue is documented and we address those issues in a near timely matter um overall it's a very small percentage of data loss uh, related to these em systems and the trawl program when we move into the fixed gear um we run into a lot of catch handling issues in which you know uh, there's certain things to, that for us to be able to do catch estimation that do impact that data quality, but we also have a lot of observers. So overall data loss is uh, um, not that uh, prevalent, but uh, you know, we, it, this is where the, the, the staff time, right? In the maintenance of these systems, reviewing these drive reports uh, coming from the EM reviewers, communicating with these vessels, hey, Oh, your image quality wasn't that great because of that. Um, or like a call I had to make last week, which is, hey, our cameras are iced over. We have heavy icing. And it, you know, I was like, no, it's unsafe for you to climb a gantry to clear that. It's fine, right? So you have to make those type of calls and you just got to be flexible, get the best data that you can. Yeah, thank you. And I just had one more question here and perhaps Ms. Henry's um better for this question as the analyst, but I, I realize that only partial videoing reviewing is happening um, due to cost and cost prohibitations and, and time being time prohibitive, but um, is, is the way you're approaching what you can review standardized or are you, is there an avenue for input on who and at what times you're, you're gonna review certain uh, video footage? Through the chair. So we have multiple review, different fisheries have different review rates. So the Bering Sea Trolley M program, 100% of the footage is reviewed. Um, and actually 100% of the footage in the Gulf is also reviewed. Um, if there are instances where less than 100% is reviewed, that's always through a standardized process that's um, usually developed by the observer program and uh, rigor with rigorous statistical methods. So it's always unbiased data. Josh, feel free to add if I, if you have anything as well. No, I, I think you covered that well. Uh, stressing the point that, you know, we are reviewing 100% of the video collected. So the fixed gear boat program, they collect the, the video and all that video is accessible for review. Whether we choose to post select, you know, is a term that is used where we would select, randomly select to 
uh, limit bias uh, on the back end for cost savings. We are not currently doing that right now, but that you know could happen and it would be a very standardized process. And the EM review is a very standardized process too. These are um, ex-observers, uh, they go through training just like an observer would. They have, uh, you know, trial or you know like test or whatever you want to say where they all review the same video and they compare their notes to make sure that there's nothing was being missed um and so there's a very robust process for the em review um i hope that answers your question thank you a couple of questions um from my perspective so you mentioned that um that there are vessels that choose not to opt into this program or have chosen not to opt in. And what, what reasons were given for why they, they would not choose to opt into the EM program? Uh, through the chair, uh, and Anna, please feel free, because you may hear some reasons <laughs> why as well. But, um, you know, reasons I've heard is, you know, the, the ubiquitous big brother is always watching. I will, I can state very clearly, we're not looking for, you know, uh, somebody flicking a cigarette butt off the back or anything like that, right? We are focused on the, you know, elements that we we put in, like is salmon being discarded, right? So that's always a concern, big brothers watching. Um, another concern is, um, the catch handling requirements on certain vessels, like if you're a pot vessel, the catch handling requirements um, means that the table has to be cleared before you, you pull your next pot that slows down operations on deck. Um, and some vessels have been like, oh, you know, that slows operations too much. I'm going to opt out of EM. Sometimes vessels get caught doing something bad and an enforcement action happens and that makes them move away from an EM system because they view, I wouldn't have got caught if I didn't have that EM system. Those are the various reasons I've heard. And Anna, feel free to elaborate. No, I think you covered that well. And I, I think often it's really just dependent upon the incentives in the program and the specifics of the program design and whether that fits well with the individual operation of the vessel. Thank you. And then you may have kind of touched on some of this stuff, but I mean, if you were to characterize or sort of list the top two or three challenges associated with implementing an EM program, what would those be? Right. Anna, you want to take a shot on that? <laughs> Don't feel sure. limited to three. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole slide on the challenges associated with these programs. Uh, so picking the top, the top challenges, I mean, I, I really think it, the first is really just the stakeholder involvement, like the for the Troll EM program, it was really a program that was brought by the participants and they really were the, the primary kind of pushers of the program. We, they wanted to see this happen and, and it took a lot of work from them to be involved in every aspect, both the, the regulatory process, being involved in the committee process, uh, communicating with the fleet, um, so there's just a lot of collaborative work and it really requires the right people with the right desire and the right amount of time to put all of that work in. So I would say, I mean, that's, that's one of the primary challenges. And so the success of a program can be really dependent upon the participants and their, their drive and their ability to communicate with the stakeholders and the, and the regulators as well. Um, and then really, Determining a specific goal of the program. What is the goal? What what data are you trying to collect? And and how can you design the EM system so that it matches that well and efficiently and um, successfully and accurately collects those data? So I would, those are kind of the main the main aspects I would point to. And then as I mentioned before, the the design, the design of the program and, and implementing it is all very challenging, but also it requires a lot of administrative kind of background work, which is much easier to implement in the, in the a fishery where you already have that baseline set up with an observer program. So a lot of the kind of background of data collection and data transmission and fitting that into the system um, we already had systems designed through the observer program to manage that and deal with that. And yes, an EM data collection and EM system changes that. And but kind of changing those knobs 
on a dial for a system that already exists um, made it made it easier to implement in this this specifically these fisheries. Um, Josh, feel free to add anything if, if you have other high, higher challenges on the list. I think the only other challenge that I would mention um, through the chair would be, you know, the initial cost, right? It is quite costly at the beginning and be, making sure that you, you have that and that buy-in um, because it requires, you know, technicians boarding your boat, rewiring things and, you know, so, you know, we were lucky that we had that NIFWIF funding that helped us bring this up. But if it was on the agency to try to stand up and develop all these programs, um, those resources would likely not have been available to stand up the program. Thank you. And I guess hypothetically that if a board or a department at some point wanted or was interested in moving towards creating a similar state program or you know a scaled state program for specific fisheries perhaps would that require additional or new statutory receipt authority um, madam chair so first we don't have the authority to do electronic monitoring in statute so it requires statutory change to give us that authority and then number two we couldn't adopt fees without that statutory authority to to pass those costs on. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you both so much for being available. Oh, Ms. Commissioner. I want to thank you both yeah. for your presentation. Um, and thanks for taking time. I know this was a lot to put together, but thank you every, for everything you did on short notice. Thanks for stealing my thunder. <laughs> Just kidding. No. But thank, thank you both for being, being available. This is um, you know, interesting information and it gives us lots, lots to think about. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, switch gears and um, then present, have staff present on uh, the Nuchigat King Salmon Stock of Concern Draft Action Plan. All right, before we get into this, I just want to give folks a quick reminder um, that you got about 45 minutes if you want to s sign up for public testimony. Again, that, that, uh, that deadline is at 11 a.m. All right, gang, looks like we have the full complement before us. Uh, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Madam Chair. For the record, Forrest Bowers with the Department of Fishing Game. I just wanted to make a few uh, introductory comments on process before um, staff uh, begin their presentation. So as you're all aware, uh, we presented the department's draft action plan to you at the Bristol Bay Board of Fisheries meeting last year. And during that presentation, we provided uh, a suite of actions to conserve king salmon in each of the various fisheries that encounters them in the Nushiak district. We didn't provide a, a lot of detail on the sp specifics of the management actions, but at, at, during this presentation and during this meeting, we are, we're prepared to uh, fill in the details on those and uh, provide you a, an analysis of their e efficacy in conserving king salmon. So, that was that was a comment that we that we heard from the board at that last meeting, and and so we're we're prepared to address that now. 
Um, you know, you, you'll see in the presentation uh, several tables that list the various management actions that the board could adopt in the action plan. And we hope that that can serve as kind of the working document for you as you move through these. Um, you know, you can choose management actions that you think are appropriate and, and we can help you uh, with, with an analysis of, of what sort of king salmon conservation might uh, accrue from those. And those tables are similar to what you've seen recently in other action plans. So they'll present those here and then we'll have them up uh, during deliberations as well for you to work from. So just wanted to point that out that, you know, the action plan would be the kind of the document that we work from and that can be amended as you see fit. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Wood. A request to you, uh, Forrest. Uh, would you have your staff in making the comments they'll be making also take into account the uh, committee recommendations which we've just received here in the last week or so to the extent that they're capable of doing so? Yeah, I th through the chair, Mr. Wood, we can um, we, we can certainly comment on um, the impacts of the committee's recommendations and uh, describe you know wh how they would impact the various fisheries and affect king salmon conservation. Thank you. And any recommendation that you would have, pro con or change, and I appreciate that as well. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner. Um, I just want to make clear the action plan that we have is the department's action plan in front of you. There's an act, there's elements that are being put together by third parties that are not a department action plan or elements of that action plan. So we're ready to comment on it, but that is not, I want to make it clear that's not our proposal moving forward. That's a proposal by that work group, and, and there's a variety of um, pluses and minuses to that that we'll be prepared to talk to, but that is not the department's um, action plan. Thank you, Commissioner. I fully understand that, and that's what I'm asking for, the pluses and minuses and any suggested uh, changes that uh, your staff might think would be appropriate. Okay. Okay, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Tim Sands. I'm the Nushigat Commercial Fisheries Man Management Biologist. With me are Matt Nemeth, the Commercial Fisheries Regional Management Coordinator, Jay Balmer, the Sport Fish Regional Management Coordinator, Lee Borden, the Bristol Bay Sport Fish Management Biologist, and Robin Dublin, the Southern Region Program Manager for Subsistence. We're here to provide a refresher on the Nushigat River King Salmon Stock of Concern Action Plan. Reference as to RC3, tab 11 of the Board of Fish packet from November 30, 2022. This is a condensed version of the prior presentation, slightly modified to reflect discussion since then. At the October work session, you, the board, adopted the Nushigek River King Salmon as a stock of management concern. The basis for this was the failure to meet the in-river escapement goal of 95,000 Nishigak River King Salmon in five of the past six years. This, despite specific management measures taken by the department to reduce the harvest of Nishigak River King Salmon in the sport and commercial fisheries since 2017. Upon adoption as a stock of concern, the department was then tasked with developing an action plan for Nishigak River King Salmon. This was released November 23, 2022, included as RC4 at the Bristol Bay Board of Fisheries meeting a week later. Subsequently, the action was moved to the statewide meeting to allow more time for discussion and comment from the public. <clears throat> Before we look at action management plan options, I will provide you with an abbreviated review of the background that is also found in the December draft action plan. On the screen, we can now see figure three from the action plan, which can be found on page 29. This figure shows king salmon escapement in black and harvest by user group in shades of gray from 1994 to present. Additionally, the upper and lower bound of the SEG are represented by the blue lines and the in-river goal is noted by the orange line. As we can see from this figure, there was a decrease in king salmon productivity that corresponded with a statewide king salmon productivity decline that started around 2007. As we described at the December meeting, there is 
uncertainty with the current enumeration system for Nushigak River king salmon. However, it is clear that the Nushigak River king salmon are less productive than in the past and additional steps to protect them are warranted, especially given the record large returns of sockeye salmon to these systems that have resulted in an earlier and more aggressive start to the commercial fishery. The Nushigak District is a mixed stock fishery with three significant sockeye salmon producing systems, the Nushigak, Wood, and Agushik Rivers, as well as Nushigak King Salmon Stock. Run timing is such that there is a significant overlap between Nushigak River King Salmon and the sockeye salmon returning to all rivers associated with the Nushigak District. This overlap in run timing complicates management. The department has been operating well outside of the management plan triggers in response to large sockeye returns and weak king salmon runs. Production levels of both sockeye and king salmon have changed since the time when the management plan was developed in the 1990s. Sockeye salmon runs, wood and Nushigak combined, tripled from an average of 5.4 million from 1988 to 1997 to a recent 10-year average of 16.7 million, 2013 to 2022 average. Conversely, king salmon productivity has declined by more than 30% since 2007 in both the Nushigak River and statewide. This large sockeye salmon and weak king salmon production regime creates conflicting Nushigak district fishery management goals. Following the existing plan triggers to manage the fishery to stay within the sockeye salmon SEG goal range for large sockeye salmon runs conflicts with limiting king salmon harvest to achieve their goals. This is why the stock was identified as a stock of management concern. We look to the board with stakeholder input to provide guidance and or regulations to the department on how to balance the conflicting goals of conserving Nushigak River king salmon while still controlling sockeye salmon escapement. This figure should help put that into context. This shows in orange and plotted on the right side axis in millions of fish, the average cumulative sockeye salmon run size of about 25 million in the Nushigak district over the last five years overlaid with the blue curve of the average king salmon run timing through the district by percent per day on the left side axis. What this figure shows is if we wait until 50% of the king salmon run is past the commercial district, which is around June 25th, on average, then over the last five years, we would on average have waited until about 1.5 million sockeye salmon passed the district before fishing began. This is what we have been attempting to do in the past few years. If we make, wait much longer than that, say until July 3rd, or 75% of the king salmon escape is passed, then on average 9.5 million sockeye salmon would have passed the district per year prior to the start of fishing. It is important to note that these are averages and any given year the number could be much different than the average. Again, in this slide, the blue line is king salmon run timing from the previous slide with data on the x-axis, percent of total run is on the primary left, with dates on the x-axis, percent of total run on the primary left y-axis. The orange dots are the date at which the 100,000 sockeye salmon fishery trigger in the Wood River is achieved, plotted by year on the secondary right side y-axis. The main point of this slide is to show how the recent large sockeye salmon runs have resulted in the fishery starting earlier and earlier into the king salmon run timing curve. The 100,000 Wood River sockeye salmon is currently the trigger that tells the department when commercial fishing for sockeye salmon should begin in the commercial fishing district. Because of the record large sockeye salmon returns, this trigger is being met closer to 30% of the way through the king salmon run. So if you can see right here, Maybe we can get a pointer here. So I'm just going to step in here and say that it's really frustrating when I don't have units. Like, I, I don't know what's on the left, the right, and then the previous slide, too, and I don't know what orange represents. You said it, but it's not on the slide. So. Sorry. So the units, this is percent of the king salmon run on the left side, the percent per day of king salmon. So, so right here on the 20 first or so of June, 4% of the total king salmon run on average is going through the district. And on the right side, it's year. And 
if you look at these, these are the, the most current recent years up here, you can see they've moved to an earlier date. So, so that's saying that that 100,000 number of escapement past the Wood River Tower is being achieved earlier and earlier over history. You know, instead of being just a, a shotgun pattern, it's definitely trending to earlier time. <clears throat> this action plan is intended to direct the department management to provide for king salmon conservation by first delaying the start of fishing by two to three days and then decrease fishing effort once fishing starts up until the first couple days of July, after which the majority of king salmon have passed through the district and conservation measures become less effective from a sockeye salmon management cost benefit perspective. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody understands these two graphs because they're, they're kind of critical moving forward. Yeah, we're so, going to have to go back and review so, so for let's, sure. So let's go to number five real quick, Tim. Um, so the blue line represents the um, daily passage of king salmon into the river, which is reflected on the x-axis. So the blue line is reflected on the x-axis. The um, red line is the is represented by the, I mean the y-axis, is represented by the y-axis on the right-hand side. So it is basically the cumulative harvest of sockeye salmon by date on the bottom. So the blue line is on the left side of the y-axis and the red line is on the um, right side of the axis. Mr. Wood. I don't know that you're clarified much okay. there. <laughs> These graphs are kind of a mess. Yeah, okay. <laughs> try. Uh, I was looking at that number five, and I couldn't figure out how you came on the how the staff came up with 9.5 when the red line intersects the 75 percent ratio at something above 10, as does the blue line. So how do we end up with 9.5? Tim, why don't you walk us through this? I, I had the same trouble. I I think I understand it, but I probably didn't explain it. So, I'm, yeah. But these are critical towards moving forward. So they spend are. Spend a little bit more time. I actually had made a note, review these slides when we got to the end of the presentation, but let's do it now. Let's you know go back and baby step our way through this, please. Absolutely happy to. Okay, so the red line, to see what units we're talking about, you look over here in millions of fish on the right side. Mm -hmm. So everything with the red line, the date on the bottom and, and the millions of fish over here. And so right here where this line intersects, it points over here to just below 10 million. So that's the, the total run, catch and escapement through the district on average on, on this date uh, is 9.5 million. Madam Chair, can I jump in here? The reason why you and I have having problems, our graph is different than the one that got on the screen. Okay, because the, the red line and blue lines are not where you had it a second ago with the 9.5. I, I don't... I go mean, back I'm, one. Can I go show Tim what I have? In front yeah, of yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think what there's a... There's a... There's a um, Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's um, something about the way it printed out in PowerPoint or, or in, in uh, PDF versus the PowerPoint version. You're right, the, that black line, the 9.5 line, should extend over to where the red line is, and I apologize for that. I, I, we didn't, I didn't see these um, in the PowerPoint version or the PDF version. Um, I apologize for that confusion. It, it happens. Thank you. We're just as long as you just talk us through it. I think we'll hopefully get there. <laughs> All right. So so again, the blue line, the percent by day of king salmon going through the, the district, and the the blue vertical bars are, you know, the milestone points: fifty percent, seventy five percent of the total king salmon run on average. And then the red line, we at the 50% mark, this, this 1.5 line connects over to the red line here when, 
when it hits up 50% mark of the total run for king salmon. And on average over the last five years, that's been 1.5 million sockeye salmon have been through the district catching escapement. And then the 75% line with this, the 75% line in the red line intersect, it's been 9.5 million. So we're just saying, trying to figure out, you know, find that balance of how many sockeye do we forego opportunity on to protect kings and, and the, the amount of potential king saving by percentage is highest rate in, in this window here, and then it starts to decline. So, so trying to choose when we should start fishing for sockeye, how many sockeye we forego opportunity on versus how many kings we're potentially saving. Better. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Next one. Unless there's any questions on that. Okay, Mr. Carpenter. On slide five. Thank you, Tim. I'll ask the question while we're, we're on slide five. So specifically on for speaking to the 1.5 million, I think it's on or around June 25th, which is about 50% um, through the King run. <clears throat> if there was to be, um, and obviously that's harvest and escapement, but if there was to be um, a specific period of time where the fishery was closed, do you have any idea what percentage the 1.5 million would represent specifically to what the wood would assume to get from that versus the new Shigak? Through the chair, uh, Member Carpenter, it, it varies by year. You know, the last two years in particular, the new Shigak River has produced more than half of the total run to the new Shigak district. Historically, the wood is the biggest producer, and for the most of my early career, the, the Wood River produced three to one fish for uh, for the Nushigak. And certainly, like 2018 is another example. We had a 33 million run, and over 22 of it was Wood River fish. So the potential for the Wood River to have a, be a very big part of everything is is high. Slide six, let's carefully review that one. Okay, again, the king salmon information is the same. The blue line, the vertical bars, and the percent per day of king salmon passage through the district on the left side. On the right side, it's the year, and this dot here represents the, the day, the date that 100,000 sockeye salmon had passed the Wood River Tower. In, in the current plan, the King Salmon Management Action Plan, 100,000, projecting 100,000 sockeye salmon past the Wood River Tower was the trigger that the department followed to open the commercial fishing in the district. But you see, because it's getting earlier and earlier now, instead of being on the right side of the 50% mark for the King Salmon Run, we're on the left side, so we're potentially fishing earlier into the king salmon run before the 50% mark we're, we're uh, potentially, now we're not saying that every king salmon is caught when we have a commercial opening, but certainly if we didn't have commercial openings, the king salmon would go through the district without problem. But by the same token, we could be letting lots of sockeye salmon through the district too. For, you know, on June 23rd in 2022, we had a four-hour opening and harvested 800,000 sockeye. Quick question for you. So that 100,000, you said the trigger was king salmon escaping? 100,000 sockeye salmon sockeye. in the yeah. Wood River. Right. Okay. Any questions on slide six? Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so, Tim, when you when you think about the current regulation specific to the Wood River trigger, which is 100,000, and obviously the timing on the sockeye, as this graph clearly shows, is 
anywhere from three to six days earlier than it was 20 years ago, let's say. <clears throat> How relevant is that 100,000 fish trigger right now to you as a manager? And do you think because the timing has shifted um, and the Wood River can produce theoretically three to one over the new SCAC over a period of time, is that number too high for you? Um, through the chair, Member Carpenter, no, I, I don't. So, so the regulation is projected fish past the tower, and we've been waiting for actual fish, and we've been waiting for sometimes over 150,000 fish to go up the Wood River because we didn't think it was conservative enough to protect king salmon. So we, we, we kind of... Since it wasn't mandated that we had to open at 100,000, we kind of took the liberty to be more conservative toward king salmon, but we're still looking for additional guidance on, on what the right balance is here. Follow up, please. Um, and then specifically to the Wood River Special Harvest Area, um, do you think that there's a substantial amount of New Shigak Kings that move throughout that Wood River Special Harvest Area to where opening it at kind of that critical point in the King Salmon Run is, is there, do you have any idea of what that might look like or is it just too hard to guess? Yeah, to the chair, Ms. Member Carpenter. So there was some public testimony at the AC meeting talking about that and some members of the AC definitely relayed anecdotal information that they saw lots of kings up there. I personally subsistence fish below the Wood River Special Harvest Area, and we, we do get some in the lower end of the Wood River, but my, my general thought is unless there's a lot of kings around, you're not going to see many kings up that far in the Wood River. Certainly there might be some milling. Um, you know, it was primarily used to protect the Nushigak River sockeye, and certainly there could have been Nushigak River sockeye up there, but it was enough of a tool that it still protected Nushigak sockeye, so I would expect it would, it would work as well to protect Nushigak kings. Okay. Focusing on slide six. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hate asking questions that I don't know the answer to, but here we go. Uh, yeah, right. The committee has come up with a rather innovative approach to OEGs on, based on percentages. Would that change this graph from, and paragraph, on oh, that paragraph, for slide six? Or have you created a slide that would reflect what would be the situation? Yeah, um, through the chair, member would. So the OEGs don't necessarily change the starting point. The, the trigger language in the plan you're referring to would change the starting date of, of when we fished. The OEGs then tell us how hard to fish after we've started and allow us, you know, they, they guide us in saying that instead of trying to reach, keep within the escapement goal range as it is now, we can go over that escapement goal range um, by fishing less and providing more windows and breaks for King Salmon to pass through the district. And as the person who makes the decision in Dillingham, would those tools enhance your ability to manage, or is it something different that you would like to see? You know, the, the plan you're referring to, I think that they, that's a very good framework and structure, and uh, I think it would definitely make things better. Uh, the numbers aren't necessarily the numbers that I would choose, but um, there, there are numbers I think that would, would work, that would work in that plan. You know what I'm going to ask. What numbers would you choose, Commissioner? Would you like to? Yeah. So, so the triggers are a board decision as to how much protection you want to offer Chinook salmon at the expense of foregoing sockeye harvest. So, mm -hmm. we can tell you what the difference is, but we don't have a recommendation on the trigger that you should adopt. So, we if you ask us a question regarding a trigger, we could tell you the implications of that, but we're not going to make a recommendation on what that trigger should be. So I should just give you options for 6%, 7%, 8%. What is it you're suggesting? I guess I'm not. 
I think the question is, is if when you're presented with the with the plan that's put together by this work group, you can ask, what does this trigger do in terms of king, cam king salmon conservation? And we'll give you an answer to that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to move those triggers, we that's up to you, and, and we can tell you if you move it, what that does for king. We're yeah. not going to give you a number that says this is what we want in terms of king, cam king salmon conservation, but we can tell you the, the, the net effect of different numbers would have. Here's what I'm after, Commissioner, and if you, you know, you know if you're not comfortable doing it, I understand that. But I'd like to know from the department with their expertise what they believe would be the optimum number to strive to, uh, whether 6% is, is the number or something different is the number. Apparently, at least one of the staff believes something different is the number. I'm just trying to find out what that is. Okay. Slide 6, are there any questions about... What slide six is communicating right now? Okay, let's move on to slide seven, please. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, my name is Robin Dublin. I'm with subsistence. On this slide, uh, as described in the Nishiak River King Salmon Stock, Stock Status and Action Plan beginning on page 15, there is a positive customary and traditional use finding for all fin fish in Bristol Bay with an amount necessary for subsistence of 157,000 to 172,171 salmon. Currently, there is not a separate ANS for Nushagak River King, drainage kings. Subsistence fishery options are as follows. Option one would keep things the way they are under the King Salmon Management Plan. Subsistence harvest would be managed through emergency order, and this may be changed under Proposal 11. Option two would implement a, a per permit limit on king salmon harvest. It is unclear what the implications would be if someone caught their limit of king salmon and then caught additional king salmon while trying to harvest other salmon species. Option three would instruct managers to reduce the time when subsistence fishing will be allowed in the Nushgak drainage, during the Dillingham, including the Dillingham beaches and the Wood River to, to Red Bluff. Currently, under the King Salmon Plan, the department can only reduce subsistence fishing time after the sport fishery is closed. Option four would have the department close a more limited area than the entire Nushagak drainage, and it is somewhat similar to option three. Options two, three, and four would require board action. Madam Chair. For the record, uh, Madam Chair, my name is Lee Borden. I'm the Area Management Biologist for Sport Fisheries Division for Bristol Bay Management Area. I will briefly walk you through uh, slide eight, uh, containing sport fisheries options within the action plan. This can be found in pages 11 through 15 in the department document that was submitted to the board. Uh, so first action is action number one. Uh, this is called the status quo EO authority um, action. Um, this would leave regulation the same and allow the department to manage based on the existing EO authority. Um, this would result in timely and meaningful in-season management based on current run strength. Um, the department has and has used EO authority to manage the fishery in the past. Um, just because the regulations, are, just for clarification, just leaving the regulations the same does not mean that management actions will remain the same. Management actions in the future would likely be more conservative than in the past, being that this is now in stock of concern status. Option number two, or action number two, is a reduction in bag and possession limits. Uh, this would be adopting regulation that would reduce bag and possession limits for fish over 20 inches in length and or reduce annual limit for fish uh, over 20 inches in length. Um, this would still provide for harvest opportunity um, within regulation and allow fisheries managers to make in-season management decisions. Uh, action number three would be to create a non-retention fishery. Uh, this would adopt regulation that would create Nushigak River drainage king salmon non-retention fishery and would prohibit the use of bait. Uh, this would not allow for harvest opportunity within the sport fishery and would create a situation where uh, harvest opportunity would be difficult to uh, restore later in the fishery. Uh, option number four 
would create new time and area regulations. Uh, this would adopt regulation that would restrict time and area for king salmon sport fishing in the Nushagak drainage. And finally, action number five. Uh, this is closing the king salmon sport fishery and prohibiting bait in the drainage. Uh, this would also adopt a regulation that would close the fishery in the Nushagak and prohibit the use of bait. Um, and this would eliminate harvest of king salmon and reduce catch and release mortality in the sport fishery. The, for the record, Tim Sands again. Um, for the commercial fisheries options, pages five through 10, option number one, under this option, the regulations allow for commercial fishing to begin as soon as 100,000 sockeye salmon are projected past the Wood River Tower. We have been holding off on fishing for sockeye salmon until at least 100,000 sockeye salmon have actually passed the tower. In doing so, more sockeye salmon, wood and Nushigak have passed through the fishery than the current sockeye salmon SEGs prescribe. Number two, this action would allow us to develop a sockeye salmon trigger for the Nushigak River, a commercial fishing district with the exception, with the exception of the Agushik gillnet fishery would remain closed until that trigger was met. While fishing in the regular commercial district is closed, the Wood River Special Harvest Area could be used to harvest some of the Wood River sockeye salmon that pass through this closed fishery. This would help control Wood River sockeye salmon escapement as well as provide opportunity. It does add its own list of concerns, however. Number three, this action would provide the department guidance on how to balance the conflicting goals of achieving Nushigak River King Salmon lower end or in-river escapement goals while not exceeding sockeye salmon upper end escapement goals. The triggers referenced in action two delay fishing by keeping the commercial fishery closed longer to conserve king salmon. The OEGs in this action allow the department to fish less aggressively once fishing starts in the regular commercial district. Number four, there is a significant difference in the exploitation rate of Wood River and Nushigak River sockeye salmon. It has been posited that we could make the sockeye salmon fishery more efficient through mandating a smaller mesh size. A more efficient fishery would then theoretically allow us to reduce fishing time and catch the same number of sockeye salmon, in turn letting more king salmon go through. It is unclear if this would be effective. Reducing net length would simply reduce catches of both sockeye and king salmon during fishing openings. Number five. Under this action, ADF&G would use emergency order authority to reduce commercial fishing during king salmon run timing. This would be based on a combination of factors that include pre-season sockeye salmon forecasts and in-season king salmon assessments. For example, in a year with weak in-season king salmon assessment, the department might keep the commercial district closed through the historic 50% of the run, June 25th, then open the fishery with reduced time through July 1, or the 70 percentile of the king salmon run. After that date, the fishery would be managed as needed for sockeye salmon escapement. These actions might be adjusted based on in-season developments in run strength for both sockeye and king salmon. Another option is to reduce the area open to fishing, for example, by cutting the district in half north to south. It is important to note that many of these actions would need to be used in concert with other actions. If there is no specific guidance given in the stock of concern plan, the King Salmon Management Plan would then be used to provide guidance. Number six, this action would close the commercial fishing to conserve the King Salmon Run. <clears throat> the department understands the current assessment program isn't extensive enough to quantify all the run components and that existing projects have shortcomings. We are working to add a suite of King Salmon assessment projects with collaborators to better understand the run. We won't go into detail as this was covered in previous discussion, but it is available in the action plan. However, an important thing to consider is building a new assessment program will take time and real, a realistic timeline to see benefits from this new pro program could take a decade or more. In the meantime, the department is seeking regulatory help from the board to manage this stock more conservatively until we can gain a better understanding of the King Salmon population. All right, so so far we've went over the different options and through those tables. Now I'd like to cover the, the criteria for delisting. 
Um, if the lower bound of the SEG is met or exceeded in three consecutive years and is expected to meet the goal range in future years or is met in four out of the six consecutive years is ex and is expecting, expected to meet the goal range, the department will recommend removing Nushkiak River King Salmon as a stock of management concern at the first Board of Fish Board meeting after this condition is met. There's also two other restrictions or abilities to loosen the restrictions. Um, and these are be if management restrictions may be relaxed based on King Salmon run timing if catch and harvest data indicate restrictions are no longer needed to ensure the escapement goal is met. Another one is if two consecutive years or escapements are near or above the upper bound of the escapement goal range, management restrictions may be relaxed or set aside using EO authority. And I believe that's the end of our, our presentation, so we'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you. Um, before we get into questions, I just want to remind folks you have about eight minutes to get in your blue card if you want to provide any public testimony. If you haven't already dropped your blue card at the front table, you got just a few minutes to do so. Mr. Wood. Yeah, I was, I was slow at the, at the draw. Uh, but go back to research, Tim. I think you handled that presentation. Uh, the Bristol, boy, I'm going to butcher this. The Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Something Alliance, and I'm sure Fritz will correct me on the name, uh, made a recommendation that we use uh, the uh, tickets at the uh, processor to figure out how many of what fish are going through the processing because they have more accurate data. Is that something that should be included into this research plan uh, to be incorporated for use? Uh, Member Wood to the chair. So we, we've been doing that for the last two years. We've been, um, it's, there's some growing pains with it, but we have been asking processors for the production data from their plants so we get a better count of the king salmon. And we have, we already have our authority to require that and, and we're doing that. And all of them are cooperating? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I had a follow-up on Member Wood's question, and, and that's for slide three, is um, what's the data that's being used to represent commercial harvest in the last couple of years there in this graph? Um, Member McKenzie, to the chair. Um, the, the data that we're using is the fish ticket data, so it does not include the production data that we've gathered. Thank you, and just a follow-up real quick. Um, I remember from the Bristol Bay meeting that we were looking at the processor data showing an underreporting rate of around 55 to 65%. My question is, is it safe to assume that um, the king harvest by the commercial fleet is quite a bit larger than what's being represented on graph three? Yeah, to the chair, again, it is really rough data. We haven't vetted it, and there's been growing pains. There, there is definitely a, a difference, and and it, the data that the pr the production data is definitely higher than what's reported on the fish tickets. But I can't really quantify it because we haven't vetted it. Thanks. And just my final question here is, uh, what are the growing pains? So, the different processors, you know, um, just they have to. They're they're not used to reporting that way. And so uh, getting the numbers, like sometimes I just get pounds, sometimes I just get numbers of fish. Um, and so I, I'm really working on a formal letter with the registration. We're gonna have registration interviews this year where I'm gonna sit down with processors and say, this is what you're going to provide to me. And I've reached out to them and asked them, you know, to see if these things are reasonable and what timeline we're talking about, but we're going to require um, with kind of very insistently from now on that they provide this data to us. Thank you. I just want to add that I, I very much applaud the department's effort on trying to collect the best uh, information that it can as, as the science agency that's here to support the resources of the state. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, and I'm going to harp on the home pack issue too. I know that those are supposed to be reported under commercial 
numbers, right? And I, just for the record, I mean, what is your confidence that that is being accurately reported, or do you have? I'm trying to reach back into my memory into the discussion that we had in December, but um, but that is a component. Yes, Madam Chair, it, it certainly is, and um, you know, we, we heard public testimony from that that stated various different things, and, and I think it's definitely on the, much higher on the radar of the processors now, and I think they're going to be much more adamant in their training of their tenders, but, but I can't really speak for them, but the, the feedback I've gotten is they're going to really emphasize this with their tenders. We're certainly emphasizing it um, to the processors and in our outlook that we're going to put out here after this meeting, we'll emphasize that we really want that, those home pack numbers reported. Thank you, and I, you know that begs the question, and I'd be interested to see how you know the hopefully the improvement in the number that you receive, but whether or not a fish ticket is the appropriate place and mechanism to be reporting home back. Um, I have a quick question for you, and again, this is just please refreshing my memory. Um, <clears throat> but the SEGs for these river systems were recently re reviewed, correct? Madam Chair, yes, I think they were they were reviewed kind of in, in preparation for a 2021 board meeting. Um, so they haven't really been updated through 2020, 21. Um, so I think the, the last data was 2020, but um, they are reviewed every board cycle, yes. And were there changes or adjustments made to those SEGs recently? No, okay. not for this, not for any of the systems. Okay. Today. When was the last time the SEG was adjusted for the New Chicago River? Madam Chair, I believe 2012 was the last time the Nushigak River was adjusted. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, so, Tim, I've been thinking about the, the SEGs, you know, specific to the wood and the Nushigak and the upper limits of the MEG, SEGs. Um, I believe the wood's 1.7 million and the Nushigak's... Uh, 900,000, um, that obviously represents MSY. Um, speaking to the, the, level, the numbers or the levels <clears throat> specific to the language and some of the stock of concern reports um, that represent a much higher level in some regards um, to, an o, to an OEG or a potential OEG, what, at what point, at how many, at what point can we put too many fish, or have we proven to put too many fish in the wood or new shagak to where the replacement value doesn't come back? Through the chair, member Carpenter. Um, so our biggest escapement ever in the Wood River was 7.5 million in 2018. And we've already seen seven million fish come back from that year. So it, we're still at replacement rate. The, 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 the way we do these things is we look at what, what runs we've had and, and how they've kind of the return per spawner from those runs. And historically, uh, we, had, we had one year in 1980 for the Nushigak River that had 3.8 million or, or so return to the Nushigak and only half a fish came back for everyone that spawned. So we've always had a lower escapement goal range for the Nushigak. But now, 2017, we had 2.8 million sockeye go up the Nushigak River, and we've seen 23 million come back from that. So clearly, whether, whether it's a change in, in the productivity of the ocean or, or what, something happened, and, and the, wood, the Nushigak River productivity is much higher than it had been, and the goal will in undoubtedly change at the next board cycle because we have this new information that we, we didn't have for our analysis. Um, likewise, the wood, we're, we're going to get some, you, we've had 4 million escapement, 3 million escapements up there in recent history, and we'll get that information back from those returns as well and be able to adjust the SEGs on the Wood River. Um, does that answer your question? It does answer my question. I guess the reason that I brought the question up was <clears throat> when, you, when you talk about king conservation, 
And that's obviously the goal of what we're trying to do right now. And we're all, but we're also trying to eliminate as much foregone, foregone harvest as we can on sockeye. It's, it's apparent to me that these systems in Bristol Bay are far, far more forgiving to putting lots of sockeye into the systems while trying to conserve king salmon versus most other systems probably in the state of Alaska where you're trying to conserve king salmon, but you end up putting far too many sockeye in. So I just, I'm just trying to make sure that, I, that that's kind of the way you see it. And I think from your reaction that that's probably the case. Yeah, member Carpenter to the chair. So I agree with that. You know, there, there probably is a top end still. What that is, we don't know. Um, you know, the, the, the New Shigak 3.8 million escapement from 1980, it, again, it could have just been conditions of, of the ocean or freshwater, you know, cold winters or something in 1980 that, that are different now. Uh, and so that, that productivity number changes over time as well. Um, but for the most part, we haven't had, when we do our, our spawn and recruit graphs, we, we don't have a lot of numbers on the far right side of the graph, like 3 million or 4 million escapements. And so now that we have some of those, we'll, we'll be much better able to kind of grasp what, what the productivity likes in the, the, those big numbers. Yeah, I just, I mean, I'm just going to say it because, you know, I recognize the timing is off with this because of COVID and all kinds of things, but it is profoundly frustrating to hear that there's information that will inform this discussion that could be, you know, that's pending or that's going to be coming, you know, and I recognize that the data, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a statement of fault. It's just frustrating with the timing of it, you know, like you made the statement that the SEGs will be being adjusted. Well, if we knew what those adjustment dates were, that could really inform this discussion now, um, you know, as it is, I kind of feel like, you know, we did, we're not operating with the best available information. Um, I know that that hasn't, isn't ready for it yet, but I just have to get that off my chest. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I apologize for that. It, it really, we need to see the returns from 2021 and 2022, and that's gonna take five years at least. Got it, thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Mitchell? Thanks, I just wanna switch gears real quick to the sport fish options that are presented here and um, kind of specifically to the prohibition of bait. Um, it just seems like it would be appropriate to have that in conjunction with maybe some of the other restrictions, perhaps number three, and I just kind of wanted to hear some of the, the department rationale on, on the prohibition of bait and why it's included only in number five. Um, <clears throat> through the chair, member Mitchell. Um, I actually, I believe it's also in action number three. Um, so if in the original action plan as submitted on page 12, um, you'll see that it is actually included with number three. And um, as far as the, uh, you know, the prohibition of the use of bait as a tool, um, that could certainly be inserted wherever the board would find it necessary or you know, that's, so, uh, my, my page 12 is um, a questions page. So what you're saying is that sport fish option number three is a create a non-retention fishery and prohibit the use of bait. It's just not indicated on our presentation here. Um, through the chair, uh, Member Mitchell, that, that's correct. It's just not in that um, matrix you're seeing on slide eight. But, but within the actual document, it is um, an element of action number three. Good to know. Thank you. Other board questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and switch gears and begin public testimony, and then we will uh, 
somewhere in there break and then uh, resume public testimony after lunch, but let's go ahead and get started on it. Let's take about a 15 minute break and we'll uh, get ready, get set up for testimony.
All right, welcome back. <clears throat> Time is 11.26. We're back on the record. We're going to begin the public testimony portion of our meeting, some guidance. So for this meeting, the board has called for public testimony on the numerous proposals before us. The board appreciates the interest and concern of those who are willing to come forth and testify. Um, appreciate your insights, your knowledge um, of your fishery. Um, there is a handout on the table at the back entitled Guidelines for Public Testimony that provides some useful information on testifying. For those of you who would like, again, we talked about the blue cards. That deadline has passed, so hopefully you will have already submitted a blue card if you are willing or wanting to testify. If you haven't, I'm uh, sorry you missed the deadline. Uh, for those who did make the deadline, when your name is called, please come forward to the microphone and state your name for the record and who you represent. If you have written materials for the board, you should identify those materials by the RC, PC, or AC number. And I'll provide members, uh, board members, an opportunity to get that paperwork before them. And I'm not going to, we won't charge you, you know, you're against your three minutes um, for the board to get those, um, get that paperwork in front of us. Um, at this meeting, again, the public will be given three minutes to testify. Uh, advisory committee and regional advisory council reps will be given 10 minutes. Our red, yellow, green light system that some of you may have been familiar with um, has been malfunctioning lately, so we're using a simpler timer for testimony at this meeting. So you'll hear the beep when your time is up. If you don't sp stop speaking when the timer goes off, um, I will remind you to do so. When you're finished, also please remain seated for just a moment so that the board can ask you, board members may ask questions if they have any for you. We ask that you confine your oral testimony to the subjects under consideration at this meeting in as concise and direct manner as possible. It is, that three minutes goes pretty fast. And it is the intent of the board to deal with the merits of the proposal based on the general principles used by the board. Again, the board does not deal in personalities. Thus, the public testifiers are admonished and uh, will be admonished. And please don't refer to anybody by name whether that's uh, somebody that's previously testified, any member of staff, or any board member. Advisory committee and regional advisory council reps should also fill out a blue card. You've done that. Um, for those AC and, um, and RAC representatives that are going to be testifying, please just uh, make sure that you make clear on the record that you are representing um, the AC or the RAC and confine your testimony to the positions that your committee took on the proposals or the issues and give minority opinions, if any. And if you wish to provide your personal testimony, I'm hoping that you have also filled out a blue card indicating as such. And, um, and I might ask you if you're planning to provide personal testimony, which one you're going to give first, whether you're going to give the AC report um, or uh, your personal testimony. If your name is called and you're not present to testify, a second call will be made, second calls um, are typically made after lunch and evening breaks if we have an evening session. Uh, so if you received your first call at this meeting, um, I'll do your second call after we come back from lunch. Um, and if we do your first call in our afternoon session, um, then I'll give your second call first thing in the morning. Um, if you miss both your first and second calls, you're not going to be able to testify at this meeting. So if you have any questions about that or need any clarification, just let me know and I'll be happy to provide um, additional guidance. But with that, let's go ahead and get into public testimony. I'm going to call the first name and then I'm going to call the names of the, the, the next few people that will come up just to kind of give you an idea that you're going to be on deck soon. So. Um, if you hear your name called, then I would advise you to kind of work your way closer to the microphone um, so that we don't need to take the time to watch you do the bridal walk down the aisle. Save us a little bit of time. All right, starting with public testifier number one, Ellen Hannon. Hi, Ellen. Welcome to the Board of Fisheries. Good morning. Didn't know I'd be the very first one. Thank you. I'll also just let folks know while you're getting ready, Ellen, that the list of public testifiers, I think, is posted around the room towards the back, so you can check the list and see what number you're at, too. Okay. Thank you. I didn't get to that point yet. Good morning, members of the Board of Fish. Thank you for your service and the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ellen Hannon, and I'm the chair of the Craig AC in Southern Southeast Alaska. 
I've lived in Craig for over 40 years, and I'm a lifelong Alaska resident. I am presenting the Craig AC, uh, representing the Craig AC with the following comments. On proposal 153, we support 120, the slinky ground pots uh, fish uh, escape mechanism that we agree there's a uh, need for clarification and definition for the state troopers to uh, enforce the regulations. On proposal 154, we oppose 12-0. This is a currently unlawful per Alaska state statutes and current and saners are already extremely efficient. Drums can haul the nets a lot faster, are more efficient and dangerous. We do not need drums on saners. They're extremely efficient right now and our resources are maxed out. Uh, Proposition 155, this was the uh, sport fish um, uh, being able to, um, excuse me, let me get that back to that. A spear and spear gun while swimming and at the surface and no uh, biological concerns, sport fish only and increases opportunity with little impact on the resource. Proposition uh, 156, prohibit the use of felt sole waders. We supported 11 to 1. Uh, I'd like to point out that I was the one opposing vote and there was confusion telephonically, so that should really be, we supported completely. Halks keeping, keep responsible outdoor people should be in full support so we don't have any more invasive species and reduce it. Proposition 157, we oppose 12 to 0 to allow commercial anglers to fish around the state would increase competition with the existing fisheries already in, allowed. Could also be very disruptive and increase competition. Uh, Proposition 160, oppose 12 to 0. Currently only 15% of the hatchery fish are fin clipped, so this proposal will be detrimental and is totally unnecessary. Uh, this is a personal note I shared at the meeting, but uh, we, I have participated in a king salmon cost recovery fishery, and having clean catch, we have many jack kings returning at less than 28 inches. So if the means is to protect wild stock, it's not always doing that. Proposition 163, oppose 11 to 1, prohibiting, uh, as opposed to prohibiting guiding services and personal use fisheries and would be detrimental to Alaska residents. Currently, it's not illegal to guide and personal use fisheries. This proposal is mainly for rivers up north, where personal use fishers who do not have the equipment are not able to safely access and participate, so they pay operators. If passed, this would never negatively impact personal use fishers. Proposition 164, support 12-0, guiding for personal use and subsistence is legal and would establish registration and potentially logbook requirements. We don't have issues here uh, in Southeast that we know of, but at Prince William Sound might have, and then we see that fishing game is neutral. There could be a problem with overlapping reporting if you were asking the operators to do a logbook and the persons participating in the fisheries. Proposition 165, we supported 12-0. We don't think guides should be involved in subsistence fisheries. The proxy system can address this solution, and quite often people in our area and the areas I know of very, share very well. Proposition 166, we supported 12-0. Um, we need to know how many of what species is being harvested for management and sustainability. Proposition 167, oppose 12-0. This is unnecessary burden to users, staff, and the state troopers. We already have re reporting requirements for personal use and subsistence fisheries. It would be very difficult to implement, enforce, and would not help with management. Proposition 168, support 12-0. This is a housekeeping issue, so users can still catch and release while protecting public from eating uh, fish from contaminated Waters, we agree with that. Proposition 169, we supported uh, to keep the invasive species at, at bay. Uh, this, piece, this would help with uh, removal of certain types of invasive species so that uh, we've seen that these effects in other areas. If there could be a, a large harvest to take care of those and make it legal to uh, do the, so would be advantageous. That's all I have, but if you have questions for me, I'd glad to answer. Thank you, Ellen. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your concise report and appreciate your service on the AC. Thank you.
Next up is Duncan Fields, followed by Jeremiah Maxwell, Glenn Trombley, and Tom Jennings. Hi, Duncan. Welcome. Hi, Merritt. I'm here today <clears throat> representing the Kodiak Advisory um, Committee. After 33 to 34 years coming to a Board of Fish meetings, this is the first time I've represented an advisory committee. I drew the short straw this time. Um, we had a robust uh, discussion of the statewide fin fish issues on, I believe it was February 15th, and there were some issues we chose not to take up after discussion and, and others that we did. Um, the first issue uh, with regard to proposal uh, 153 is define escape mechanisms for collapsible slinky groundfish pots. We had a number of uh, fishermen in the room that have used these pots and they felt like without additional information, the proposal was too ambiguous to uh, move forward. We took no action on that proposal, not because there wasn't an interest in developing uh, escape mechanisms, but because of the way that those pots fish and sometimes are covered with mud and they were concerned that folks that were not familiar with the fishery uh, would design a regulation that would then inhibit or harm f fishermen uh, that were trying to do their best uh, to provide escape mechanisms. So that, that was one that we had a substantial discussion on, but without more information. We just didn't feel like we could make a recommendation to the board. <clears throat> we also talked about 82, but felt like that was outside of our purview with regard to the Yukon area fishery. Uh, 154, allow the use of purseine drums. Uh, we had a number of people at the advisory panel that had actually fished on saners with drums, and there were a variety of comments and um, perspectives relative, but in the end, we opposed that proposal 0 to 10. Proposal 155, we viewed mostly as housekeeping. Uh, that was brought forward by the fish, um, Sport Fish Division, and the biologists there uh, had explained some uh, issues with regard to enforcement of the current uh, regulation, and so we supported changing that regulation uh, to allow a person using a spear or spear gun to take fish while swimming at the water surface as opposed to being below the water surface. Um, 156, again, we felt that was housekeeping. Uh, that was parity with other requirements, uh, uh, eliminating or, or prohibiting um, felt sold weighted footwear. 157 and 158, we took together. There was a substantial discussion about this, and I think the board's aware of practices where um, fishers fish in two or perhaps three areas in the state, both in terms of salmon and herring. And while they don't have another permit in their name, they have a permit in a son's name or a crewman's name or um, someone else on the vessel. And at some point, some of the advisory committee uh, members advocated that since that's the common practice in Alaska, we aren't really inhibiting or prohibiting an individual that has more than one permit from actually fishing in another area. Why not just recognize that and allow uh, those permits to be held by the same individual rather than the transfer back and forth on an annual basis? On the other hand, there was a point of view that said, uh, if we open this up, it's uh, likely to accelerate or increase uh, competition in some areas uh, for people that have multiple permits. And so ultimately, after much discussion, that proposal failed three to six, or those proposals, 157 and 158. <clears throat> 159, uh, closed commercial fishing for a given species within one-fourth of a mile of any area closed to sports fishing. So we really support, strongly support mixed stock management in Kodiak. Uh, making management decisions for a single species often has harm uh, or could have harm for other species. I think one of the examples we use with the Carlick River, if we simply manage the Carlick River for Chinook, you're likely to have overescapement for both sockeye and pink salmon. And so um, there was a primary opposition to this proposal, one to seven, and two folks thought that it was um, could be a circumstance where there would be um, biological benefit to a fixed closure, um, but others also thought that if there was a need for this, the department could implement it on a area by area or a system by system basis, and there was no need for a statewide regulation. Um, 160, there really wasn't much discussion about this. It just seemed like a bad idea 
I think it would be a tar baby for the board uh, to start determining what species you catch and whether or not the proceeds from that species go to a third party. And so there was uh, unanimous opposition to Proposal 160. I think Proposal 161 probably generated the most discussion in our uh, group. Um, this is a proposal that the board had seen at your initial work session. I think there was an RC submitted in the, at the December meeting, and I believe there's an RC 17 submitted now. Um, we're working on a couple of different drafts of this, so I want to maybe try to clarify. The language that we brought forward here was based on the RC that had been submitted in December. It is parallel one with another. The local advisory committee supported this language, but the board should not infer that should you decide not to include this additional language that we don't support the original RC or the RC 17 before you now. As you know the background of this, this is a proposal that has sort of been uh, forced on the state, on the industry, if you will, by the Marine Stewardship Council for their certification of the codfish fisheries. Uh, I won't comment on the frustration I have with that paradigm. Having said that, I believe that the industry has worked together. Uh, AFDF had gotten a uh, wide uh, variety of uh, stakeholders of the industry, uh, both in the initial uh, draft of the language that you first saw, as well as the RC in December, and now RC 17. And so I believe this is a fair and uh, adequate policy uh, statement regarding the min uh, ministry management of ground fish, fishery resources in, in waters of Alaska. So again, 161 in Kodiak, that passed 10 0. We focused on new or additional language, but we also support the uh, RC uh, lang uh, language in RC 17. Let's catch up here. 162, um, we took no action. 163, prohibit guiding and personal use fin fish fisheries. This may be, listening to the Craig RC, more of a regional issue, but for the Kodiak perspective, it seems like we're uh, to have guiding for personal use fisheries was sort of crossing a line or blurring a distinction uh, between commercial fisheries, personal use fisheries, and subsistence fisheries. Uh, because Kodiak is a subsistence area, we don't have a lot of direct uh, experience with the personal use fishery, but we felt strongly that allowing guiding within that fishery uh, could blur the line and create sort of a quasi-commercial fishery uh, with guides advertising to take people out to catch uh, their personal use fish. So we would encourage the board to reject that proposal. As you can see, uh, it uh, failed at the Kodiak Advisory Committee 9-0. Um, establish registration and reporting requirements for personal use guides and transporters. Um, we supported that proposal. Um, we felt like any additional information uh, that the state has uh, relative to activity and harvest or take of our resources is a good thing. Um, other people noted that there may be some additional costs involved, uh, but we felt like some of this activity is outside of the purview of, of the management or the awareness of what's actually going on in the field, and we thought a regulation for more information would be helpful. Then finally, Madam Chair, uh, Proposal 161, prohibit or excuse me, compensation for guidance and assistance fisheries from Kodiak. This is just a strong black letter no. Subsistence fisheries are subsistence fisheries. You know, folks in the communities are uh, paid for their gas or use of the skiff, oftentimes with a subsistence catch. And the idea that you would have guides taking you out to do your subsistence fishing uh, was not something that our advisory committee would countenance, Mr. Madam Chair. Uh, then finally, um, establish statewide bag, bag limit for personal uh, fin fish fisheries. I listened again to the Craig AC. We felt like um, bag limits for personal use fisheries needs to be regionalized. Uh, the department knows the specific circumstance in each of the management areas across Alaska and should set the bag limits accordingly. These kind of statewide regulations that treat everybody the same or put everybody in the same box often come back to bite us, and we didn't believe that this was an appropriate uh, regulation for the board to accept at this time. Um, proposal 167, 
uh, require in-season reporting of subsistence and personal use. As you've already heard, this is impractical on its face. Uh, we oppose it. We don't think the board should spend much time uh, with this kind of in-season requirement uh, for reporting. Um, 168 was a housekeeping procedure, emergency order, allowing restrictions of sport fisheries and contaminated waters. I think that's very fact specific and needed. So we supported that. And then amend the list of banned invasive species. That's also housekeeping. And we believe that whenever we have new and uh, um, in invasive or new and harmful uh, species, uh, we should have those added to the list of invasive species. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you, Duncan. I have one clarification uh, question for you, and then we'll get to Mr. Wood. Um, with respect to 165, you said there was an emphatic no, and I'm assuming that means that the <coughs> AC supported the proposal, or can you just clarify what the AC's position on 165 was, support or not? Oh, the, the um, compensation pro guide services. The, the proposal was to prohibit, mm -hmm. and so we support the prohibition. If I wasn't okay. clear on that, I apologize, Matt. That's that's what I figured. I just wanted yeah. to make make sure that that was the case. Is that the same? Okay. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Fields? All right, Duncan. Thank thanks you. for um, accepting the short straw. Next up is Jeremiah Maxwell. Hi, Jeremiah. Welcome. You gotta push the button in the red. There okay, you, I you said go. this wasn't intimidating or anything. <clears throat> uh, I'm just a an Alaskan sports fisherman that you know needs to fill my freezer to feed my family, which is my wife and three dogs. And sometimes, and I'll just say real quick. Uh, you know, I spent 25 years in the military, and uh, I was in the National Guard for a lot of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, our aviators and stuff fight fires in the summer, and they don't have a lot of time during that time to go fishing. And it's really important for us to be able to hire somebody that keeps us safe. And, uh, um, you know, I usually fish in the Chitna, and uh, I fish on a guide, and the, uh, the guide has always kept me safe. and done uh, things that have, uh, um, you know, just made me feel comfortable. Uh, I can't afford a boat, uh, um, but it does fill my freezer and it does allow me to feed my family. So it's just uh, one of those things where it's very important for me to continue to be able to do that. Uh, and I know I'm not alone, uh, but uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any board questions? Appreciate your testimony and thank you for your yep. service. Glenn Trombley. Hi, Glenn. Everybody's got to push the button. <laughs> uh, thanks for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, my name is Glenn Trombley, uh, born and raised here in the state of Alaska. 55 years, unbelievably, but uh, I'm uh, Coast Guard licensed, registered guide, hunting, fishing guide as well. Have a merchant mariner's credential. Um, I'm also the captain of the dip ship, which is a personal use uh, fishery um, a vessel that's used on the Kenai River, specifically in the upper Cook Inlet fishery. Um, my services are basically um, to provide an opportunity to the fishery for all walks of life that are residents of Alaska. But most specifically, um, whether you're able-bodied or not, my, my boat is designed um, to provide a service to folks that we don't quite often recognize um, with special needs here in Alaska. Um, and when I say we don't recognize that is because um, you don't always see somebody who has a special need visibly, whether they're in a wheelchair or not, um, uh, as somebody that needs a service other than what you would normally see uh, around town, a uh, parking spot to park their vehicle closer to a building or something like that. But nevertheless, uh, my vessel is, is designed to specifically target Alaska residents who normally don't get a chance to access the river, 
in the normal conventional way that uh, we as able-bodied Alaskans, a lot of us, to be specific, about 87% of the Alaska residents um, uh, can actually do. So there, that the numbers, 13% um, of Alaska residents right now, actually as of three years ago, these numbers are off just a little bit, but as of three years ago, 13% of the Alaska residents, that's basically one in seven and a half, one in eight people, has a disability that is bad enough that they possess a card that they can park their vehicle closer to a, 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 um, a building and, and get access. So why would we want to not recognize those folks and give them an opportunity to provide for themselves rather than relying on um, somebody else to do it for them? So where I'm going with this is um, guide services are looked at in several different ways. One as a profit entity business. The other as providing a service. If I was personally um, uh, financially stable enough that I could provide this service without having to make a profit, I would gladly do it. Um, I have family members and people that I've dealt with over the past seven years since I've been uh, a Coast Guard operator and a vessel that's been providing the service to meet people through Challenge Alaska, through the Veterans Administration, through um, Challenge Alaska, Wounded Warriors Foundations, a multitude of different locations, or I should say um, folks and entities that, that basically, uh, am I out of time? You are. Um, I have a couple questions for you about your yeah. business. So when you're guiding, um, you know, what does that, what does that look like? Are they, are, are these people that are participating in the personal use fishery, you know, and hiring you as their guide, yeah. are they using their own equipment? Are they using your equipment? Or who's taking the fish out of the water? I mean, you're speaking to disabilities, so I'm, yeah. you know, how does that work? That's a really good question. So I, as captain, I have a two member crew. My son and I both run the boat. I operate the vessel. My son helps on the deck. We take care of the fish on the boat. We, we clean them, flay them, um, and get them ready for, for the folks at the end of the day when they get off the boat. Um, we assist them in pulling their nets and pulling the fish out of the water if they need to, but we do not handle the nets for them. We don't fish for them. Um, I, the folks that I have on the boat that are um, specifically bound to wheelchairs, um, I actually have a design, uh, the side gates come up, and I have a specific door um, on both sides of the vessel that I can prop the net pole, excuse me, the pole down into the side of the boat where they can sit there in their wheelchair and actually hold the net, the, the pole in their lap. And then when they get a fish, we help them pull the net in, pull the fish in and get the fish on board for them. We actively support um, people that have that type of disability to bring a person with them to help them, a family member or an agency member, if they're, uh, you know, like with Challenge Alaska um, or any of the Veterans Administrations, the folks that are blind or having seeing impairment issues, um, we encourage them to bring somebody on board to help them um, with their with their uh, fishing um, opportunity. And with respect to the equipment that they're using, it's your equipment. Yeah, I provide I provide the nets. Um, I provide um, their life preservers. Um, I actually make it mandatory that if you're going to be on my vessel that you um, that you wear a life preserver. I'm actually supported and acknowledged by um, the Kids Don't Float program here in the state of Alaska who has, as of seven years ago, donated all of the flotation uh, devices to my vessel. Um, I've graduated on to a different type of um, flotation device that is a little bit more uh, convenient for some of the larger folks and people that are the, and even the children that are on board. Um, but we, we provide all of the equipment that they need. Um, at the end of the day, we, we help them with their fish and, and then send them on their way. Okay, thanks. Any other board questions? Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thanks for your testimony today. Yeah. Um, just generally speaking, what, what do you think, what percentage of people that you take on charter, um, what percentage of them have a disability? Do you have any idea? I mean, is it? Well, yeah, actually I have a really good idea. It's right between 50 and 60%. And the reason I say that comfortably is because I've become an entity on the river, on the Kenai River and specifically, that caters to the, that type of clientele. Um, now, mind you, 
and this is really something that everybody needs to consider. A disability is not a visual disability always. There's mental, there's so many different disabilities that we just don't notice in general. And I, I would actually, I was going to ask this question, I don't know if you'll allow me to do it, but I was gonna ask for a, a, a census here in the room, everybody, just to show of hands if they are you know, somebody that has a disability. I know we can't do that, but I, I, I want you to think about, as board members, I want you to think about how many people are involved in your life on a daily basis that have a disability that you can't visually tell, but have, whether that's a military uh, member that was injured or that was somebody who um, has lost a leg that is, you know, has a, um, or an arm for that matter, that has a prosthetic, but you can't tell. And so I, I would say that between 50, comfortably between 50 and 60% of my, my clients have some type of disability. And then I guess uh, just, just for, your, for your sake, if you haven't noticed, but <clears throat> and maybe for the rest of the audience that's interested in this particular issue, RC08, um, and you can read it if you haven't already, um, was submitted by the person that put this proposal in, and he has withdrawn this proposal. Right. That doesn't mean that it's not the property of the board still. The board can still do what it wants. But right. just, just, just for you and the rest of the audience to know that if they want to read that, they can. I appreciate that. Mr. Zeray. Yes, thank you, and it's commendable what you're doing for, you know, people with disabilities. But um, other guides, the you know, they probably don't do what you do. This seems like a pretty special thing. But do they um, pretty much function in the same way where they provide the gear? They, uh, uh, if somebody doesn't have a disability, would they, um, you know, help them with the nets, pull in the nets, or you know, you wouldn't allow like a person without a disability to like um, work a dip net or something while you're. I, you know, it's a good question. I appreciate the, the question. I cannot speak for anybody else's guide operation, and I and I won't even attempt to. I know how my business practice works, and I know that um, the requirements that the states imposed on me, as far as just being. Um, a law-abiding Alaska resident assistant, um, uh, citizen, that there are certain things that I need to be conscious of, and helping people do what they need to do to get things done is not outside the spectrum of my, my responsibility. And so um, I, I, I guess to answer your question is, I, I don't know how other operations are. I would be willing to bet you that 99% of them are not doing anything for their clients, but at the very most assisting their clients. Um, and I'm pretty sure that most all of the legal operations, and when I say legal, by the way, I'm talking about have a business license, have a Coast Guard license, um, are paying their um, taxes if need be, Kenai Peninsula Borough tax for me. Um, and are following all their vessel requirements for registration, uh, are providing nets, are providing the access, um, and, and also uh, the wherewithal to get the fish on the boat and then off the boat um, safely and, and legally for their clients. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. That, that's fine. OK. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for your testimony today. Appreciate now you're you being very welcome. here. All right, the time is noon. Um, I think we had, I had mentioned that I was gonna take Tom Jennings, but I think I'd like to take you up right after lunch if you're willing to, to do that. Um, and we'll go ahead and take our lunch break at this time and we will resume at 1.30. Um, and we'll begin with testifier number five, Mr. Jennings, followed by Monty Roberts, Mike Kennedy, and Nicholas Mikos. So we'll see you at 1.30, thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. The time is 1.43. Back on the record, we're going to head and continue with public testimony. And first, at, first on the list here is Tom Jennings. You look like you're ready to go. Thank you. And just as a reminder, um, after Tom will come Monty Roberts, Mike Kennedy, Nicholas Mikos, and Ernie Weiss. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Tom Jennings. I'm an Eagle River resident since 1998. And I want to thank you for allowing me to come and comment on Proposal 163 regarding the, the uh, guides on the, on the Kenai River or in South Central. I'm a 70-year-old disabled veteran, and I've lived in Alaska for over 24 years. My first experience dip netting, I went down to the south side beach of the Kenai River and managed to catch 30 fish that day. That was a haul. <clears throat> that year and many after, I frequented the Kenai and the Kasiloff Rivers to bring salmon home for the family. Fast forward 20 years, and I'm no longer able to make use of the fishery from a beach. Two factors keep me from participating. The crowds have at least doubled in size, making it difficult to participate. But more importantly, I'm no longer strong enough to stand in the current for hours and control the net. I don't feel safe, and I, I really do fear uh, being swept into the outgoing current. Um, for six years, I have used guide services. The guides I've used are Coast Guard approved and their boats are inspected to ensure safety standards are met. This affords me the opportunity to safely participate in the fishery and provide the needed fish for my family. I trust the guide to keep my wife and I safe while we enjoy this uniquely Alaskan experience. If it weren't for the availability of the guide service, I would not be able to participate in this fishery. Please do not limit the ability of charter services to offer this option to their clientele. Without their availability, myself and many others like me would be unable to participate and harvest our personal use fish. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any questions from the board? Thank you for taking your time to be here today. Appreciate you. your testimony. Monty Roberts. Hi, Monty. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Madam Chairman, members of the board, my name is Monty Roberts. I'm a resident of Soldatna. I'm the president of the Kenai River Professional Guide Association. I sit on the Kenai Soldatna AC. I'm also on the Charisma Board, the Kenai River Special Management Area Board, and a couple other boards. But um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk to you guys. I, I support Proposal 162. It's just basically housekeeping. It'll make it to where we just have to have one sticker on our boat instead of three. Um, it won't change anything but ease of enforcement, probably. Um, I support 159 in concept. I'm not, not really crazy about how it's written, but um, in the Committee of the Whole, I'll probably submit an RC that, that goes more into depth about how I would go on defining what kind of closed fishery and what kind of gear would be prohibited in fishing around that. Um, but I, I, and I also oppose, you know, 163, four and five, they, they all deal with restricting guide access um, or, or users access to guides to access a fishery or in the one case of 64, it makes them report, the guides report the, the client's fish. We don't get the client's fish, and so the the client needs to be the one that's reporting those, and it's just a simpler solution. It's consistent with all the other reporting requirements. But uh, I want to talk about overall management um, philosophy and, and what we do in times of low abundance, which you all know we're in low abundance in King Salmon in a lot of places, but Specific example I want to talk about is the first run Kenai River Kings. That's about the cleanest fishery that we have in South Central. It doesn't have a commercial fishery out front of it. It's basically in river sport. And we decimated that river before we knew what we were doing um, by, by fishing in some staging areas, fishing with bait, thinking that we had more than we had. We got the numbers down to a point where since the mid 90s that's been very protected and very sheltered and it is not coming back we had one bright year in 2017 it was decent 
but not anything close to what it was when I started my career, and I'm, I'm not that old. So it, if we get the runs down to the point where it takes decades to get them back, we are really doing ourselves a disservice. And we're in that position in the Kenai again. I commend the department in, in taking a conservative step and, and starting closed. It, it really hurt my business. It hurt all of our my association. But we're at that point where we really need to look at every fish does matter. So that's it. Thanks. Good timing. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your testimony today. Thanks. Nicholas, Mikos, welcome. Mikos? Oh, I'm sorry. Mike Kennedy first. Uh, my apologies. I read, misread my last chat. Hi, Mike. Hello. Board of Fisheries members, thank you for your service. My name is Mike Kennedy. I've been born in Ketchikan, Alaska, raised in Klawak for the last 41 years. I participated in subsistence and personal fisheries out my entire life. I'm a member of the Klawak AC, and I'm here to represent them today. Proposal 155, the use of underwater spear and spear gun. We opposed this one to seven with one in support. We did not like the idea of harassing fish after they have made it to their natal stream. Proposal 156, prohibit the use of felt sold wading uh, footwear and personal use fisheries. We support this eight to zero. None of us felt salt water, waters, uh, waders due to the transmission of invasive species. In the meeting minutes submitted to you, the secretary mistakenly recorded the vote as opposing, but after review of the recorded meeting, it was confirmed that we unanimously support this proposal. Proposal 160, surrender the proceeds gained from the sale of wild king salmon caught in the terminal hatchery. There he is. We oppose this zero to eight. Not all hatchery fish currently clipped, so you could be surrendering a hatchery king. Proposal 163, prohibit guiding and personal use fisheries. We support this 8-0. None of us like the idea of guiding in any, any of the subsistence and personal use fisheries and almost every angler in Southeast Alaska has access to a boat, so we currently don't have any guiding in those fisheries. Proposal 164, establish registration and reporting requirements for personal use guides and transporters. We support this eight to zero. The support in this case is guiding these fisheries so the department can gather data on it. Proposal 165, prohibit compensation for guide services and subsistence fisheries. We support this eight to zero. None of us like the idea of guiding and subsistence fisheries. Proposal 166, establish a state white bag limit for personal use dip net fisheries. We oppose this zero to eight. The Carter River has a dip net fishery, and we are opposed to statewide bag limit for the same reason ADF and G oppose this proposal. Proposal 167, require in-season reporting of subsistence and personal use salmon harvest within five days of harvest. We oppose this zero to eight. We will not, this will not help AFG manage these fisheries, but instead it will make it more complicated and burdensome. Proposal 168, extend emergency order authority to allow restrictions of sport fisheries and contaminated waters. We support this eight to zero. This is a housekeeping issue. It will also, it will also allow fishing to occur but prevent eating possible contaminated fish. Proposal 169, amend the list of banned invasive species. We support this eight zero. None of us want invasive species. Thank you for all your service. Done. Thanks, Mike. Good report. Are there any questions? Thank you for being here today, and thanks for all your work with the AC. Thank you. Nicholas. Mikos. Is Nicholas here today? First call. Ernest Weiss. Hi, Ernie. Madam Chair, members of the board, good to see you all again. Thank you for your continued service. Uh, for the record, Ernie Weiss speaking on behalf of the Aleutians East Borough. Briefly, we support uh, Proposal 161. We concur with the department comments that a board policy for groundfish management would likely lead to sustainability certification for state waters PCOD, which is important to us. I think RC 17 is a fine substitute language. 
and we oppose proposal 154 to allow per sane drum or reel. Again, we agree with Department of Commons. You should take no action. It's been illegal since 1959. Might be more efficient, but it would probably result in a loss of crew jobs, a major source of employment in our area and communities. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thanks for your testimony today. Josh Hayes, Melissa Norris, Ryan Ford, and Jimmy Hurley Sr. Is Josh here? Hi, Josh. Hi. Would you like to give your personal or your AC testimony first? I'll start with the AC. Okay, very good. Thanks. Madam Chair, board members, thank you. Um, you can follow along sort of with us here. We are at AC number 07, so if there's any questions along those lines, um, please refer to those. I'm going to basically go over the contentious ones or the ones where we felt directly were related to our area, be specific. Um, proposal 159, we voted no on. Um, during times of low abundance or stocks of concern, it does seem to carry a little weight in theory, but the vague language made us kind of a little bit concerned as to where it actually would go until we saw kind of what gear and some other discussions. So look forward to more discussion on that, but not, uh, not supporting it at this time. 162, um, that's basically housekeeping and redundancy for us. Our Kena River guides are the highly scrutinized group out there. Um, they pass multiple different uh, levels of scrutiny throughout the process of being licensed every year. And having one decal on the boat versus four is kind of a little bit easier for everybody. And I think it could it could cover the entire state and not be not be an issue as far as law enforcement is concerned. 163, 164, and 165. We oppose all three of these. Um, the proposals raise cons concerns with the group regarding access <clears throat> to those individuals with disabilities. Um, it also creates an unfair advantage for those participants with the financial means that have boats um, and eliminating the opportunity for someone to spend a little bit of money and, and get on a vessel and have the opportunity to participate in some of those fisheries. Um, we understand some of the regards of our other AC members and or other ACs in the state and some of these other individuals that expressed concern about subsistence and financial gains on that. We felt like um, we didn't know how far this would go or where this language would really take us, you know, as far as the potential of a transporter <laughs> dropping fuel off at a fishing site for somebody in rural Alaska or something along those lines and where that would end. And so we opposed that unanimously as well. Um, 166, we supported the statewide limits in PU. We also supported more data collection in this exponentially increasing fishery. Um, it's not gonna hurt for us to have this statewide limit in PU and also have more data collected. 167, we voted no. Um, personal use anglers and subsistence users both would typically fish on multiple days throughout the course of a season. And one day's oftentimes is not enough on one tide or one cycle or the weather or the wind, whatever the case might be, to produce enough um, fish in either situation. So we felt that it would just be, you know, overly burdensome to those, to those user groups. Um, 156, uh, felt sole utilization in a PU fishery. We were split on this as an AC, which was, um, which was different than most of what our, our constituents would have thought or our community members would have thought as well. The three opposing this opposed it based on safety. They are getting older. They are considered some balance issues. Uh, one of them was a fishing guide, and he exhibited some balance issues from some of his guests in some of these waiting areas. Um, and another concern was we're eliminating something, but we're not disinfecting prior to use. So if we're not disinfecting various different things, such as wading boots or waders or things along that nature, how much are they really doing? And so that was where the opposition came from. And that's all I've got for you guys. Any questions? Let's see, I have a question for you. Could you explain to me a little bit more of the discussion around the subsistence use um, or the subsistence guiding? Um, I mean, how, how, did, how did the AC well, I think address the, that? I think the discussion kind of went towards um, commercial operators, who are often referred to as commercial operators in South Central, 
and that often includes guides and transporters in a lot of regulation and a lot of legal language. And so we had concerns that when we start to eliminate commercial operations in the subsistence fishery, say, for example, a flight service in Dillingham may be affected or a transporter service out of Prince William Sound may be you know, affected or e. Kodiak, where the transport of gear or the transport of fuel or things like that, we just didn't know where this language, how far this regulation would take it, and we did not want to eliminate opportunity for any subsistence user in the state. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you for your AC report. If you'd like to go into your personal testimony now, please do so. So on my personal, I'd just like to be a little bit redundant here and talk about 162, um, and that's the guide sticker on the Kenai vessels being allocated to um, the entire state and being legal for the entire state without us getting basically multiple agencies stickering our boat over and over again. That CRISMA, that Kenai River Special Management Area, which is a state-run agency, would actually be a sticker that would be valid in the entire state to operate as a guide vessel. And that's it. So are you a supporter of it? Or? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Josh. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate you. Melissa Norris. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Thanks for hearing me out. My name is Melissa Norris. I'm one of the owners and founders of Fish Alaska and Hunt Alaska magazines. I've had the, this job for 22 years, and uh, I've fished the Nushagak since the early 2000s. And in the last half a decade, I've come back annually for Kings, and I have seen personally uh, a decline in the numbers we're catching, I've seen a decline in the size of the fish, and we're seeing tons of net marks. It seems pretty clear what's happening from an in-river observational standpoint. So there are lots of uh, arguments on this subject. The fire is fueled from every angle. Everyone wants to protect what they perceive as theirs. So I'm thankful on many levels to be here to reasonably discuss what needs to be done and to share the burden with all user groups as it's the right thing to do. Fishing is labeled as a sport for me because I fish with a rod and reel, but when I'm salmon fishing, it is for sustenance, right, and sustainability. And I suppose it's a sport because it does fuel my soul. It does make me feel great. I enjoy every minute of it, but I'm there for harvest. And there are countless Alaskans who model that lifestyle. So I find it frustrating to see my own user group limited when folks from all over the world gain economically from Bristol Bay salmon at the expense of my tribe. A question becomes, what percentage of the problem stems from what area of usage? The sport side has a smaller effect. Still, I wholeheartedly support conservation from every side. We want to see the Chinook fishery restored. We want massive issues like trawl fleet bycatch and commercial net regulations reformed for the greater good of all. Our people have been looking to ADF and G for solutions for years. We are on board to support what needs to be done, but in a manner equivalent to the harm we are doing while others follow suit in their sector. It's concerning to me that special interest groups purport we don't have enough data to make decisions. We should spend years planning, raising funds, and implementing new counting equipment, but we don't have those years. Those of us who are actually spend time on the river year after year are verifying the decline that the existing counters are showing. I'm afraid they don't want to hear it because it doesn't align with financial goals. The talk then turns to the concept of foregone harvest as though making the most money now is more important than conserving an industry and natural resource for all. That said, in our collective opinion, the following seems to be the most reasonable action. On the sport fishing side, we can live with one of two options, an adjustment to four kings total annually with one over 28 inches and three over 20. Jack kings would not count. We'll do our stewardship to educate why we need to preserve these adult kings. And the second best option to us is the adjustment to two kings annually, because at least it still allows us to fish and sustain our related businesses. That said, we're not clear on why this must be decided now instead of as an EO during the season, as it has been issued in recent years under current regulation. On the commercial side, processes are scrambling to keep up with record harvests. Local Alaskan family-owned commercial fishing businesses are having to compete with larger outside interests who are not concerned about quality. It's degrading the market, as is the amount of supply against demand. I simply don't understand why the common goal isn't to drive the price per pound up while reducing the amount of total harvest. Well, then I'm cut off, <laughs> but you have my written statement as well. Thank you. I was just going to ask if you had submitted comments. I have submitted comments, yes. Thank, Thank you. you, Melissa. Appreciate um, your hard work. Mr. Wood has a question for yes, you. Mr. Wood. Just need you to clarify something. You said King Jacks would not be included. 
Does yeah. that mean that you can catch as many jacks as you want? Well, I, I personally, yeah, would still conserve my amount of fish that I would harvest, right? And we're going to expect folks to do the same. We don't need to unlimitedly, unlimitedly catch jacks, but I wouldn't count it under this personally. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, I do completely believe in only taking what we need and no more. Thank you. Ryan Ford. Hello, members of the board, Madam Chair. My name is Ryan Ford. I, I've lived in Alaska for 25 years. I'm the owner operator of Rock Skip Adventures. My, my business operates to provide services for uh, transportation on the Copper River down in Chitna. Um, I see my services as providing safe access and a personal use in the personal use dipper, dip netting area. I operate below the bridge in Chitna uh, on the Copper River. I oppose proposal 163 and 164. By prohibiting guiding in this personal use fin fishery, access would be restricted. Um, I have personal not personal, but my clients that ride my boat are all aspects of life. I have disabled vets. I have individuals that have mobility restrictions. I have clients that have small children that they'll bring on the boat. I have clients that would not operate their own vessel on the Copper River. Um, so the services that we provide allow safe access to the fishery and um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Ryan. Any questions? Appreciate your testimony today. Jimmy Hurley, Sr. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and board members. <clears throat> My name is Jimmy Early. I reside on Anushiak River. You know, uh, I'll throw this out that um, I, I would ask the board to strongly consider Proposal 11. It looks like the best uh, route to redoing these kings, you know, because, um, but. Going back is, um, you know, I, I, were, I saw the video you guys started out with. I, I did 13 contracts out in the Barren Sea. You know, I know quite a bit about the waste. That's how the CDQ program got in place, you know, with testimony about, you know, um, all the waste that was going on, all the kings and everything else. You know. So there's a lot of truth to that. I've sat on Nushak Advisory, BBDC, Bristol Barry Health Corporation. I started up a fish plant in Lee Block and... You know, I, I, we did value added classes to help our residents in Bristol Bay at the Indian Valley to, to do more value for our fish, thanks to BBDC. So there's been good things. I helped with the water quality when Pebble Mine was coming in. We, we tested 24 sites all along from the, from the Wood River all the way up to King Salmon. <clears throat> 24 different sites we did to uh, Turbinity, you know, minerals and there's everything that affects our salmon because at the time pebble was the biggest thing in the world so but uh, I've done a recovery camp in Equoc Lodge when I was president of Equoc Day Unlimited we uh, you know we took people our people up the street brought them to Equoc and the best thing of the whole thing is that when you bring culture back into with fish they recover you might get a 50 percent recovery rate but, but that's better than what's out in, out there you know one thing I'd say about 11 is that, you know, it says 100,000 fish up the river, but, you know, saying that, but river ain't the King Salmon River. Nushigak River is the King Salmon River. That's where they all go, pretty much. But the lower end of the Wood River, that special harvest area, doesn't open until later. So you figure, um, 
you know, we are saying that, you know, the kings, they go across along their Wood River and come up the Nushigak. So the lower end of Wood River, you know, but, uh, but there's a lot of good points and a lot of good things going on with this. Uh, and I could say that it really would help the people in subsistence. You know, I, 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 it's the only thing I go back for is Ekwak is, you know, a few years ago I did, uh, I got over 100 kings about five years ago. It's four, four, four families. This last year I went back, I think I got 21. I was just for my own family and that's it. So I would strongly consider, you know, looking at the numbers and some of these advisory people who know more than me, I haven't been out of the picture. I, you know, the things I've done, you know, went to lobby for schools. I got New York School, a $40 million school. But, you know, if you're, I lived in a suitcase pretty much, you know, so for my people. So I, I, I would say I could strongly consider Proposal 11. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jimmy. Are there any questions? Thank you for your testimony today. Next up is Nicole Kimball, followed by Darcy Kunuk, Werner Wilson III, Andrew Couch, and Brendan Allen. Hi, Nicole. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Uh, my name is Nicole Kimball. I work for PSPA. Um, I'm referencing RC 17, which is substitute language for Proposal 161. Um, I hope you've also seen the support letter from AFDF. I'm really here in support um, as one signer to that letter, but this was an originally an AFDF uh, proposal. You can see if you look at that letter, all gear types, a jig, cod, a jig, longline, pot, and trawl are all signed on in supporting this letter. Um, I'm just the one that lives in Anchorage, so I get to speak to it. Um, this proposal, if you remember from the COD statewide meeting, I mean the COD meeting in October is necessary to retain sustainability certification for Alaska COD, so any COD harvested in state waters. If you go through that letter, you can see that all COD currently is, is sustainably certified by these international bodies, Responsible Fisheries Management, Marine Stewardship Council, and it's those kinds of certification programs that Alaska uses and everybody uses all over the world to assure buyers of Alaska fish that the fishery conforms to these standards for general sustainability. And so Alaska needs that certification to sell cod into nearly all markets. And for Alaska fish going shoreside, it's usually a US market or a European market. And it needs to have that, sust that sustainability certification mark to be able to be in those markets. So currently we have a condition, what's called a condition in the certification process on Alaska State Waters Cod only. It basically means that those certification bodies are giving us some time to address the issue before the next certification cycle or we would lose certification. And the issue itself is not having some explicit written objectives or statement of goals for how the board manages um, uh, groundfish in the state, Alaska State Waters. So that's what we're trying to address, or AFDF is, with submitting Proposal 161, some really basic broad language to allow the board some guidelines that are written and explicit that we can point to in the certification process. It is not intended to change anything about how the board currently does management. Um, it is not intended to um, change the way that you speak to board proposals on groundfish management, it's really only serving to document what you already do to satisfy this very technical requirement. Um, I can tell you we worked really hard not to have to bring you this proposal um, to try to convince certification bodies, help them understand what the board process looks like, how you provide rationale on the record, and how it's the most public process for fish management probably around the country. Um, unfortunately, this is the the position that we're in right now where we have a condition on the fishery and this is what will satisfy it. Um, it sounds, you know, it's a technical requirement, but it, it's a big deal. Loss of certification just means lower value for Alaska cod. Um, in 2022, that was 71 million pounds that you authorized in state waters. If you include federal cod, which is going to remain certified, um, but it's still conveys a lot of confusion in the marketplace if one part of our cod is certified and one part isn't. When you include federal cod, it's almost double that amount of cod. Um, I see I'm out of time. If you have any questions, I would be glad to answer it, and I really appreciate the board considering this proposal. Thank you, Mr. Jensen and Mr. Wood. <clears throat> Thanks, Nicole. Um, just curious, so the feds, federal waters already have this kind of qualification and this kind of language. 
uh, and the state doesn't. So if the state didn't do it, it we'd lose our MSC certification? Correct, and, and through the chair, just one clarification that the state water cod does have certification now, yeah. as does federal, but without this kind of a proposal to meet this condition, the state water cod will lose certification. Federal would remain. They have different objectives in their fishery. Okay, thank you. As, as you know, we had it previously years ago, and then we took it out because it was so burdensome. So now I can see where we're, where we're headed. Thank you, Nicole. Mr. Wood. Well, I've not yet looked at the letter you described with the signatories on it, but you and I had a conversation uh, earlier in the morning. I just want to put on record my request to you. Uh, you've seen, uh, hopefully by this time, you've seen the Department of Law's concerns with the uh, proposal. And I asked you, and I, I'll ask you again, would you meet with whomever within the organization you need to meet with to make sure that your request complies with their concerns so that all the T's are crossed and I's dotted uh, procedurally uh, before we proceed. I can't imagine many people on this board being against certification, so let's just make sure that we do so in a manner that it'll be upheld should it ever be challenged. Uh, through the chair, yes, of course I would do that. I read the Department of Law comments to, to, to be pretty boilerplate for other policies that you've instituted to say that you can't tie the hands of a future board. You would use these as guidelines, but if you went beyond the guidelines, you would put your rationale on the record as to why. So I don't feel the proposal needs additional changes based on Department of Law comments, but I'd be glad to meet with anyone to discuss that further. Commissioner. So Nicole, have you met with the group that we're seeking certification from, figuring out whether this is sufficient to meet their, I would to say demands, but um, criteria to gain certification? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Darcy Kunuk. Darcy here. First call. Werner Wilson. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> no worries. Welcome, Werner. Thank you. Um, my name is Werner Wilson III. I'm the Senior Oceans Campaigner for Friends of the Earth U.S., uh, commercial and subsistence salmon fisher and member of the Chilkoon tribe born and raised in Dillingham. On Nushigak Chinook Stock of Concern, I just got back from the Pacific Fishery Management Council, PFMC, in Seattle, and North Pacific Council, North Pacific or NPFMC last month. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife just closed their directed spring king salmon fisheries yesterday because of low numbers. Several California salmon organizations also urge closure. There's something going on with our kings, compounded by several factors such as climate change, ground fish trawl bycatch, and other things. So we need to take a precautionary approach and prioritize our subsistence king fisheries in Bristol Bay. I hope this board will urge other approaches and prioritize or and bodies from the local to international level beyond your jurisdiction to take needed action for our fisheries as, as other fisheries bodies have done for theirs. We are the great re uh, region for wild salmon. On electronic monitoring or EM, there's a problem with our federal ground fish fisheries. At PFMC, they stated turnaround time for submission of EM videos are not being met. So PFMC was considering extending compliance to submit videos to a 60 day deadline just a few days ago. This is concerning as some were also worried about non-compliance by the ground fish boats because videos were compromised. FOE supports robust EM and observer programs. We're concerned about public comments made during the NPFMC essential fish habitat item last month by former ground fish crew, Harley Lever. He said, quote, crew members were throwing over halibut before the observers could count it. The bycatch data was skewed and a constant conversation about making sure observers could count the least amount of halibut 
bycatch as possible, unquote. So this skewed data, unfortunately, could include kings. The board should encourage federal fishery managers to expand the EM and observer programs since observers do genetic testing for stock of origin on salmon stocks. And finally, on administration, I just think that three minutes is not enough to get all of our points across for the public. NPFMC allows five minutes for organization comments and PFMC allows 10 minutes and hybrid remote comments. Thank you. Take Thank any you. questions. Appreciate it. Mr. Wood. I'm not at all familiar with the organization Friends of the Earth US, uh, but if you know, is there anywhere in uh, the area that kings are either thriving or at least at minimum holding their own? Not that I know of. I, I mean, so as I said, I'm from Dillingham and I grew up there and we've always known it to be one of the largest uh, king salmon runs on the planet because we've had that significant debate about the pebble mine, of course. And when yeah. you read about like the King of Fish book by David Montgomery, mm -hmm. like he he looked at that historically and we've we've done that analysis and um that's it's very concerning that you know we're now a stock of concern and california and oregon have closed yeah. their fisheries now where i was heading with the question and since you're not aware of any i'm not either by the way i was gonna ask what they are doing that we aren't that would have uh, led to that but since you don't think there is another place that don't need to get Thank you for your testimony today, Werner. Appreciate it. Oyana. Andrew Couch, followed by Brendan Allen, Gene Sandown, Brian Kraft. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you for the welcome. Uh, my name's Andrew Couch. Most of you may know me as Andy. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, subsistence and personal use fisheries, uh, specifically proposals 163, 164, 165, 166, and 167. Uh, my personal opinion, I, I oppose all these oppose, proposals. Um, I own a, a fish, Guiding business, I've never guided a personal use or a subsistence fishing trip, but I, uh, I've seen other businesses that are doing that. I think they provide a, a, a safe service, uh, especially uh, on the Copper River. Uh, I have a friend who fishes with me and he has told me that he doesn't want to go on the Copper River in, with anybody driving the boat besides me. The Copper River is a fast, dangerous river, and if you make a mistake, it could cost somebody their life. So I think it's important that uh, um, you, you allow people to use uh, a safe operator, somebody who's licensed, who has safety gear, who has a good boat. Uh, I think that's, that's of concern. Uh, another concern is the, the idea that we need to have a statewide limit to personal use fisheries. Um, in a place like the copper, if you look what's happening on the copper, um, the commercial fishery fishes early, pretty hard, and then uh, uh, they go other places and fish. And when they go other places, then your uh, personal use gets more time to fish because you have a surplus of fish that's available. And uh, if, uh, if the personal use or subsistence fisheries didn't take those fish, uh, there'd be surplus fish that aren't harvested. But you know, there's an opportunity for people to use those fish. Uh, I thought the department comments were quite appropriate on all these proposals. One thing I'd mention about the uh, department comments Probably most people who commented on these proposals didn't get a chance to see them before the uh, original deadline 
uh, a comment. Um, I've fished the, the Copper River personal use, the Copper River subsistence, the Kenai River personal use, and the Lower Susitna personal use. And all those fisheries are important to people. Um, as far as the record, recording requirements, you know, cutting that down to five days. I know uh, of somebody that uh, didn't record in time and uh, lost their ability to fish this next year. Uh, you know, they, they can't participate in that fishery. Uh, it, it's certainly important. I, I don't think we need to cut recording time because that could result in more people losing their opportunities to fish if they didn't get it reported in time. Plus, if we need, uh, in fisheries where we need quicker data, quicker turnaround, the department already has the ability to request that. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, Mr. Zray has a question for you. Yes, Andy. Uh, do you notice um, people coming from, like, uh, other areas of the state that have uh, maybe closed fishing and stuff like that? Do you notice uh, any changes lately, you know, and people that come to you for guide services and stuff. I ask that because, you know, with the Yukon, I'm from the Yukon and Tana River areas, and, and there's a number of people that talk about, you know, going down that way and either dip netting themselves or using, you know, like somebody to take them out on the boat to get their subsistence fish. And they, are, they were subsistence people, and now they don't have access to any salmon, so they they just drive down your yep. way. And anyway. Yeah, so thanks for the comment, um, uh, or, or for the question. And, and yeah, for clarification there, my guide service is located in the Matsu Valley. When I go up and fish the Copper River, I go up there because our fisheries in the Matsu Valley in the first half of the summer, there's hardly a salmon to harvest. And I realize that people from the interior, uh, as you're speaking about the Yukon in particular, uh, the, the, the harvest opportunities have gone away. So the, the copper does provide an opportunity like that. Um, and as far as the subsistence, uh, the board last year uh, uh, restricted uh, access in the subsistence fishery above the bridge. People can still use a commercial operator as a transporter, and I think that's good, but they cannot use a, a commercial operator to, to guide them. You know, they can't fish out of the boat. And uh, that's just a decision the board made, but that's what, what it is at this point. But, uh, yeah. Mr. Carpenter, Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy, for your comments. You mentioned that you um, have participated in the PU fishery and the subsistence fishery and the copper and also down the Kenan Peninsula. And specific to the statewide bag limit um, for the PU fisheries, have you ever participated in both in the same year? So I have never participated in the, the, the Copper River personal use and subsistence fishery at the, sa the same year because that would be illegal. Um, I certainly have participated in the Copper River fishery, uh, the subsistence fishery. Uh, in the early half of the summer, like I stated earlier, if I want to catch some salmon to harvest, I got to go somewhere because there's just not much to harvest in the Matt Valley. Um, so I participated in that. I have not participated in the uh, Kenai in the same year. I have participated in the lower Susitna uh, personal use fishery, which is very num limited number of days. And as regard to the limits, uh, when I've gone to copper, we always share fish with other people. And uh, when I've gone to the uh, Susitna fishery, we always share fish for, with other people. If there was a limit, uh, you know, certainly we could do more paperwork and uh, uh, get uh, a, a, an additional permit or a proxy or something like that, but we'd still be trying to share fish with other people, uh, you know, outside of what, if the limit was just one, like, personal use limit for Susitna or for Chitna. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony today. 
Thank you. Brendan Allen. First call, Brendan Allen. Jean Sandone. Hi, Jean. Welcome back to the table. Are you going to be given the AC report first? Yes, Madam Chair. Got it. Thanks. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Commissioner, adf and staff, and members of the public, my name is Jean Sandone, and uh, I'm the um, a chairman of the Fish uh, Fisheries Committee for the uh, Madonuska Valley AC, and I will uh, be representing them at this time. Um, I'll just jump right into it. Proposal 154 uh, regarding uh, the, um, the same drum or reel around which the same can be coiled or rolled. We just didn't have enough information to make a decision on this. We did vote on it. Um, four in favor, zero opposed, and uh, seven abstained. And I guess because of the uh, so many people abstained, it failed. Um, we didn't have the uh, uh, ADF and G comments uh, before we had the meeting, so we were kind of lost on this one. Uh, proposal 150, I'm sorry, uh, these can be found in AC 20. Uh, proposal 157, um, allow a person holding a CFEC permit for multiple salmon net areas to commercial fish for salmon in more than one net area per year. Um, we oppose this, 0 to 11. Most Alaskan commercial fisheries have a high level of participation. We believe that there is an impressing need for more participation in commercial fisheries. Additionally, this proposal, if passed, would tend to limit the entry of new fishermen in fisheries and would possibly result in a rel relatively small number of fishermen monopolizing Alaskan fisheries. Proposal 158 is, the, uh, is very similar, and uh, that also uh, failed 011 to, for the same reasons. Proposal 159, uh, close commercial fishing for a given species within one quarter of a mile of any area close to sport fishing for that species. Um, uh, we note that ADF and G opposed this, but we supported 11 0. When a sport fishery is closed at a river or stream because of conservation issues, the commercial fishery should not be able to operate within a quarter mile or more of the sport fishery boundary closure because, <clears throat> because the commercial fishery has much more harvest power than the sport fishery. Commercial cost recovery operations, we believe, should not preclude the complete and total prohibition of a sport fishery to harvest fish from a common property resource. <clears throat> Proposal 161. And uh, this is to create and establish Alaska Board of Fisheries policy regarding the management of ground fish fishery resources in Alaska. And uh, we uh, <coughs> unanimously supported that one. Uh, we agree um, that the department's position and supports this proposal because of the importance of third party sustainability certification to the fishing industry in maximizing value derived from Alaska fishery resources. <clears throat> Proposal 163, prohibit guiding and personal use fin fish fisheries. Um, we oppose this uh, zero to nine with two uh, abstaining. Uh, this proposal, if passed, would limit Alaskans who desire to participate in personal use fisheries from participating because they do not have the means or the ability to uh, participate. 165, um, prohibit compensation for guide services in subsistence fisheries. And uh, we oppose that zero to 11. This proposal if passed would limit Alaskans who desire to participate in subsistence fisheries from participating because they do not have the means or ability to participate or they live in urban areas. This proposal also seeks to differentiate between traditional subsistence and urban users. Uh, we believe the board cannot differentiate between subsistence users uh, only in cases when there's um, a limited supply of the resources. All Alaskans are eligible uh, for subsistence. 
Uh, additionally, the proposal is confusing regarding services a guide is allowed and not allowed to provide. This proposal needs clarifying regulatory language. Proposal 166 established a statewide bag limit for personal use fin fish fisheries. Uh, we oppose this, 0 to 11. This is an allocative issue and does not address a conservation issue. It appears that the author simply wants to limit the number of, of salmon a person may take through participating in two or more, more personal use fisheries. It appears that the author believes that an annual limit on personal use fish harvest will satisfy the needs of all Alaskans for fish. We disagree with this assumption and oppose this proposal. Because sport fisheries and commercial fisheries usually do not have an annual limit for abundant species, personal use fisheries should, not also, should also not have an annual limit for abundant species. Uh, proposal 167, um, require in-season reporting of subsistence and personal use salmon harvest within five days of harvest. Uh, we oppose that, 0 to 11. Um, the subsistence section of this proposal should not be a statewide issue because the need for the intensity of management of subsistence fisheries varies throughout the state. Subsistence fishing regulations be tailored to the specific area, taking in consideration the size of the resource, amounts necessary for subsistence, access to the resource, the amount and quality of in-season run information, and the size of the population of the subsistence users. In some areas, subsistence management may need be highly regulated with issuance of permits, fish limits, rigorously scheduled time for subsistence fishing, and mandatory in-season reporting requirements. Contrastingly, for example, in much of rural Alaska of the state, as in the AYK region, harvesting wild resources or food is a way of life for most residents. In most of these areas, harvesting wild food for is a, is a way of life. Um, are not, permits are not required. There are, are no harvest limits. Subsistence fishing time is, um, is generous, and reporting is voluntary through postseason subsistence surveys. In these remote areas of the state, reporting subsistence catches within five days is impractical and unwarranted. Proposal 168. Um, extend emergency order authority, authority to allow restriction of sport fishes in contaminated water. I think you believe that's a no-brainer. It passed 11-0, and it's basically a housekeeping proposal. Madam Chair, that is uh, my testimony. Thank you, Jean. Any questions as they receive report? Thank you. Appreciate the report. And if you'd like to give your testimony for YDFDA, you may do so at this time. Yes, uh, my name is Gene Sandone. Uh, I represent Yukon Delta Fisheries uh, Development Association. And there's three proposals I'd like to comment on, and they can be found in PC557. The first one, 87, uh, define eel stick. Uh, we support this. The department supports this. Um, it uh, is consistent with current and traditional fisheries practices and to provide for social and economic benefits that might otherwise be foregone. Uh, proposal 82, uh, uh, the modified the date sinking of gill nets is allowed in the Yukon area from October 1st to April 30th. Um, we support this, but with modification that it only applies for districts one and two only. We heard uh, at the AYK meeting the opposition to this proposal from uh, a lot of upriver um, users, and uh, well, we would, but we would like it for districts one and two where Yukon Delta operates. Uh, proposal 167, um, <clears throat> this is require in-season reporting of subsistence and personal use salmon harvest within five days of harvests. Um, we oppose this. The subsistence section of this proposal should not be a statewide issue because of the varying need for intensity of the management of the subsistence fisheries throughout the state. In the AYK region, there is no need for in-season reporting because resource managers know that subsistence is the priority consumptive use and the number harvested is relatively constant from year to year when runs are good. Managers realize that the people rely on subsistence for sustenance and food security. 
Additional salmon management plans are specifically designed to allow commercial fishing only when the projected run size is adequate to provide for escaping requirements and subsistence needs. In fact, many AYK salmon management plans contain a buffer for subsistence harvest so that, the, so that more than enough fish enter the river to satisfy subsistence needs before commercial fishing is allowed. Further, where and when subsistence permits with fish limits are required, additional permits are usually issued upon request. Recently, managers have restricted or closed subsistence fishing because of critically low runs. The people who are good stewards of the resource have complied with these restrictions and closures to protect the resource. Large subsistence fisheries in the AYK have been going on for a millennium. Additionally, harvest wild resources for food contains a spiritual aspect for many people, adding further restrictions uh, on this customary time-honored and spiritual tradition is unwater unwarranted and counterproductive to the wise management of the resource. There is no need for permits, limits, and in-season reporting. Madam Chair, that concludes my testimony. Well done, Jean. I think you had two seconds left on the clock. <laughs> Any questions? Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Jean, for your testimony. I think I might have told you this before, but uh, I just very much appreciate how you uh, present your information in the PC comments for why, why the FDA. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for being here. Next up is Brian Kraft, followed by Jeff Fander, Marlene Minette, and McKenna O'Toole, and Darren Gilman. Hi, Brian. Welcome. Hello. Okay. Okay, my name's uh, Brian Kraft. I'm here representing uh, myself and my business, Alaska Sportsman's Lodge and Bristol Bay Lodge, two lodges in the Bristol Bay region. I've been uh, in the sport fishing industry in the Bristol Bay region for 30 years. Um, I'm here to uh, testify on Proposal 13, which I am the author of, with the uh, RC number 12, with amended uh, language. Uh, <clears throat> there is no doubt that the new Shigak run has been impacted by a variety of factors over the years. There's no arguing that, that the uh, decline of the numbers of fish and the size of kings returning to the river is having a severe adverse effect on, on the fishery. We can take a look at the numbers, we can look at the, the sonar, we can blame all kinds of different things, but the true fact is that it is in severe decline. The uh, total numbers, when you just break it down, is that you can look at what can we do to get more fish in the river. The commercial fleet unintended uh, harvest is, averages about 30,000, between 30,000, 40,000 fish, uh, king salmon, per season. That's not a directed opener, that's unintended harvest. Uh, the sport fishery takes six. So you could basically close down a sport fishery and still not have a biological gain that you could have by limiting some sort of, uh, doing some sort of limits to the commercial fishery. My intention here is not to pit a commercial fishery against the sport fishing user groups. My intention is not to put the commercial fishery out of business. Um, I had a proposal in 2018 that had paired restrictions uh, when uh, sport fish got EO'd that the commercial fishery participated in those closures in some manner. That was tabled and out of that was born the King Salmon Committee that BBRSI uh, led up. We've spent four years, the past four years, in meetings going over various different ways that we can come up with something to help ensure that more fish get in the river. And short of closing down everything, which obviously that would have a positive impact, and still having economic opportunities for a commercial fishery, how can we still enact a sockeye commercial fishery that overlaps a king fishery that the upriver up user group has very little impact on? And so uh, there, there's things in there, obviously, Proposal 11, which I'm a part of the committee, I, I strongly support. But I put in Proposal 13 because in reality, we need to ensure that there are pulses of, of fish that get into the, the river that haven't been subjected to nets. 
um, in theory, the managers are, are doing that at, at this time. They're allowing for those pulses uh, by uh, strategically opening closures. This would put it into regulation. This would, would put it in that um, there's no commercial opener more than one hour before high tide at Clark's Point, and then it needs to close, the commercial drift opener needs to close uh, four hours before the next high tide, thus giving a window of opportunity of three hours on the flood up in the district where those kings could get into the river. And uh, this, again, gives windows of opportunities for kings to get into, into the system. Um, that's right on the nuts. Thanks, Brian. Mr. Wood has a question. Yeah, Brian, I'm, I'm looking at staff comments and the practices that's currently being done there. And the conclusion I reached was that they would have war openings under your proposal and they would have under current practice. Am I misreading this? Uh, uh, Mr. Woods, through the chair, uh, I didn't see what that comment was by, by staff. Uh, I've talked with staff. I've had communications with staff. And again, a lot of it is uh, just by uh, use by the staff, not in regulation. And if that staff were to change, there's nothing to say that that kind of attitude would still carry forward. This particular uh, uh, proposal ensures that the front side of the flood is when the fish are getting in. So uh, I think staff a lot of times is uh, doing things where they close it on the, on the low tide mm -hmm. so that they're not creating a line fishery. Well, that's a social, that's a, that's a, if we're worried about preserving kings, let's throw everything else out and let's see what's the best way to preserve those kings. And the best way is on the front side of that flood, let them get in past that line and three hours into the district on their way up to the Nushagak River. And by doing that, we give them the best chance of, of having more fish make it past the commercial fleet, in my opinion. Okay, would you do me a favor and take a look at the staff comments? I think you've explained it to me, but if you would look at that and make sure that... Uh, what you just said is what is being accurately reflected in the staff comments. I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, and I'll participate in the committee of the hall as well. If that helps. All right, I'll see any other questions. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate your efforts. Jeff Fander. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. <laughs> Madam Chair, everybody mispronounces that one. I just wanted to thank the board for having me. Uh, this is uh, my, my first Board of Fish meetings, and uh, here to tell you it's quite intimidating, first of all, and uh, quite impressive all at the same time. Um, I'm here to kind of follow suit with um, Brian Kraft, who, who just preceded me. My name is Jeff Fender. I'm the senior guide at Alaska Sportsman's Lodge. Um, I, I'm representing my personal interests here at the same time, trying to speak for the sport industry. I've guided anglers, sport anglers, on the Snooshigak River for 29 seasons. Uh, in some of those years, I spent every day of the, the fishing season out there. So I have a pretty good pulse of, of what the river's done in the past and what it's doing right now. Um, if you had asked me 20 years ago if we would be here having a stock of concern conversation on the Snooshigak Kings, I would have called you crazy at the time. Uh, but yeah, here we are. We, we've got some problems. In the last... Uh, Five to eight seasons, I've noticed a dramatic decline in the numbers of sport caught kings. Um, and this is gathering information from my colleagues as well on the river. This is not just my personal boat. We have a staff of 12 guides that uh, we could have eight of them out there every day. So we get a good sampling of what the river's done. We're also seeing a, a dramatic decline in the size. Uh, we've had some fish derbies that have gone out there in the past that should actually show that. Uh, back in the day, catching 35, 40 pound kings was the norm, and there was trophies and, and awards that the state had given out for this uh, state fish. Um, we've had a few derbies recently where 26 pound fish have won the derby, and uh, I don't think that's really what the, the king fishery in the Nushagak was known for or should be known for. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, the, the three proposals on the board right now for um, proposal number 11, 12, and 13. And any additional proposals that the board sees fit to put on this uh, fishery that is has a stock of, of concern. Um, obviously, there's some, some good information out there that I'm not privy to that you guys have a lot more knowledge on. Um, and, and a lot like our 
biologists in the area, I, I really defer to them. They're the ones that, I'm, I'm not a papered or, or a educated biologist by any means, I'm just a fishing guide. So a lot of my comments are simply observations, but after 29 years of observing, uh, I think it's a pretty relevant observation. Uh, in all the years that the king returns have been behind uh, escapement goals, the sport fishery is the uh, one user group who shoulders the burden of conservation. Uh, we're asked to uh, scale back our efforts. We're asked to uh, not harvest as many by half as much as the first the first emergency order. As, as my predecessor, Brian Kraft, mentioned, there's been comments been made to having other user groups try to pair with these restrictions when an emergency order is issued. Uh, those have yet to have happened. It would be nice uh, to see something along those lines where other user groups help conserve this, this stock of concern, the King Chinook on the Nushigak. Uh, today, I've listened to both sport and subsistence users uh, who have come up and, and maybe even gone as far as suggested restrictions that'll help these fish. Uh, and in this same meeting, I've also heard commercial interest groups come up here and ask for more opportunity to harvest sockeye salmon. Um, the, the stock of concern here is the, the king salmon, not the sockeye salmon. Thanks, Jeff. Your time is up. All Appreciate right. It. I'm hopeful this board will be a champion for the Nushigak River and the Kings. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, see any questions? Appreciate your testimony today. Marlene Manette. Welcome, Marlene. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair Board. All right. So Jamai Gwinga Atka Juchtun Atka Ignagautin Gasitun Marlene Minet Nuni Wakamunga Eagle River Ami Witanga Dinaina Dinaina Nunit. Hello, my Jubich name is Ignagautin, English name is Marlene Minet. I'm originally from Nunavak Island out on in the Bering Sea. But I currently reside in Eagle River on the traditional lands of the Dinaina people. I've been residing in Eagle River for the last 20 years and I, I've got to say I support the charter fishing where I have been teaching my now 11-year-old daughter my traditional gathering ways of life. She's been helping me since the age of three, cutting fish for drying and for putting away for, for the winter. I cannot fly to my home island with my daughter because it costs a total of $1,800. Now imagine that, just my daughter and I going out back to Nunavak Island where I can jump on a charter boat for about $500. I can go out, drive out to Chitna and go out on the, on the Copper River for about $150 with fuel, food and everything. Now, if I did go out to my home island and like I said, it's $1,800 and I did catch my 30 fish for the summer, it's another $1,400 for freight to send my fish back here to Eagle River. Now I left my home island because I needed to better my life in uh, there's no jobs out there. There's only about 150 people total, no jobs. And I, wanna, I still wanna teach my 11 year old daughter um, traditional ways of life. And I really hope that you don't take this away. It hurts me deep down inside. These are we're, we're currently on the lands of the United people. We need to teach our children our subsistence way of life. And for somebody to try and take, you know, a safe place where I can go on a charter boat uh, uh, that's Coast Guard approved, uh, Captain, that, that is safe, rather than me taking my daughter on the shores of the Copper River, seeing so many people die on that river. I would rather go on a charter boat where it's safer, where the captain's been approved, Coast Guard approved. So I hope, I'm sorry. I wasn't planning on getting emotional. I would hope that you do not pass the deal where I am still able to take my daughter on a boat, still teach her how to cut fish, still teach her how to dry those 30 fish. I would hope that you can understand this. I would hope that you have children that know how to um, 
gather for the winter months, I would really hope that you would understand the people, especially the urban natives, where it's too expensive to go out to the communities, to their communities, to go and bring it their fish. And I stand where I stand, and I really appreciate you all uh, for taking the time to listen to my testimony. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony today. McKenna O'Toole. Hey, McKenna, welcome. Members of the board, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. My name is McKenna O'Toole. I sit on the CDFU board as well as the Cordova Advisory Committee. But uh, I will be speaking for myself today. I'm a commercial fisherman in Cordova, but have fished everywhere from Bristol Bay to ADAC to catch a can. Uh, I would like to speak in support of propositions 163, 164, 165, 166, and 167. I personally don't believe that there's anywhere for there to be commercial compensation for subsistence or personal use. You know, if you add a commercial component to that, you're adding it another commercial fishery. We had limited entry go through in 1976. Um, I would also like to speak today on Proposition 157 and 158. I support these proposals. Southeast Seine, Area, Area D Setnet, Prince William Sound Seine, Chignik, and Bristol Bay have all, through stacking or buyback or com, uh, combine, look for fleet reduction. These proposals allow for a statewide fleet, for, fleet reduction measure with one broad stroke. It would not add any boats to the fisheries. It would provide young fishermen the ability to diversify their income in times of low abundance. In one area, fishermen, in times of low abundance, in one area, fishermen could move to greener pastures, relieving pressure on low runs and providing more opportunity for local fishermen that live in the communities that don't travel. A lot of the competition goes away. I know from experience that it can be extremely stressful trying to raise a family relying on one run and one resource to come back and having the opportunity to go somewhere else and diversify your income would be huge. And all these fisheries are at full participation as it is. And so I don't really see where the harm would be. Um, anyway, thank you for your time. That's all I have. Thanks, McKenna. Any questions? And Darren Gilman. Hi, Darren. Welcome. Hello, Madam Chair and Board Members. My name is Darren Gilman, a resident of Cordova, Alaska, and Drift Gillnet, the Copper River, and Bristow Bay Fisheries. Uh, I'm also a board member on the CDFU, Cordova District Fishing United. Uh, I'll reference my public comments where I stand on most of the proposals, but I'd like to speak to a few. Uh, proposal 165, I'm in favor of prohibiting commercial operations and subsistence fisheries. It is wrong in the essence of subsistence to financially profit from it. There is already precedent set for this proposal. Currently, one cannot charge people to use your fish wheel or charge for guide or transport services in the Glenallen subdistrict. I'd like to comment on proposal 166 that I submitted. Um, I also submitted an RC. RC 11 with substitute language to clarify the proposed regulation. I'd like to point out that more AC committee supported 166 versus opposing it, and I believe with the amended language alleviate the concern of several AC committees. In 2014, the board official aligned the limits between all the PU dipnet fisheries to 25 salmon and 10 for additional members of the household. The purpose of this was to make it easier for enforcement and reduce confusion. What the new statewide bag limit is proposing is to fall in line with precedent set by the previous board. Currently, there are five active PU dipnet fisheries in the state of Alaska. Four of the PU dipnet fisheries are operating under the Upper Cook Inlet Permit, Kenai, Kasila, Fish Creek, and Susina, and they operate under a bag limit for that area. The intent to include the fifth person use dipnet fishery operating in Chitna is to follow precedent set forth by the 2014 Board of Fish, and it would eliminate households that are doubling up on these two permits and harvesting two limits. 
Clearly, the department wanted to ensure that people didn't harvest more than 25 cents per head of household and 10 additional by staying that was total for the entire area, not per river system. The department already managed the upper Cook Inlet PU dipnet fisheries with the tools to ensure the households don't harvest over their yearly bag limits on their permits. I do not see an issue with incorporating one more fishery into regulation. Reporting requirements stay the same, limits stay the same, and a household can still file for both permits. It just ensures there'll be no doubling up between the fisheries. As the state grows, this problem will become more apparent. Currently under subsistence regulations, one cannot fill two bag limits. So why is PU allowed to do so when it has a lower priority of use? I'd like to support proposal 167 put forth by CDFU. Uh, at the recent Board of Fish meeting in Cordova, the discussion revolved around passing a similar proposal. This proposal has been re reworded under the guidance from that board to include salmon and not all fish. And just listening here today and watching the electronic monitoring report, it seems to me the state wants to hold people more accountable for reporting fish. Today at this meeting, there's been some discussions of reporting on King Sam versus the Bay and making sure it was accurate and timely data. This would help accomplish that goal. It holds people accountable for making sure we have accurate and timely data for, data for our fisheries statewide. If this board feels that this is too burdensome for the user groups to report all salmon, I'd like to propose a possible solution to amend it to include king salmon only. Thank you for your time and I'll be here for committee work. Mr. Wood. Here's a problem I'm having, Darren, help me out. What you've suggested as an amendment, is that you personally talking or as a board member of the, uh, the author of this the CDFU? I'm speaking on my own behalf, but um, I could speak with the CDFU board and see if they'd be open to amending that proposal. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your, uh, for your testimony today, Darren, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, it's three o'clock, let's take about a 20 minute break and then we will resume with um, Heather Bauscher in the Sitka AC, followed by Nick Crump, Shannon Mar Martin, Ray Beamsdorfer, and Luke Graham.
All right, thank you. Time is 3.37, we're back on the record. And next up with public testimony is Heather Bauscher with the Sitka AC. Welcome back, Heather, good to see you. Thank you so much, uh, happy to be here. Nice to see you guys too. Um, for the record, my name is Heather Bauscher. I'm the chair of the Sitka Advisory Committee. The Sitka Advisory Committee is a collection of 17 publicly elected representatives of fisheries, wildlife, subsistence, and conservation interests in the Sitka area. Our AC includes a wide diversity of stakeholders, including sport and commercial interests with a broad range of views represented. All of our committee's members' livelihoods and ways of life are directly connected to the health of our salmon runs, halibut, and sable fish stocks, and our fisheries resources as a whole. Our committee decided to weigh in on about 15 of these statewide proposals and held two three hour long meetings to discuss them. We also crafted a few letters to various bodies and passed a resolution, all of which I submitted in our packet so you could have access to all of those documents. And I just wanted you to see what we've been working on and what we have done on a variety of issues, some of which are outside of this board's purview, but are still issues of concern to our community. I'd like to speak, speak quickly to three of those topics before I speak on our positions on the various proposals. Um, the resolution that we passed was regarding the misguided Wild Fish Conservancy lawsuit, trying to shut down the troll fleet because of the perceived impacts on the Puget Sound killer whales. Sitka is a major troll port in Southeast. We have more than 30% of the fleet based in Sitka and our community would be devastated by the potential of totally shutting down the troll fishery. So I wanna take a moment to thank the commissioner and the department for your support of the troll fleet and for taking such a strong stance against the Wild Fish Conservancy and this abuse of the ESA. Uh, you'll notice I included the herring letter from before and as we're getting close to that time of year, I just wanna bring that back up on the record to continue to encourage the department to give whatever time and resources are necessary to department staff working on herring to be able to reassess and maybe potentially recalibrate the herring model as we are currently working with it. Um, the Sika tribes proposals about adjusting parts of that didn't pass on the last round, but it was illuminated in the discussion that the data the model is based off of and the picture of the ocean we're working from is about 20 years old. So giving the opportunity to department staff to look into this and know if we are spot on or not and if things need to be adjusted would help address some of those concerns and maybe help build more trust with the public. I'm encouraged and grateful to hear that this may be moving forward, so thank you for that also. Um, the last letter I want to mention is the one regarding the timing and availability of the department comments. This theme has already come up today in other ways. Last winter during the last Southeast cycle for fisheries proposals, we held well over a dozen meetings in a short time frame to meet the Board of Fish comment deadlines to submit our com committee's recommendations. But the department comments were extremely late, forcing us to make our recommendations to the Board of Fish without official staff comments. Uh, now we were meeting to consider this current cycle for statewide proposals, and once again, we had no department comments to guide us in our deliberations. I just really wanna take a moment to emphasize that the SICA Advisory Committee relies heavily upon the extensive, extensive knowledge base of the department's employees, and that these official department positions carry so much weight with us that we feel extremely limited in making the best recommendations possible to this board in the absence of these department comments. So we would just really like to encourage whatever actions are needed to ensure this uh, situation does not continue to occur in the future as we move forward into the next regulatory cycle. We really do value the department representatives and hold in high regard the knowledge base inherent within our biological staff, and we would like to ensure that this information is made more available earlier on so that all involved in this public process can make the best recommendations possible. Uh, so on to the proposals. We strongly supported Proposal 155, spearfishing and saltwater while floating. There was a bit of discussion about the whole route at, readout thing from the last round, which is why two of our folks voted against it for consistency, but we determined it wouldn't really change anything there because the readout fishery near Sitka occurs in the fresh water and this wouldn't apply. We unanimously supported 156 to prohibit felt sold wait waiters, basically for all the same reasons you already heard, uh, concerns for the spread of invasive species. We dealt with 157 and 158 together and unanimously opposed those two. I have to say we are incredibly unfortunate. We are, credi we are very fortunate to have a wealth of institutional knowledge on our committee and having Mo as the same rep is so important because he noted that this proposal came up periodically mo over the years and most recently in 2016, in which case the Board of Fish rejected it, the AC, SICA AC opposed it, 
and back then a variety of other ACs also opposed it. Um, there's more notes about that discussion in our minutes from February 15th, and there were also concerns that this proposal is inherently pro-consolidation as the fisheries mentioned were all high value fisheries. Our committee felt that a skilled fisherman should be able to earn a good living in any one of these fisheries without needing to double up as is being proposed. We unanimously supported 159 to close or sorry, we unanimously opposed 159 to close commercial fishing within a quarter mile of areas closed to sport fishing because we realized that it got really unworkable when we were thinking about the context of Indian River near town, which is close to Coho, and we were concerned how that would impact the trollers close to town. And we felt that this would just create unnecessarily unnecessary closures. We unanimously opposed 160, requiring the proceeds from sales of wild kings and the THAs to be submitted to the state. We felt that there were a lot of complications with this proposal because it's difficult to tease out which of the kings and the THAs are wild because you would have to take the otolith to know, and really the majority of the kings in the THAs are hatchery fish. We unanimously supported 161 with the following amendments. We thought this one looked good but had some concerns from commercial fishermen, so we made some changes. The changes we made, we added the word commercial in the fifth goal to read providing opportunities for commercial, sport, subsistence, and personal use fisheries. And we changed the last objective to also include the word commercial so it would read avoid commercial, sport, subsistence, and personal use conflicts. We supported 163. Uh, prohibiting guiding in personal use fisheries and our guide rep stated that we don't have any guiding for personal use fisheries in our area and we don't that want that to become a practice. We took no action on 164 because we already supported 163. We unanimously supported 165, prohibiting guiding in subsistence fisheries. While we acknowledge there is an equal access argument, we don't see this as compatible with practicing a subsistence way of life. Subsistence by definition is a customary and traditional activity and there is no customary use of guiding in subsistence fisheries. And if one doesn't have a boat or a means to access the resource, then they would not have a tradition of fishing that resource. We unanimously opposed Proposal 166 to establish a bag limit for personal use fin fish. We were opposed to this because we philosophically didn't like the one size fits all approach and didn't think it was workable for us because there's far too many differences in different areas and different levels of abundance um, and a variety of different personal use opportunities. Uh, we unanimously opposed 167 to require in-season reporting of subsistence and personal use salmon within five days. We felt that it was too short of a reporting window and felt it would be a burden on subsistence users who are often out in remote places for multiple days and don't always have access to cell phone signal or internet. We unanimously supported 168 to allow the Department of Close Sport Fisheries and Contaminated Waters. Thought this was a great public health measure and it passed immediately without much further discussion. And Proposal 169 also passed unanimously. This one led to a funny conversation about brook trout in Green Lake, which you can read about if you would like to on the last page of our February 22 minutes. We all agreed that it would be a good thing to let folks to be able to eat the invasive species they catch if they are good for eating. And lastly, I would just like to say thank you to each of you for your service on this board and for your time and consideration of our viewpoints on these topics. Thanks, Heather. Appreciate the report. Any questions? As always, well done, and thank you for your service on the AC. Thank you so much. <coughs> Nick Crump. Hi, welcome, Nick. Hey. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Nicholas Crump. I am a salmon saner from Valdez, and I am also the chairman of the Valdez AC, and I'm here speaking on their behalf. Uh, we recently met and went over the proposals that we felt were relevant to our area and have submitted our comments. All of our votes were either 6-0 or 0-6. So proposal 153, we supported this proposal because we understand the need for escape mechanisms and we also identified the ends of the slinky pots given the shape of the gear type to be the optimal spot. Uh, 154, we decided to oppose allowing drum sanding in Alaska Discussions were based on safety concerns. For example, having a heavy drum seine on the back deck can change the vessel's center of gravity, making them more unstable. Uh, 155, we supported this one because we acknowledge the difference between scuba diving and snorkeling. Uh, 156, we supported this one because we feel that felt-sold footwear can carry 
and spread bacteria, viruses, and possibly some invasive species. Uh, 157 and 158, we took no action on these because some members of the AC didn't feel they had enough information and feel comfortable considering the impact of these proposals. Uh, 159, we opposed this proposal and feel this hinders the department's ability to manage targeted areas for harvesting. Uh, when the department feels they have their escapement, then it should be up to their discretion on what area they open for fishing. Uh, 160, we opposed this one because observations from members Hussein and Port Valdez um, are that harvest of feeder kings in that area are minimal at best, and the charter boat captains on the AC noted that they thought the king stock was primarily further out in Prince William Sound and relatively healthy. So proposal 161, we took no action on this one because we felt more information was needed for proper consideration. 162, we supported this one because we just felt it is good housekeeping to reduce regulatory complexity. 163, 164, and 165, we opposed these proposals because members determined that these proposals seek to limit access unnecessarily and duplicate reporting and fee requirements. Furthermore, we feel that there isn't a need to limit or regulate guides or transporters servicing personal use or subsistence fishermen. Uh, 166, we supported this one because we felt statewide bag limit seems appropriate. And uh, I think there's already something like this for hunting, so it would make sense to do something like that for fishing as well. Uh, 167, we supported this one because we always want better reporting so the department has more timely and accurate information they can use to better manage the resource. Uh, 168, we supported this one because it seems appropriate to support the department's authority to protect public health. And 169, we supported this proposal and accepted the department's definitions of invasive species. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? I have a quick question for you. Is Valdez in a subsistence area, a designated subsistence area, or not? Um, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Appreciate your report today. Thank you for your service on the AC and being here to, to communicate those positions to us. Shannon Martin. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Shannon Martin. I'm the executive director for the Kenai River Sport Fishing Association. I'd like to reference Chris's written comments, PC 242. Kenai River Sport Fishing Association is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with thousands of members. Since 1984, Chris has been a leading advocate for fisheries conservation in Alaska. We work diligently to ensure Alaska's sport and personal use fishing rights are protected and that the fisheries are healthy for generations to come. I wanted to take a moment to address why Chris participates in Board of Fish meetings outside of Cook Inlet. It's a question that I get asked often. The answer to that question is simple. King salmon management, particularly in those systems where there are mixed stock issues and important sport fisheries, is literally the most important reason for our being. Whether it's on the Nushagak being discussed at this meeting, or on the Copper, or back on the Kenai, we will be actively engaging in the board process as management plans are developed and adopted. Also critically important to our organization is for people to have meaningful opportunity and access to participate in personal use and subsistence fisheries for salmon. These fisheries feed Alaskans. Chris strongly opposes uh, proposals 163, 164, 165, 166, and 167. Each of these proposals chip away at Alaska residents' opportunity to harvest salmon. Thank you very much for your service on this board, and please contact me or any member of our organization if you have questions. Thanks, and I just want to make clear uh, your organization took position on the subsistence issue? We're in support of, I'm sorry, we oppose banning uh, chartered access in the subsistence fishery. 
Thank you. I just wanted to. Thanks. Sorry, it's make, quite intimidating clear, up yeah. here. <laughs> no, sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was just trying to make make sure that I understood the position clearly. Mr. Wood has a question, though. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't have the 242 in right in front of me, but I do recall reading it. And one of the concerns raised by the organization was that the plan that was presented uh, dealt somewhat effectively with the first 60 percent of the run of the Kings of Obern and Noosh, but they were concerned about the the late 40 percent. Uh, have you since that been written, made any specific recommendations as to what the board may consider for that time frame? Um, I believe that we'll re reserve that for the committee process. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your testimony today, Shannon. Thank you. Ray Beamstorfer. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Carlson Van Dort, uh, members of the board. My name is Ray Beamsdorfer. I'm the science advisor for the Kenai River Sport Fishing Association. In this capacity, I've been involved in uh, um, salmon fishery management issues before the board since 2002. And I would just like to note I'm testifying for Chris at this meeting because Kevin Delaney was unable to attend in person, and I'm blaming him for it. So Chris is um, testifying today in support of the critical need for significant conservation uh, measures uh, for king salmon, in particular uh, in the Nushagak uh, King's uh, Stock of Concern Action Plan referenced in, uh, I think it's a revised proposal 11. We're, of course, uh, in an unprecedented and alarming cycle of uh, king salmon declines across Alaska, and we're in a deep hole where we haven't been any time in recent uh, memory. We're faced with uh, king stocks of concern all, all over the place, and the, uh, we're also facing a, a very uncertain future. So we're at a critical time, and that means there's a high risk in, uh, in the management response uh, that we might uh, take there. And of course, the problem with low escapements is that they produce low returns. And so the best way to get out of the king hole we're in is to put more kings on the spawning ground. And a failure to adequately escape kings uh, risks prolonging the low production cycle and all the associated management problems. And of course, uh, the, the challenge is, um, is how to protect the run of kings while also allowing harvest of the strong stocks of sockeye, and that is the focus of the uh, Nishigak Action Plan, uh, particularly what's the priority uh, when it's not possible to meet the lower king goal without exceeding the top end of the sockeye goals. And Chris uh, strongly believes that um, the fish always come first and that protecting the sustainability of the kings uh, by ensuring that the minimum uh, goals are met should be the um, number one priority. And with respect to the action plan for the Nushigak, um, we will speak to, as uh, Shannon mentioned, we will speak to that in greater detail in the uh, committee process. Nush uh, Chris does have several points of concern, and uh, particularly with the trigger numbers, um, and we are working through uh, to develop some more specific uh, recommendations for those. There's a lot of trigger numbers in there, and they all interact, so it's kind of complicated. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood. Beamer, my experience with you is that you do the lion's share of the scientific work for CURSA, and I respect that. And I understand what you're talking about with OEGs, but would you please take a look at Proposal 13 that's been put forward, I think, by Mr. Kraft and uh, his attempt to get pulses through, and give me an opinion when you come up here and committee the whole as to how effective that would be and should that be incorporated somehow into the plan? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Wood, uh, yes, we've, uh, we've ha had discussions with Mr. Kraft, and we are uh, very interested in the Windows concept, and we will uh, we'll be prepared to speak to that. Thank you very much. All right, thanks for your testimony today, Thank Ray. You. Luke Graham, followed by Nathan Hoff, Craig Chithluck, August Knutson, and Paul Shadura. Is Luke with us today? First call, Luke Graham. Moving on to Nathan Hoff. Is Nathan present? Okay. 
Hi, Nathan. Welcome. Thank you. I do have a question uh, before I start testimony, though. Um, in the beginning, you asked, like, people testify to proposals specifically being addressed. Can I speak to uh, the uh, board-generated proposal you had earlier from the Cook Inlet earlier in the year? It's not on this testimony. It's just Cook Inlet uh, Fisheries uh, Commercial, the board-generated proposal you had last uh, cycle. So you're three minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. So and we, we have had some emergency petitions, so I think it's germane if you'd like okay. to speak okay. to it. Okay, that's, that's fine. Thanks. So, uh, thanks. My name is Nathan Hoff. I do commercially fish in the Cook Inlet. Um, I guess I was just providing some new information. Um, since that last board generated cycle, their preseason forecast has come out. And so now there is a, um, you know, all the, the numbers are there. So the last time people were discussing it, they're saying, well, what would be a minimal amount of kings to be harvested in the set industry? So I suppose in my mind, this would be the time to be able to approach that actually because you would have numbers now going into that. Um, and also since it's being shut down, you know, there's guides, myself, people have a expectation that I like, I don't, I'm not gonna be fishing, right? So people have expectations, but there are people that do wish to fish and they wish to fish specifically to be able to harvest uh, plentiful sockeye. So regards to a lot of the uh, joint things, there's OEGs, BEGs, there's very few goals that are very specifically uh, shared, um, not directly. Um, I think continuing to say that every fish matters is uh, quite a dangerous position to put oneself in actually because it's not very true. Um, you know, it just gets into there's a little bit of emotion. I'm not saying it's not a cause of concern, but I'll give you one quick example of what I'm talking about. You take the, fifth, the area of 15 for moose and we have 15A, 15B, 15C. You basically have three sections with different carrying capacities, different populations. Nobody has ever suggested shutting down the Seward Highway because there's moose being run over by, on the highway. And they're run over at different amounts. But basically, the human harvest opportunity there is about 400 animals. The road kills about 200 animals. In some areas, it's proportional, but uh, you know, in uh, some areas, the roadkill uh, exceeds the human harvest by double. In some way, the place it's about half or a quarter. So that's, uh, I think, my idea. But the further idea I would have regarding that is that if a set number was set, again, it would force the remaining participants to really act on their local knowledge and withdraw, like I'm withdrawing some of them, some of them have to work together or communicate or be monitored or what, whatever the uh, uh, decision would be. Uh, but a BG is a good number. I mean, I was, I've been part of the board cycles where like you're setting a BG specifically because you know different things about the population. In this case, well, other things we know about the population is like a BG, a lot of times at the lower end, it would be blowing up. That's not happening. And I don't expect that to happen, which is why I do have, you know, like everybody does, right? So it's like you're not like pushing for everything because it's just not happening in that way. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate your testimony today. I don't see any questions. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Nathan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was reading my list wrong again. I almost called you Luke. That's all. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. Um, next up is Craig Chithlook. Hi, Craig. Chair. Welcome. Oh, yeah, thank you. Welcome. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for listening to our testimonies. For the record, my name is Craig Chithlick. I'm a drift fisherman, owner-operator based out of the Nishigak District, and I have spent a good majority of my life fishing in that district, and I'm representing myself. I'm here today to speak about the Nishigak King Salmon Action and management plans. I appreciate all of the work that has gone into these plans and commend the department and the King Salmon Committee for their work. 
As a subsistence and commercial fisherman, I hope the board takes action to conserve king salmon in the Michigan District because in 2021, my family, for various reasons, does not harvest a single king salmon during our traditional subsistence fishery. So it's definitely, something's definitely going on. The points I wanna to speak to about today are the triggers and hard dates presented in each plan. To me, a trigger makes sense with the right conditions. We need simplicity in an action plan that allows the fishery to be managed for, a very, for the very large uh, variability of re uh, return run size, weather, and other variables that impact the timing on return. From my observation, area managers need the board's help to allow better Chinook escapement while giving the department flexibility to let the commercial fleet go once the sockeye start rolling in. I'm also in support of a hard date and reduced fishing time to a later date based on historical runtime average of Chinook making their way into the river system. We just heard information provided by the department that shows dates when a historical amount of king salmon make their way into the Nishigak River. I like the idea of a hard start date for the commercial fishing fleet. While we are in the stock of concern, that is around June 26 timeframe. For the reasons we heard during the department's oral testimony, I am also in support of slowing down the fishing, uh, commercial fishing operations to 12 hours a day until July 2nd-ish, that time frame. Uh, again, referencing uh, the department's oral reports. I like the hard date that holds off the commercial guys regardless of a trigger. I like it because we have a difficult time with Chinook enumeration in the Nishigak district. However, we have pretty good idea about the dates and tangible numbers of fish that make their way up into the Nishigak River right around that June 26th and July 2nd, the 50% and 75% times. Holding off the commercial, commercial fishery until these hard dates will allow our region subsistence users better access to Chinook salmon by reducing commercial harvest time. In summary, as a subsistence and com commercial user, I support the 6% trigger and hold firm and holding firm on a hard date right around that June 26th. And I hope the board chooses to conserve Chinook for subsistence purposes to the best of their the department's abilities and allowing, um, and when the sockeye are on the move, allow the department the flexibility to let the commercial tar fleet target sockeye. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Any questions? Appreciate your testimony today. August Knudsen. Is August with us this afternoon? Paul Shigura. Saw him earlier. First call for Paul. All right. Caleb Westfall. Hi, Caleb, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, commissioner. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Caleb Westfall. I currently live in uh, Dillingham. Uh, I have set net in the Nishigak district, right outside Dillingham. Um, I'm speaking to the Nishigak River King Salmon Action Plan. Uh, roughly proposal 11, 12, and 13. Um, I want to kind of set this up here in um, a couple different ways, but I'm really looking at um, <clears throat> trying to add some uh, perspective here. Um, earlier, I guess my perspective, sorry. Earlier, uh, management, uh, area manager Tim Sands um, talked about a graph that showed a sharp decline in king salmon in about two, seven, 2007, and an extreme sharp uh, decline. Um, <clears throat> Also, if you click around, <clears throat> excuse me, on the NOAA website, uh, one of the first things on there is uh, salmon bycatch by numbers, and you go click down there and you open up the, um, the uh, document, genetic stock composition analysis of the Chinook salmon <clears throat> bycatch by, um, by the 2020 Bering Sea Pollock Trawl Fishery. And um, on page nine at the bottom there, um, there's a statement in there that says the Chinook bycatch is estimated at 6% below historical average, and that's, a, uh, I believe, 2020. 
34,589. Um, <clears throat> it gives the average between 91 and 2019. Um, it goes on to say, and far below the highest overall Chinook bycatch, which is in uh, 2007, which was estimated at 122,195 fish. So I understand that that's not our purview here, um, federal fisheries, but when we're looking at making this management plan, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in this room I see <clears throat> uh, uh, subsistence users, sport fish, and commercial fish, and we make up a portion of uh, king salmon um, removal from the water uh, use. And then we have the trawl fleet, which is a user group, but they're not part of this conversation. And I understand that we can't pull them into that. But as we uh, go look at proposal 11, 12, and 13, I, I just want to caution the concern that um, you know, we can do everything we can do, but there's also something outside our control. Um, commercial fishing has, has built my life. It's, it's built my character, and it's, it's done wonderful things for me. So I want to be conservative, and I, and I want to um, move forward and, and work through this. But um, I guess looking at these proposals, I, I really personally more support the status quo with um, uh, management being able to be more aggressive in, in their management. Um, other things we know, you know, if, if we start moving levers and triggers, uh, we don't have the monitoring system in the Nishigak River. So we start, we start manipulating how many fish go up, this, that, the other, but we still don't have the data. So we pull these levers, it's, it's good, we're doing something, but we still can't enumerate what we're actually doing. So um, I guess I'm just, when speaking to the Nishigak um, River King Salmon Management Action Plan, I'm really just saying that I'd, I'd rather it be status quo before, I mean, we need to know what the numbers are before we start pulling the levers and, and changing um, our statements. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Appreciate your testimony today. Next up is Zenon Mordashev, followed by Phyllis Sheeran, Fritz Johnson, Tuyan Phillip, and Erica McDaniel. Hi, Zenon, welcome. Uh, hello, my name is Zenon Markshev. I'd like to thank the Board of Fish for taking the time. Um, pretty much the man before me had to say what I had to say, but uh, these managements, oh wait, hold on. I'm a <clears throat> Bristol Bay commercial fisherman. I've been fishing out of the Nushigak district for six years now, and the management there has never been any has never been better, and these proposals, I want to oppose all of them and leave the management the way it is. So yep, that's that. And also for the board of fish to start looking outside the boundary lines because I don't believe that the king, sa uh, king salmon harvests in the districts are, how do I say it? Yep, uh, the king salmon harvests are not as, it's my first time, so sorry. Take your time. Already, I think I'll go. Okay, thank you for. I'll, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, your testimony today, Phyllis Sharon. Still Phyllis today. Okay. Fritz Johnson. Hi, Fritz. Madam Chairman. And board. <laughs> uh, my name is Fritz Johnson. I live in Dillingham, and I have particip participated in the Bristol Bay commercial salmon fishery and subsistence harvesting in the region for more than 40 years. I want to speak in support of Proposal 11 <clears throat> and the new standalone stock of concern Nushigak King Salmon Management Plan 
described in the latter half of RC 13. Um, it's not to say that my comments are made without reservation, given that there's a lot more we don't know about our King stocks than we do. Um, PC 58 submitted by the BBRSDA lists a raft, a raft of elements we, about what we don't know that makes efforts at restoration of Nushigat Kings something of a shot in the dark, imprecise, uh, if not to say wishful thinking, but we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Short of hatcheries, the traditional way to rebuild declining stop stocks is just not to kill them. Leave them unmolested to spawn and reproduce, and this is what provisions of the Stock of Concern Management Plan aim to do by delaying the start of the sockeye fishery. Uh, yet, it's been pointed out by management that even if the commercial fleet hadn't set a net last year, king numbers wouldn't have reached the lower end of the escapement goal. But still, the hope is that delaying the start of fishing will help, and there seems to be general agreement that Proposal 11 vis-a-vis -vis RC 13 provides management the tools that needs, needs to meet those expectations, even if there's not yet consensus about where to set the triggers for opening the sockeye fishery. I, <coughs> excuse me, I'd caution against setting that number overly high. Bristol Bay is obviously the biggest sockeye run in Alaska, and the second biggest stock I run in the state is the fish we don't catch. 23 million or so in the last six years worth nearly $160 million. Um, the math is easy, but more of a mystery is the effect that unprecedented sockeye abundance may have on the spawning success of Nushigat kings. That's one of the many unknowns beyond the sonar's unreliability, uh, the effects of climate change, disease, changes in predation, bycatch, and interception. And please don't misunderstand my intent, because my hope as much as anyone that our king stocks will rebuild. But in that changes in king abundance are a statewide phenomenon, I have to believe that focusing solely on what we see at the terminal end of a species return uh, from the ocean, and, and looking at that, we're looking at the trees rather than the forest. A um, couple of final thoughts. Please keep in mind in dealing with the king salmon issue that subsistence access needs to remain paramount. As you know, it's a vital component of rural life and culture. And I'd also like to add my opposition to proposals 157 and 158, which I believe will have the effect of increasing the cost of CFAC permits and make it more difficult for new entrants to participate in salmon fisheries. Thank you. Thanks, Fritz. Thanks. Mr. Wood has a question. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, since you've been on this board as long as you were, I don't feel guilty about putting you on the spot. Fair enough. <laughs> you were talking about the opener not being set too high, and I'd like you to quantify where you think that trigger should be. Mr. Wood, I'd like to answer that question. I don't have an answer to it right now. You know, uh, in terms of what the uh, King Salmon Committee has crafted, that's um, you know, in as much as, you know, not being a statistician or a scientist, I would, you know, I have, I have faith in those who crafted, you know, that language. Yeah, and, that, and apparently there's a difference of opinion between people that have, have those degrees, et cetera, and I, I'm trying to get a handle on it. So thank you. I'm sure you'll hear more. You'll hear more. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Carpenter has a question for you, Fritz. <laughs> Don't run away yet, Go Fritz. ahead, Tom. Thank you, Madam Chair. For it's specific to 157 and 158, and obviously you've been a resident of Dillingham for a long time, and you've sat up at this table and had to make decisions um, many times. I guess I'm looking for your personal opinion, what you think the economic impact of either one of these proposals passing would have on rural Alaska. Um, you know, having uh, lived in, in Dillingham for as long as I have and having seen the number of, of permits that are owned by watershed residents uh, decline uh, in a big way by basically going to the highest bidder, um, it's the nature of our, you know, the transferability of the limited entry system for permits that makes that possible. I just, you know, see that, you know, having, a, you know, that potential increasing and in, uh, Limited entry in the beginning recognized the the importance of having rural access to the fisheries and you know and basically on people's doorstep, 
And this is my main concern there. In terms of an actual dollar amount, I, I couldn't say, but it's just, it's a trend that we see in our region and uh, one that uh, you know, I think is not healthy for the state. Thanks. All right, thank you. Next up is uh, Tuyan Phillip, followed by Erica McDaniel, Mark Spencer, and Tom Rollman, Jr. Hi, welcome to the table. Hello, Madam Chairman and Board. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank everybody in accordance for taking the time out of their day for coming here. Uh, Jamai, Waka. My name is Doyne Phillip. I'm a Yupik Alaska native from Kangikngak, Alaska. And I've lived in Alaska all my life, born and raised. I've lived off the land since I could remember. Uh, I'm here to take, to oppose, sorry about that, this is my first time. I'm here today to oppose Proposals 163 through 167, with that being said, I would like to express the importance of charters not only for myself, but for other fellow Alaskans that use charters to secure food for their families and, you know, everybody else they like. The um, job of charters are to create opportunities for other Alaskans to be able to provide for their families in a safe, affordable option from an experienced boat captain that knows the dangers of the water and can provide a safe passage for all Alaskans that want to live a life of subsistence and personal use. Thank you. Thanks. I have a quick question for you. Yep. So how in your mind do you reconcile um, sort of the commercial aspect, i.e. a profitability associated with a subsistence resource which is not intended to be commercialized? Uh, could you restate that? So if you're paying somebody to access a resource, Correct. That is a commercial transaction. And we have guidance, statute, whatever, um, that subsistence is not an activity that should be commercialized. So I'm just kind of, I'm curious how you, how you reconcile, given your background and your history, and, and, and how, how, how do you approach that? Uh, you know? The way I approach it is I've, I've lived in Anchorage for about 13 years now. And with that being said, I can't really go back to my native land, like where I'm from, to fish for, you know, my ancestors have fished for millennia and hunt there. And so with that being said, you know, I can't afford, you know, a boat. And, you know, most Alaskans, they can't afford boats and like that. But with a, with a commercial charter like that, we allow that opportunity to have that life of subsistence that we Alaskans are so proud of. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your testimony today. Erica McDaniel. Hi, Erica, welcome. Hi there. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. My name is Erica McDaniel, and I'm here today to oppose proposals 163 through 167. I work with AK Expeditions, and I have the privilege of speaking with Alaskans about the personal use and subsistence fisheries on the Copper River regularly. It is difficult to quantify the amount of phone calls that I receive from people who understand the dangers of this river but want the opportunity to harvest salmon safely and be able to include their little ones and elders in the process. Being forced to hang from the cliffs or wade in the dangerous water should not be the only option for harvesting salmon. Nearly seven years ago, I, burked, I booked my first DIFNET charter in an attempt to harvest salmon from the personal use fishery for the very first time. At this time in my life, I was an ATV guide out of J-Bear and part of my job was giving weekend safety briefs to service members and their families about not getting involved in dangerous outdoor activities around the state. One of my main topics was the Copper River, and the answer was always the same for those interested in participating in this fishery. Book a guide because it could potentially save your life. Our son will be two next month, and we bring him with us to participate and learn how we harvest salmon. <laughs> Due to the safe access of a boat, our son has been able to be a part of this since he was born. From my first experience as a charter guest to now, 
watching hundreds of Alaskans, including children and elderly, all participate in this fishery safely from a boat has made me realize just how special this activity truly is. And my, from my first time there, I knew I wanted to help be a part of not only providing access, but maintaining this access for Alaskans. Banning guided access would effectively ban Alaskans' rights to safe access. In short, these proposals seem to be attempts to make this fishery increasingly difficult to participate in, thus threatening the rights of Alaskans by attempting to restrict safe access. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony today. Mark Spencer. Hi, Mark. Welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you guys for being here, Madam Chair. I'm here to oppose 163 through 167. I don't see a biological reason to ban access uh, to these fisheries for residents who can legally par participate in them. We have, like the last speaker mentioned, we have people from all over the state that charter with us to access these fisheries, whether it be on the Copper or the Kenai River. Providing this access um, is cr critical for us um, as a uh, veteran and um, I, I just let me back it up a little bit when when we provide access to these rivers um, the Copper River is a monster I operate on it probably more than anybody in the state even the other charters who've been doing it longer we're out there all the time um, we participate in rescues body recoveries um, it is nothing to joke around with we watch people fall in the river off the cliffs, and we are able to take people out, their families, their kids, um, to participate in this fishery, whether it's personal use or subsistence. Um, it was an option, um, and well, obviously not anymore because of 21, but for PU, I, I think it needs to, we need to be able to maintain access. Um, on one, um, I want you guys to take a look at uh, RC06, and that was submitted by Chitna Dip Netters Association, and that talks about the statewide um, uh, bag limit. I think out of the 40,000 annual permits pulled um, in both the Copper River and South Central, uh, I think on, that, on average maybe 17, 1,800 families pulled both those permits. And of both those permits pulled, they harvest not even one permit's worth of fish. So, you know, that's something to consider as, as you guys are looking at that, you know, 40,000 annual and you know, 17, 1,800 people grab a dual permit. So, also doesn't stop them from getting um, a Kenai River permit and get, grabbing a Glen Allen subsistence permit and paying me to drive them up and drop them off along the river. So, we can't really talk about commercialization of a subsistence fishery when I can still do it. Um, it's just not a safe option that I'm willing to do, knowing that there's signs along the Copper River that are grave markers for people who have fallen in. So, you know, we don't participate in that. It's dangerous to bring your boat up to the, the shores and along the canyons. And even as an expert operator, which I am in those conditions, it's, it's not worth stepping people from one boat or from the boat onto the rock surfaces or under the beaches um, where we could get... Uh, you know, run aground or have other problems like that. I think that's basically it. I, as you guys know, uh, that's my time. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, Mr. Zray. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've uh, heard a lot of concern about the uh, commercialization of personal use and subsistence uh, under these circumstances. And... Uh, you know, commercialization usually means, you know, benefit money, you know, economically benefiting and, and money. And uh, how much does the uh, average uh, personal use of subsistence person that uh, would you guess, you know, how much economic value do they, uh, how much money do they make, you know, by... <laughs> 
getting on your boat. And I would it. say if, let's use a Costco price of $80 a, a fish for sockeye salmon, that's for headed and gutted. If they can catch 25 fish times $80, that's $2,000 um, of fish if they had to go to the store and buy it. Is that what you're? Uh, actually, my question was how much, uh, like that, that, that would be the equivalent in food value. But I mean, how much money do they make? Does the operator make? No, the fisherman. You were talking about. No, they don't I'm make not, any money. They don't I'm, make any money. Well, you, yeah, yeah you're, so they're, they're not, the subsistence yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, I'm tracking. Yeah. Yeah, no, they don't make any money. They, they, they're, they get an opportunity, and they hopefully catch fish, and if they do, um, but they don't, they don't make any money. They're just trying to collect fish for their families via a boat and a, a charter. Thank you. That's why I wanted to. That's. Mr. Wood. Yeah, Mark, it's none of my business what you charge, but do you charge the same to bring a, a PU fisherman up that you would charge for subsistence fishermen? Yes. Thank you. I guess, and I remember this discussion is coming back to me now from when we talked about this in, in Prince William Sound meeting. You know, one of the concerns that we heard and frustrations from the folks in that area when we deliberated on this issue there was uh, sort of a feeling that some of the charter operators are trying to game the system by, um, you know, holding out to decide which permit to advise their client that they should go after, whether it would be a personal use permit or a subsistence permit, and you can get more fish under this one and that one. I mean, it rolls in a lot of different elements when you're talking about this, and so I just, you know, I'm just kind of curious if you think that that should, has any standing for consideration in terms of how the board approaches it? I don't think so, because they were at that time both legal. And what was happening is, we'll just take the back row of board members. You all booked a charter, and there's usually, you know, a primary person we, we speak with, and people say, grab the uh, Chitna permit. And so people were showing up without um, the correct permits, and so it became an option when they could either uh, buy the permits online to just wait. And then whether at that point they can make a decision on what they want to, um, where they want to fish, or if someone showed up with the wrong permits, they can you know, go to fishing game and get another permit. But it became an issue with the department where people were showing up with the wrong permits and saying, oh, I got the wrong permit, and then having to drive up to Glen Allen. Staff was having to you know, go through, when did you get your permit issued? Now you have to change it. Um, or they weren't able to change it. They pay for the charter, and there's not a refund for that. I've, you know, we've, I've paid the crew, I've paid the insurance, I've paid the licensing, and so then people were out, you know, their charter fee because they didn't have the right permit. So in order to simplify it, you know, that's an, an approach we took, but it's, the information was available on the Fish and Game website. Further, we do this in hunting where people book uh, brown bear hunts or moose hunts and they show up with, um, you know, they fly out to Port Hyden or wherever we're at, um, and they don't have a locking tag, they don't have a, um, hunting license, they don't have their harvest ticket. And so we, we try to make it as easy and clear as possible for them to understand. Um, and if that might be a, a picture of all those things, that's what we give those clients. So when the Dipnik clients would show up, we wanted to make, make it so it's easy for them to understand what they had. Um, and, and that usually was with people who booked a whole boat. It wasn't all the singles that show up, if you know, no one on this board knows each other, they all show up. Um, they have to have the right permit or they go home. They don't fish. So that was an item that was exclusive to boats when you book the whole boat with your group and the groups inherently don't talk to each other all the time and you know, people who aren't familiar with one permit or the other and then they go and ask for the wrong stuff or print the wrong stuff online. So that, it was a, an, a way to make it easier for them so when they drove seven hours or 14 hours round trip from Fairbanks or 12 hours from um, 
Anchorage area or fly down from Uktiavik, they had the right stuff. Um, because what happens inevitably, when I tell them no, then they're mad. And then I've got to deal with that. So it was information that I consolidated that was available on the fishing game website. Should anyone wanted to look, it was there. I, you know, I shouldn't be, that, that idea shouldn't be penalized because it was available on, on the fishing game website and from fishing game if you asked them. So. Thanks. Um, so I know that the, you have a lot of experience on the copper, and are there are there places on the Copper River where there is a, you know where you don't have the safety issues necessarily to be able to subsistence harvest? In, anywhere where you're putting people on the bank to harvest, is or a fish wheel, it's dangerous. Um, it's. You know, so I think some people have a vision that you stand like in the subsistence area in big eddies and you just hold the, the net and the fish swim in there. That's not the case. You have to get the net in there and it could be you know, 30 feet long, longer than our boats. And they feed that out into the water. Then they have to walk on the bank edge and that's a pretty abrupt drop. Um, and so you're risking falling in. If you fall in the, in the subsistence area above the wheels, your next stop is a wheel, and your next stop is your last stop. There's no question about that. Um, as far as you know, getting on a sandbar, it becomes a uh, a sandbar. If anyone, you know, I know there's a lot of ocean boats here, and you can pull up to the safety of a dock. But we don't have that option on the Cop River, um, and. You know, if you run in with a jet, you suck up rocks, you're dead adrift. If you can't clear, you're great. If you come in too shallow and you um, blow into a bar, you're blowing your prop. Now you're losing any kind of mobility and steerability of your vessel. And next stop's the wall or the bridge pilings. And we see it. I see it all the time. Um, and we're, again, we're part of those rescues and we're part of the calls when the uh, families don't show up. Because we're the only, we're the, we have the biggest footprint there with our office, our um, campground, and we answer the phone, and so we get those calls. So, so obviously this pr this proposal extends beyond just the boundaries of the Copper River, sure. and, and surely there's safe access to subsistence resources throughout the state. Would you agree? Sure, but safe access or. Um, I heard someone else talk from, earlier from Southeast that everyone has a boat. It makes me want to go down there because I have a bunch of boats too. So, But I can tell you, not everyone has a boat. Not everyone has fish where they can get, if they do have a boat, um, you know, when we were out on the Yukon or on the Inoko and Shagaluk, they don't have boats. You know, we take those people out when we're down there hunting to provide them access to some of that stuff that they can't afford at $10, $12 a a gallon to go rip around to try to find food. So yeah, there, there might be safer access certainly than the copper, but you know they, they still have to have a resource to harvest. And I think we all heard during the AYK that that's not the case. So getting people from Galena, from um, Manly, you know, from Shagaluk that come out and participate in these fisheries. Now, when we make it a only PU charter, now that's only when that PU is open, and it's not open the whole summer, versus if you had June 1st until September 30th to harvest fish, now you have, you have a couple, few weeks in June, and then the shutdowns happen, and then you know we might fish three, four days a week in July. So we went from uh, having 10 weeks of potential opportunity for those folks to maybe five weeks. Okay. Five weeks. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate your testimony today. Right. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for indulging some of my questions. You betcha. Thank you. Tom Rollman, Jr. Good afternoon, Tom. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, board members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to. Uh, Justify here today. Uh, my name is Tom Rollman, Jr. Um, I've been uh, fishing on the Nushigak, uh, set netting 
since 1984, and uh, lifelong Alaskan, I live in Eagle River. Um, I want to talk about uh, New Shigat Kings, um, touch on the different proposals, but I just want to, there was a time when I think those of us that fish the New Shigak, um, kind of realized that the rest of the state, the Kings were struggling, but the New Shigak was still strong, and kind of were like patting ourselves on the back, not that we had anything to do with it, but I mean, we're happy to know that we weren't being affected, and I know our fellow set netters in Kenai right now, I mean, we see what's going on with them, and it's scary, honestly, to see, and I'm glad right now that we're not necessarily pitting gear groups against each other, and we're all in this together, and I really hope that we can come up with a solution to... Uh, to figure out how to get our kings and take care of them, along with, you know, harvesting the reds. Um, I think the one thing that's unique about the commercial fish, fishermen is, that at least our, among set netters, we don't want to catch kings. I mean, we, this, this last year, I mean, my crew, I directed them and I did it myself. We let every, every live, you know, strong king, we let them go. I mean, and I, and I can speak for other, other fishermen that did the same thing. I mean, we tried to really... I don't know how many of them made it. They may have gone to the next net up the line and got sold. I don't know, but we tried, and we really tried to let everybody. And we didn't catch very many. I mean, they just weren't there. I mean, more little ones, anecdotally, you're hearing that, right? The big ones aren't there anymore. We used to regularly catch 30, 40-pound kings, and now I think the biggest one we caught all last season was probably 20 or 25, you know, and most of them were just the little jacks. Um, you know, an idea that's, that's been tossed around amongst some other fellow set netters that we've talked about is, and I don't know how we could tag this on to a, another proposal, but with kings would be to, you know, what if you de-incentivized catching kings to where you couldn't sell them? Like maybe the process, you took them to the processors and then they were donated. Maybe they could be you know, donated to the, to the Yukon. You know, maybe those folks up there, you know, or something... Maybe that takes that incentive. I don't think people are catching them to try to make money anymore anyway, at least not in the commercial fleet. But if there was a way to do that, maybe that would help. I don't know. Just an idea, and I'd be open if anybody wanted to talk about it, a way to write a proposal or tag it onto something else so we could make that happen, or maybe that has to wait. Um, I am in support of, um, of Proposal 13 um, with the RC-12 amendments. I think that somehow, and again, that doesn't affect set netters too much, but if there's a way to kind of work with those windows, I think the department's already kind of doing that anyway. The way, you know, the couple hours before high, and, and if there's a way, if that helps, I think that that would be, I'm we're in favor of that. We're also in favor of proposal, I'm in, I'm in favor of proposal 11, um, the BBSRI's um, kind of new plan, um, and tweak a few numbers in there. There's some there's some numbers, and, and I'll, I'm, Myself and another fellow set netter will submit an RC um, tonight with some different numbers there that we think would, 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 would work. But um, I really want to give pr props to the department. I think that they do an amazing job of, of managing our fishery as it is, and I'd like to give them the tools to continue to do that. Thank Th you. Thanks, Tom. So um, between the two kind of options that you talked about, which was, I think, um, Proposal 13 with RC-12 amendments and then the BBRSI plan with some of the tweak numbers approach, do you have a preference there between the two of those options that you described? Honestly, I think they could, they could both. I mean, I think, okay. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think, I, I don't think you have to choose. I think, because I, I think they're different enough that they could really both be, be incorporated. I mean, because the number, the 13 has more to do with, you know, openings and closures at the top and bottoms of the tides, where 11 is more to do with triggers, which, you know, as far as when and, and that timing in there, 6%, you know, of the Nushigak run and so on. So um, I think maybe probably both of those sort of a hybridized approach. be incorporated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your testimony today. Thank you very much. Gary Klein, followed by Catherine Carscallon and Frank Woods. Good afternoon, Gary. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. My name is Gary Klein. I live in Dillingham. I'm a commercial drift operator and a subsistence user um, in the Nushigak. First of all, I'd like to say I'm opposed to proposals 157 and 158. That being said, I want to focus on the Nushigak um, King Salmon Draft Action Plan and RC 13, which is the amended version of uh, Proposal 11 um, that the King Salmon Committee put together um, as a proposal for the 
King Salmon Management Plan and a separate one for the Stock of Concern Plan. In regards to the draft action plan, I'm opposed to um, commercial fishing option two to open up the Wood River Special Harvest Area. When the Wood River Special Harvest Area is typically open, the main district is usually open as well, and it gives the fleet an option on where to fish. Um, with this, it would basically leave just the Wood River, and I'm kind of hesitant on seeing how we could jam potentially 700 drift boats in the the small river there. Most of them, or some of them, wouldn't. You know, some would probably stand down and wait. It also would um, kind of disenfranchise a subset of other set netters that aren't mobile that deliver fish with the truck at ECOC. And so I feel for the sake of conservation for folks, it should be shared across the board around the fleet. So I'd rather have the whole fleet stand down um, at the start of the season before we start targeting sockeye. Um, that being said, I'm also opposed to the commercial fishing option number five to reduce the area in the main district by cutting it in half. A lot of the smaller local boat fleets fish the upper and middle district, and especially if there's a lot of weather, they like to hug around that corner and then deliver to Clark's. And considering a lot of them are smaller local boat fleets, and if we're having a king concern, their families are probably struggling with some subsistence for kings too, and it's like a double whammy if um, a certain area where they would traditionally fish commercially would be limited. Um, so that being said, I believe the option three that's in the draft plan where it would create an OEG for the Nishigak River Sockeye, I think that's what RC 13, that the amended proposal 11 is trying to pursue. Um, so therefore, I, I support RC 13 with the amended language that the Nishigak AC adopted so that it would ensure that subsistence is not reduced beyond that um, three-day window. Um, I know there's some differences in opinions of the triggers. I'm not too sure what those triggers should be. I'm just... I believe this proposal is probably the best mechanism that we have in front of us to uh, um, to address some of the concerns. So, thank you, Mr. Wood has a question. Did you work with the committee in coming up with these revisions? No, I, I didn't. Okay, thank you. I, I attended some of the Nishigak AC meetings, and I've basically been listening and observing. So. No, I was just going to ask you some questions on specifics, but if you didn't work with them, not there. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony today, Gary. Appreciate it. Catherine? Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Catherine Karskallen. I was born and raised in Dillingham, Alaska, at the mouth of the Nishigak and Wood Rivers. I'm a third generation commercial fisherman um, and a permit owner and operator out of the Nishigak district. First off, I'd like to offer my testimony in support of RC 13, which contains updates to the Nishigak Mulchatna King Salmon Management Plan as well as the Stock of Concern Action Plan. These plans reflect the collective effort between ADF&G and the Nishigak River King Committee since we last met in November. I support these plans with some amendments um, and consider this the best proposed tools, which give in writing our area management biologists in, an increased ability to conserve for kings above and beyond the current plan, which our manager has been forced to operate of outside of for the last several years. Um, the proposed amendments that I support, the subnotes on page 9 of RC13, which are the Nishigak Advisory Committee's input, um, or simply maintain the current subsistence regulations, which ensures subsistence is the last fishery to be restricted during times of shortage with no man mandated times of closures. Um, these, these regulations have been working well for a long time. I'd also like to offer direct comments on the options outlined in adf and G's Stock of Concern Action Plan. Um, the commercial fishing option one, status quo, I oppose this because I believe the action plan in RC13 provides more conservation for, king, for kings than the current management plan. We've been operating outside of the current management plan, so I oppose status quo. 
Number two, um, I'm adamantly opposed to putting the entire drift fleet in the Wood River. This will do absolutely nothing to conserve Nishigat Kings and it will increase impacts on the Wood River system Kings. Just because we're not counting them and we don't have escapement goals on them doesn't mean they don't matter. I'm happy to expand on that um, during Committee of a Whole if this is a concept that the board is considering. Number three, referring to RC13, I think this is a, a adequate substitute and, and I, I believe the department and the committee have been working together and gone away from this initial proposal. Number four, I oppose we already do have a mesh restriction to conserve kings. Um, and number five, regarding windows, I think that any, any proposed windows to fishing need to be done in conjunction with a test fishery. So if there are, I haven't seen any proposals, but I know people are working on um, more research proposals. And if windows are tied to a test fishery, they make sense. If they are just conscripted closures, um, decided by, by hours or dates without being tied to a test fishery. I don't, I don't see them working as well. I think because the nature of our king runs are unpredictable and offer, often weather-based and very, very pulsy, um, this plan, the RC13 plan, allows for closures and an added test fishery could be an added tool so that the in-season management on the ground can, can do closures without, you know, that will truly be effective. And then number six, shutting down the commercial fishery. I'm opposed to that. We have already completely closed our directed king salmon fishery with no outcry from our commercial fleet. Um, we're, we're currently in a stock of management concern, not biological concern, and I believe adding tools to management is what they've, what they've been asking for, and, and that's really the charge. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Wood. Your discussion on the subsistence, if I understood what you said, you said leave it like it is currently, is that correct? Yes, that, that's um, in reference to Proposal 13, so the update to the King Salmon Management Plan. The committee plan had some, some updated language to subsistence. I'm fine either with the Nishigak AC's revisions to that language or status quo, either one, both, both of those kind of just leave things the way they are. Okay. With, with the one change from shall to may. There's, there's one word changed in there. So I, I support the RC, RC13 with the AC's amendments to it. Okay, what I'm trying to find out is currently subsistence can be done seven days a week. Yes. If you go the RC route, would then that reduce it down to three No, days? It, that would not. If, if you go the RC route with the AC's amendments to that, it would not be reduced. So it remained seven days. Roger, yes. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony this afternoon. Appreciate Thank it, you. Catherine. Thanks. Frank Woods. Hi, Frank. Welcome. Madam Chair, members of the board, for the record, my name is Frank Woods, 57 year old fisherman from Bristol Bay. Um, since 2003 to 2008, I held a, a sports guided license on a new Shigak, and I have a sports background, but also I commercial fished and operated my own commercial boat and owned it since 1985. I commercial fished in the Bristol Bay since 1975 on a, on a boat, and I referenced back to um, the king salmon um, abundance and the decline in his fishery. I am supporting consideration of Nushigak BBSRDA King Salmon Committee Proposal Number 11 with RC 13. It outlines the language that we need to address. I attended three of the AC committee meetings in, in this process um, when it was announced that we're in a stock of concern on Anushigak. I need to expand the issues that are important to history and the stock of concern in Proposal 11 for subsistence. I oppose 2, 3, and 4, reducing time. Status quo would help. I'll explain that, and, and there's only one or two pulses that we experience a year for the king salmon. It's maybe one day in the month of June when the storm hits, or the, the pulse of fish only is limited to one or two tides. So our, sport, our subsistence is almost no impact. I'll refer to RC 21, that outlines that the Cook Inlet and Kenai drainages are closed. Nobody's talking about the balloon effect of those sportsmen and the industry uh, representatives from the guide industry or the lodges 
going to where the fish are. We live in the last stronghold of the king salmon fishery in the state of Alaska. Nushigak is the last standing. It's not sustainable anymore. I would hate to go down the same rabbit hole as, as Kenai did 20 years ago. I looked at the March closure for the Kenai Cook Inlet drainages as a, an alarm for Nushigak. We've done this process for those districts and those, those, those areas that are experiencing ecological disasters. I'll stop there and we'll present my other opinions. They're in a committee as a whole, but I really caution the board that under Fisheries Management Report Number 2214, 2021 Bristol Bay Annual Management Report, it outlines from 2021 to 2000, from 2001 to 2021, 20 years of catch. That the last two years, we've only caught in 6,000 in incidental catch in a commercial district, 4,000 last year, 5,325 in 2023 of incidental catch of king salmon. That's less than the sportsman. In RC 23, I referenced uh, the whole drainage system, what's open for sports. They indiscriminately catch fish from May 1st to, to July 24th. The whole drainage is open from the time they pass the tower and they're open catching fish all the way up until the spawning streams on July 24th. I think that should be curtailed as at least cut back. My recommendation is pull back two weeks from July 24th to July 10th. That they don't, we close the upper district after July 10th to King Salmon. I'm, I believe in parallel conservation. I'm a subsistence user. I'm a commercial fisherman. I own Stocks and Lodge. Our Bristol Bay Regional Corporation leases and operates um, upriver sports programs. So, but I believe that subsistence has little impact since it's only one or two tides that we actually can catch fish. I thank you for your time and I'd like to reference 21 and 23. 23 is that map that I talked about in the sports industry. It's in, pretty much, they've got free reign once the Kings start running. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Any questions? Appreciate your testimony today. Thank yeah. you for being with us. Okay. I think we're going to pause there for the day. The time is 4.55, and um, we will begin tomorrow with first calls for the following people. Um, we'll do second calls in the morning for Nicholas Mikos, Darcy Kunuk, Brendan Allen, Luke Graham, Alex Knudsen, Paul Shadura, and Phyllis Sheeran. And then we will um, pick up where we left off with our testimony, beginning with Tony Zock. And we're going to begin tomorrow morning at 8.30 in the morning. So we'll see you at 8.30. Thank you. Do you anticipate getting to do votes tomorrow on either?